Section 1 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Greg Giordano. The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. By Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. R.B. to E.B.B. New Cross, Hatcham, Surrey. Postmark, January 10, 1845. I love your verses with all my heart, dear Miss Barrett, and this is no off-hand complimentary letter that I shall write. Whatever else, no prompt, matter-of-course, recognition of your genius and there a graceful and natural end of the thing since the day last week when i first read your poems i quite laugh to remember how i have been turning and turning again in my mind what i should be able to tell you of their effect upon me for in the first flush of delight i thought i would this once get out of my habit of purely passive enjoyment when I do really enjoy, and thoroughly justify my admiration, perhaps even, as a loyal fellow craftsman should, try and find fault, and do you some little good, to be proud of hereafter. But nothing comes of it, so into me has it gone, and part of me has it become, this great living poetry of yours, not a flower of which but took root and grew oh how different that is from lying to be dried and pressed flat and prized highly and put in a book with a proper account at top and bottom and shut up and put away and the book called a flora besides after all i need not give up the thought of doing that too in time because even now talking with whoever is worthy I can give a reason for my faith in one and another excellence the fresh strange music the affluent language the exquisite pathos and true new brave thought but in this addressing myself to you your own self and for the first time my feeling rises altogether i do as i say love these books with all my heart and I love you, too. Do you know I was once not very far from seeing, really seeing you? Mr. Kenyon said to me one morning, Would you like to see Miss Barrett? Then he went to announce me. Then he returned. You were too unwell. And now it is years ago, and I feel as at some untoward passage in my travels, as if I had been close, so close, to some world's wonder in chapel or crypt, only a screen to push, and I might have entered. But there was some slight, so it now seems, slight and just sufficient bar to admission, and the half-open door shut, and I went home my thousands of miles, and the sight was never to be. Well, these poems were to be, and this true, thankful joy and pride with which I feel myself. Yours faithfully, Robert Browning. End of Section 1section 2 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, 50 Wimpole Street, January 11th, 1845. I thank you, dear Mr. Browning, from the bottom of my heart. You meant to give me pleasure by your letter, and even if the object had not been answered, I ought still to thank you. But it is thoroughly answered. Such a letter from such a hand. Sympathy is dear, very dear to me. But the sympathy of a poet, and of such a poet, is the quintessence of sympathy to me. Will you take back my gratitude for it, agreeing, too, that of all the commerce done in the world, from Tyre to Carthage, 
the exchange of sympathy for gratitude is the most princely thing for the rest you draw me on with your kindness it is difficult to get rid of people when you once have given them too much pleasure that is a fact and we will not stop for the moral of it what i was going to say after a little natural hesitation is that if ever you emerge without inconvenient effort from your passive state and will tell me of such faults as rise to the surface and strike you as important in my poems for of course i do not think of troubling you with criticism in detail you will confer a lasting obligation on me and one which i shall value so much that i covet it at a distance i do not pretend to any extraordinary meekness under criticism and it is possible enough that i might not be altogether obedient to yours but with my high respect for your power in your art and for your experience as an artist it would be quite impossible for me to hear a general observation of yours on what appear to you my master faults without being the better for it hereafter in some way i ask for only a sentence or two of general observation and i do not ask even for that so as to tease you but in the humble low voice which is so excellent a thing in women particularly when they go a-begging the most frequent general criticism i receive is i think upon the style if i would but change my style but that is an objection isn't it to the writer bodily buffon says and every sincere writer must feel that le style c'est l'homme a fact however scarcely calculated to lessen the objection with certain critics is it indeed true that i was so near to the pleasure and honour of making your acquaintance and can it be true that you look back upon the lost opportunity with any regret but you know if you had entered the crypt you might have caught cold or been tired to death and wished yourself a thousand miles off which would have been worse than travelling them it is not my interest however to put such thoughts in your head about its being all for the best and i would rather hope as i do that what i lost by one chance i may recover by some future one winters shut me up as they do dormouse's eyes in the spring we shall see and i am so much better that i seem turning round to the outward world again and in the meantime i have learned to know your voice not merely from the poetry but from the kindness in it mr kenyon often speaks of you dear mr kenyon who most unspeakably or only speakably with tears in my eyes has been my friend and helper and my book's friend and helper critic and sympathizer true friend of all ours you know him well enough i think to understand that i must be grateful to him i am writing too much and notwithstanding that i am writing too much i will write of one thing more i will say that i am your debtor not only for this cordial letter and for all the pleasure which came with it but in other ways and those the highest and i will say that while i live to follow this divine art of poetry in proportion to my love for it and my devotion to it i must be a devout admirer and student of your works this is in my heart to say to you and i say it and for the rest i am proud to remain your obliged and faithful elizabeth b barrett robert browning esq new cross hatcham surrey end of section two Section 3 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano, R.B. to E.B.B., New Cross, Hatcham, Surrey, January 13, 1845. Dear Miss Barrett, I just shall say, in as few words as I can, that you make me very happy, and that, now the beginning is over, I dare say I shall do better, because my poor praise, number one, was nearly as felicitously brought out as a certain tribute to no less a personage than Tasso, which I was amused with at Rome some weeks ago, in a neat penciling on the plaster wall by his tomb at San Onofrio a la cara memoria di please fancy solemn interspaces engrave capital letters at the new lines d 
Torquato Tasso, Il Dottore Bernardini, Oferiva Il Seguante, Carme Otu. And no more, the good man, it should seem, breaking down with the overload of love here, but my Otu was breathed out most sincerely, and now you have taken it in gracious part, the rest will come after, only, and which is why I write now, it looks as if I have introduced some phrase or other about your faults so cleverly as to give exactly the opposite meaning to what I meant, which was that in my first ardor I had thought to tell you of everything which impressed me in your verses, down even to whatever faults I could find. A good, earnest, when I had got to them, that I had left out not much between as if some Mr. Fellows were to say, in the overflow of his first enthusiasm, of rewarded adventure. I will describe you all the outer life and ways of these Lyceans, down to their very sandal thongs, whereto the be corresponded one rejoins. Shall I get next week, then, your dissertation on sandal thongs? Yes, and a little about the Olympian horses, and God charioteers as well. What struck me as faults were not matters on the removal of which one was to have poetry or high poetry, but the very highest poetry, so I thought, and that to universal recognition for myself or any artist. In many of the cases, there would be a positive loss of time, peculiar artist pleasure for an instructed eye loves to see where the brushes dip twice an illustrious color, has lain insistingly along a favorite outline, dwelt lovingly in a grand shadow. For these two muches for the everybody's picture are so many helps to the making out the real painter's picture as he had it in his brain. And all of the Titian's Naples Magdalene must have once been golden in its degree to justify that heap of hair in her hands the only gold effected now. But about this soon, for night is drawing on, and I go out, it cannot, quiet at conscience, till I repeat, to myself, for I never said it to you, I think, that your poetry must be, cannot but be, infinitely more to me than mine to you. For you do what I always wanted, hoped to do, and only seem now likely to do for the first time. You speak out. You. I only make men and women speak. Give you truth broken into prismatic hues, and fear the pure white light, even if it is in me. But I am going to try. So it will be no small comfort to have your company just now, seeing that when you have your men and women aforesaid, you are busied with them, whereas it seems bleak, melancholy work, this talking to the wind. I have begun, yet I don't think I shall let you hear it, after all, the savage things about popes and imaginative religions that I must say. See how I go on and on to you, I who, whenever now and then pulled by the head and hair into letter-writing, get sorrowfully on for a line or two, as the cognate creature urged on by stick and string, and then come down flop upon the sweet haven of page one, line last, as serene as the sleep of the virtuous. You will never more, I hope, talk of the honor of my acquaintance, but I will joyfully wait for the delight of your friendship, in the spring, in my chapel site after all. Ever yours most faithfully, R. Browning. For Mr. Kenyon, I have a convenient theory about him, and his otherwise quite unaccountable kindness to me, but tis quite night now, and they call me. End of section three. Section four of the letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, part one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, 50 Wimpole Street, January 15th, 1845. Dear Mr. Browning, 
the fault was clearly with me and not with you when i had an italian master years ago he told me that there was an unpronounceable english word which absolutely expressed me and which he would say in his own tongue as he could not in mine testa lunga of course the signor meant headlong and now i have had enough to tame me and might be expected to stand still in my stall but you see i do not headlong i was at first and headlong i continue precipitously rushing forward through all manner of nettles and briars instead of keeping the path guessing at the meaning of unknown words instead of looking into the dictionary tearing open letters and never untying a string and expecting everything to be done in a minute and the thunder to be as quick as the lightning and so at your half word i flew at the whole one with all its possible consequences and wrote what you read our common friend as i think he is mr horn is often forced to entreat me into patience and coolness of purpose though his only intercourse with me has been by letter and by the way you will be sorry to hear that during his stay in germany he has been headlong out of a metaphor twice once in falling from the drachenfels when he only just saved himself by catching at a vine and once quite lately at christmas in a fall on the ice of the elbe in skating when he dislocated his left shoulder in a very painful manner he is doing quite well i believe but it was said to have such a shadow from the german christmas tree and he a stranger in art however i understand that it does not do to be headlong but patient and laborious and there is a love strong enough even in me to overcome nature i apprehend what you mean in the criticism you just intimate and shall turn it over and over in my mind until i get practical good from it what no mere critic sees but what you an artist know is the difference between the thing desired and the thing attained between the idea in the writer's mind and the eidolon cast off in his work all the effort the quickening of the breath and beating of the heart in pursuit which is ruffling and injurious to the general effect of a composition all which you call insistency and which many would call superfluity and which is superfluous in a sense you can pardon because you understand the great chasm between the thing i say and the thing i would say would be quite dispiriting to me in spite even of such kindnesses as yours if the desire did not master the despondency oh for a horse with wings it is wrong of me to write so of myself only to put your finger on the root of a fault which has to my fancy been a little misapprehended i do not say everything i think as has been said of me by master critics but i take every means to say what i think which is different or i fancy so in one thing however you are wrong why should you deny the full measure of my delight and benefit from your writings i could tell you why you should not you have in your vision two worlds or to use the language of the schools of the day you are both subjective and objective in the habits of your mind you can deal both with abstract thought and with human passion in the most passionate sense thus you have an immense grasp in art and no one at all accustomed to consider the usual forms of it could help regarding with reverence and gladness the gradual expansion of your powers then you are masculine to the height and i as a woman have studied some of your gestures of language and intonation wistfully as a thing beyond me far and the more admirable for being beyond of your new work i hear with delight how good of you to tell me and it is not dramatic in the strict sense i am to understand am i right in understanding so and you speak in your own person to the winds no but to the thousand living sympathies which will awake to hear you a great dramatic power may develop itself otherwise than in the formal drama and i have been guilty of wishing before this hour for reasons which i will not thrust upon you after all my tedious writing that you would give the public a poem unassociated directly or indirectly with the stage for a trial on the popular heart i reverence the drama but but i break in on myself out of consideration for you i might have done it you will think before i vex your serene sleep of the virtuous like a nightmare do not say no i am sure i do 
as to the vain parlance of the world i did not talk of the honour of your acquaintance without a true sense of honour indeed but i shall willingly exchange it all and now if you please at this moment for fear of worldly mutabilities for the delight of your friendship believe me therefore dear mr browning faithfully yours and gratefully elizabeth b barrett for mr kenyon's kindness as i see it no theory will account i class it with mesmerism for that reason end of section four Section 5 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. New Cross, Hatcham, Monday night. Postmark, January 28, 1845. Dear Miss Barrett, your books lie on my table here, at arm's length from me in this old room where i sit all day and when my head aches or wanders or strikes work as it now or then will i take my chance for either green-covered volume as if it were so much fresh trefoil to feel in one's hands this winter time and round i turn and putting a decisive elbow on three or four half done with bells of mine red 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 and just as i have shut up the book and walked to the window i recollect that you wanted me to find faults there and that in an unwise hour i engaged to do so meantime the days go by the white throat is come and sings now as i would not have you look down on me from your white heights as promise breaker evader or forgetter if i could help and as if i am very candid and contrite you may find it in your heart to write to me again who knows i shall say at once that the said faults cannot be lost must be somewhere and shall be faithfully brought you back whenever you turn up as people tell one of missing matters i am rather exacting myself with my own gentle audience and get to say spiteful things about them when they are backward in their dues of appreciation but really really could i be quite sure that anybody as good as i must go on i suppose and say as myself even were honestly to feel towards me as i do towards the writer of bertha and the drama and the duchess and the page and the whole two volumes I should be paid after a fashion i know one thing i can do pencil if you like and annotate and dissertate upon that i love most and least i think i can do it that is here an odd memory comes of a friend who volunteering such a service to a sonnet writing somebody gave him a taste of his quality in a side column of short criticisms on sonnet the first and starting off the beginning three lines with of course bad worse worst made by a generous vintage of words to meet the sudden run of his epithets worser worserer worserist pay off the second torzet in full no badder badderer badderist fell to the second's allowance and worser etc answered the demands of the third worster worsterer worsterist supplied the emergency of the fourth and bestowing his last worsteristest and worsteristest on lines thirteen and fourteen my friend slapping his forehead like an emptied strong box frankly declared himself bankrupt and honorably incompetent to satisfy the reasonable expectations of the rest of the series what an illustration of the law by which opposite ideas suggest opposite and contrary images come together see now how of that friendship you offer me and here juliet's word rises to my lips i feel sure once and forever i have got already i see into this little pet handwriting of mine not any one else's which scratches on it as if theatrical copyists ha me and bradbury and evans reader were not 
but you shall get something better than this nonsense one day, if you will have patience with me. Hardly better, though, because this does me real good, gives real relief to write. After all, you know nothing, next to nothing of me, and that stops me. Spring is to come, however. If you hate writing to me, as I hate writing to nearly everybody, I pray you never write. If you do, as you say, care for anything I have done, I will simply assure you that meaning to begin work in deep earnest, begin without affectation, God knows. I do not know what will help me more than hearing from you. And therefore, if you do not so very much hate it, I know I shall hear from you, and very little more about your tiring me. Ever yours faithfully, Robert Browning. End of section 5、section、six of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, 50 Wimpole Street, February 3rd, 1845. Why, how could I hate to write to you, dear Mr. Browning? Could you believe in such a thing? If nobody likes writing to everybody, except such professional letter writers as you and I are not, yet everybody likes writing to somebody, and it would be strange and contradictory if I were not always delighted both to hear from you and to write to you. This talking upon paper being as good a social pleasure as another when our means are somewhat straitened. As for me, I have done most of my talking by post of late years, as people shut up in dungeons take up with scrawling mottoes on the walls. Not that I write to many in the way of regular correspondence, as our friend Mr. Horn predicates of me in his romances, which is mere romancing, but that there are a few who will write and be written to by me without a sense of injury. Dear Miss Mitford, for instance, you do not know her, I think, personally, although she was the first to tell me, when I was very ill and insensible to all the glories of the world except poetry, of the grand scene in Pippa Passes. She has filled a large drawer in this room with delightful letters, heart-warm and soul-warm, driftings of nature, if sunshine could drift like snow, and which, if they should ever fall the way of all writing, into print, would assume the folio shape as a matter of course, and take rank on the lowest shelf of libraries with Benedictine editions of the fathers, Cater Lipot. I write this to you to show how I can have pleasure in letters, and never think them too long, nor too frequent, nor too illegible from being written in little pet hands. I can read any manuscript, except the writing on the pyramids. And if you will only promise to treat me en bon camarade, without reference to the conventionalities of ladies and gentlemen, taking no thought for your sentences, nor for mine, nor for your blots, nor for mine, nor for your blunt speaking, nor for mine, nor for your bad spelling, nor for mine, and if you agree to send me a blotted thought whenever you are in the mind for it, and with as little ceremony and less legibility than you would think it necessary to employ towards your printer, why then, I am ready to sign and seal the contract, and to rejoice in being articled as your correspondent. Only don't let us have any constraint, any ceremony. Don't be civil to me when you feel rude, nor loquacious when you incline to silence, nor yielding in the manners when you are perverse in the mind. See how out of the world I am. Suffer me to profit by it in almost the only profitable circumstance, and let us rest from the bowing and the curtsying, you and I, on each side. You will find me an honest man on the whole, if rather hasty and prejudging, which is a different thing from prejudice at the worst. And we have great sympathies in common, and I am inclined to look up to you in many things, and to learn as much of everything as you will teach me. On the other hand, you must prepare yourself to forbear and to forgive, will you? While I throw off the ceremony, I hold the faster to the kindness. Is it true, as you say, that I know so little of you? And is it true, as others say, that the productions of an artist do not partake of his real nature? that in the minor sense man is not made in the image of God. It is not true, to my mind, and therefore it is not true that I know little of you, 
except in as far as it is true which i believe that your greatest works are to come need i assure you that i shall always hear with the deepest interest every word you will say to me of what you are doing or about to do i hear of the old room and the bells lying about with an interest which you may guess at perhaps and when you tell me besides of my poems being there and of your caring for them so much beyond the tide mark of my hopes the pleasure rounds itself into a charm and prevents its own expression overjoyed i am with this cordial sympathy but it is better i feel to try to justify it by future work than to thank you for it now i think if i may dare to name myself with you in the poetic relation that we both have high views of the art we follow and steadfast purpose in the pursuit of it and that we should not either of us be likely to be thrown from the course by the casting of any atalanta ball of speedy popularity but i do not know i cannot guess whether you are liable to be pained deeply by hard criticism and cold neglect such as original writers like yourself are too often exposed to or whether the love of art is enough for you and the exercise of art the filling joy of your life not that praise must not always of necessity be delightful to the artist but that it may be redundant to his content do you think so or not it appears to me that poets who like keats are highly susceptible to criticism must be jealous in their own persons of the future honour of their works because if a work is worthy honour must follow it though the worker should not live to see that following overtaking now is it not enough that the work be honoured enough i mean for the worker and is it not enough to keep down a poet's ordinary wearing anxieties to think that if his work be worthy it will have honour and if not that sparta must have nobler sons than he i am writing nothing applicable i see to anything in question but when one falls into a favourite train of thought one indulges oneself in thinking on i began in thinking and wondering what sort of artistic constitution you had being determined as you may observe with a sarcastic smile at the impertinence to set about knowing as much as possible of you immediately then you spoke of your gentle audience you began and i who know that you have not one but many enthusiastic admirers the fit and few in the intense meaning yet not the diffused fame which will come to you presently wrote on down the margin of the subject till i parted from it altogether but after all we are on the proper matter of sympathy and after all and after all that has been said and mused upon the natural ills the anxiety and wearing out experienced by the true artist is not the good immeasurably greater than the evil is it not great good and great joy for my part i wonder sometimes i surprise myself wondering how without such an object and purpose of life people find it worth while to live at all and for happiness why my only idea of happiness as far as my personal enjoyment is concerned but i have been straitened in some respects and in comparison with the majority of livers lies deep in poetry and its associations and then the escape from pangs of heart and bodily weakness when you throw off yourself what you feel to be yourself into another atmosphere and into other relations where your life may spread its wings out new and gather on every separate plume a brightness from the sun of the sun is it possible that imaginative writers should be so fond of depreciating and lamenting over their own destiny possible certainly but reasonable not at all and grateful less than anything my faults my faults shall i help you ah you see them too well i fear and do you know that i also have something of your feeling about being about to begin or i should dare to praise you for having it but in you it is different it is in you a virtue when prometheus had recounted a long list of sorrows to be endured by io and declared at last that he was methepo and poemis poor io burst out crying and when the author of paracelsus and the bells and pomegranates says that he is only going to begin we may well to take the opposite idea as you write rejoice and clap our hands yet i believe that whatever you may have done you will do what is greater it is my faith for you 
and how i should like to know what poets have been your sponsors to promise and vow for you and whether you have held true to early tastes or left violently from them and what books you read and what hours you write in how curious i could prove myself if it isn't proved already but this is too much indeed past all bearing i suspect well but if i ever write to you again i mean if you wish it it may be in the other extreme of shortness so do not take me for a born heroine of richardson or think that i sin always to this length else you might indeed repent your quotation from juliet which i guessed at once and of course i have no joy in this contract to-day it is too unadvised too rash and sudden ever faithfully yours elizabeth b barrett end of section six section seven of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b hatcham tuesday postmark february eleventh eighteen forty five dear miss barrett people would hardly ever tell falsehoods about a matter if they had been let tell truth in the beginning for it is hard to profane one's very self and nobody who has for instance used certain words and ways to a mother or a father could even if by the devil's help he would reproduce or mimic them with any effect to anybody else that was to be won over and so if i love you were always outspoken when it might be there would i suppose be no fear of its desecration at any after time but lo only last night i had to write on the part of mr carlyle to a certain ungainly foolish gentleman who keeps back from him with all the fussy impotence of stupidity not bad feeling alas for that we could deal with a certain manuscript letter of cromwell's which completes the collection now going to press in this long ears had to be dear sir and obedient servanted till i said to use a mild word commend me to the sincerities of this kind of thing when i spoke of you knowing little of me one of the senses in which i meant so was this that i would not well val point my commonplace letters and syllables with a mesorotic other sound and sense make my dear something intenser than dears in ordinary and yours ever a thought more significant than the run of its like and all this came of your talking of tiring me being too envious etc etc which i should never have heard of had the plain truth looked out of my letter with its unmistakable eyes now what you say of the bowing and convention that is to be and pont de fachon that are not to be helps me once and forever for have i not a right to say simply that for reasons i know for other reasons i don't exactly know but might if i choose to think a little and for still other reasons which most likely all the choosing and thinking in the world would not make me know i had rather hear from you than see anybody else never you care dear noble carlyle nor you my own friend alfred over the sea nor a troop of true lovers are not their fates written there don't you answer this please but mind it is on record and now then with a lighter conscience i shall begin replying to your questions but then what i have printed gives no knowledge of me it evidences abilities of various kinds if you will and a dramatic sympathy with certain modifications of passion that i think but i never have begun even what i hope i was born to begin and end 
R B a poem, and next, if I speak, and, God knows, feel, as if what you have read were sadly imperfect demonstrations of even more ability, it is from no absurd vanity, though it might seem so, these scenes and song scraps are such mere and very light escapes of my inner power, which lives in me like the light in those crazy Mediterranean fairs I have watched at sea, wherein the light is ever revolving in a dark gallery, bright and alive, and only after a weary interval leaps out for a moment from the one narrow chink, and then goes on with the blind wall between it and you, and no doubt, then, precisely, does the poor drudge that carries the cresset set himself most busily to trim the wick. For don't think I want to say I have not worked hard. This head of mine knows better. But the work has been inside, and not when, at stated times, I held up my light to you, and that there is no self-delusion here. I would prove to you, and nobody else, even by opening this desk I write on, and showing what stuff, in the way of wood, I could make a great bonfire with, if I might only knock the whole clumsy top off my tower. Of course, every writing body says the same. So I gain nothing by the avowal, but when I remember how I have done what was published, and half done what may never be, still I hope sometimes, though phrenologists will have it that I cannot, and am doing better with this darling Loria, so safe in my head, in a tiny slip of paper I cover with my thumb. Then you inquire about my sensitiveness to criticism, and I shall be glad to tell you exactly, because I have, more than once, taken a course you might else not understand. I shall live always, that is for me. I am living here, this 1845, that is for London. I write from a thorough conviction that it is the duty of me, and with the belief that after every drawback and shortcoming, I do my best. All things considered, that is for me, and, so being, the not being listened to by one human creature would, I hope, in no wise affect me. But of course I must, if for merely scientific purposes, know all about this 1845, its ways and doings, and something I do know is that for a dozen cabbages, if I please to grow them in the garden here, I might demand, say, a dozen pence at Covent Garden Market, and that for a dozen scenes of the average goodness, I may challenge as many plaudits at the theatre close by and a dozen pages of verse brought to the Rialto, where verse merchants most do congregate, ought to bring me a fair proportion of the reviewer's gold currency, seeing the other traders pouch their winnings, as I do see. Well, but they won't pay me for my cabbages, or praise me for my poems. I may, if I please, say, more's the shame, and bid both parties decamp to the crows, in Greek phrase, and yet go very light-hearted back to a garden full of rose trees, and a soul full of comforts. If they had bought my greens, I should have been able to buy the last number of punch, and go through the toll-gate of Waterloo Bridge, and give the blind clarionet player a trifle, and all without changing my gold. If they had taken to my books, my father and mother would have been proud of this, and the other favorable critique, and, at least so folks hold, I should have to pay Mr. Moxon less by a few pounds, whereas, but you see, indeed, I force myself to say ever and anon, in the interest of the market gardener's regular, and Keats's proper, it's nothing to you, critics, hucksters, all of you, if I have this garden and this conscience, I might go die at Rome, or take to gin and the newspaper for what you would care. So I don't quite lay open my resources to everybody. But it does so happen 
that I have met with much more than I could have expected. In this matter of kindly and prompt recognition, I never wanted a real set of good, hearty praisers, and no bad reviewers. I am quite content with my share. No, what I laughed at in my gentle audience is a sad trick the real admirers have of admiring at the wrong place, enough to make an apostle swear. That does make me savage, never the other kind of people. I think now, take your own drama of exile, and let me send it to the first twenty men and women that shall knock at your door to-day, and after, of whom the first five are the postman, the seller of cheap sealing wax, Mr. Hawkins, Jr., the butcher for orders, and the tax-gatherer. Will you let me, by Cornelius Agrippa's assistance, force these five and these fellows to read and report on this drama? And when I have put these faithful reports into fair English, do you believe they would be better then, if as good as the general run of periodical criticisms? Not they, I will venture to affirm. But then, once again, I get these people together, and give them your book, and persuade them, moreover, that by praising it, the postman will be helping its author to divide Long Acre into two beats, one of which she will take with half the salary, and all the red collar, that a stealing wax vendor will see red wafers brought into vogue, and so on with the rest. And won't you just wish for your spectators and observers and Newcastle upon Tyne, hebdomadal Mercury's back again? You see, the inference. I do sincerely esteem it a perfectly providential and miraculous thing that they are so well behaved and ordinary, these critics, and for Keats and Tennyson to go softly all their days, for a gruff word or two is quite inexplicable to me, and always has been. Tennyson reads the quarterly, and does as they bid him, with the most solemn face in the world. Out goes this, in goes that, all is changed and ranged. Oh, me! Out comes the sun, in comes the times, and eleven strikes. It does already, and I have to go to town, and I have no alternative but that this story of the critic and poet, the bear and the fiddle, should begin but break off in the middle. Yet I doubt, nor will you henceforth, I know, say, I vex you, I am sure, by this lengthy writing. Mind that spring is coming, for all this snow, and know me, for yours ever faithfully, R. Browning. I don't dare, yet I will, ask, can you read this? Because I could write a little better, but not so fast. Do you keep writing just as you do now? End of section seven. Section eight of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. E. B. B. to R. B. Fifty Wimpole Street, February seventeenth. 1845. Dear Mr. Browning, to begin with the end, which is only characteristic of the perverse like myself, I assure you I read your handwriting as currently as I could read the clearest type from font. If I had practiced the art of reading your letters all my life, I couldn't do it better. And then I approve of small manuscript upon principle. Think of what an immense quantity of physical energy must go to the making of those immense sweeping handwritings achieved by some persons. Mr. Landor, for instance, who writes as if he had the sky for a copy-book and dotted his eyes in proportion. People who do such things should wear gauntlets, yes, and have none to wear, or they wouldn't waste their time so. People who write, by profession, shall I say, never should do it, or what will become of them when most of their strength retires into their head and heart, as is the case with some of us, and may be the case with all. And when they have to write a poem twelve times over, as Mr. Kenyon says I should do if I were virtuous. Not that I do it. Does anybody do it, I wonder? Do you ever? 
from what you tell me of the trimming of the light i imagine not and besides one may be laborious as a writer without copying twelve times over i believe there are people who will tell you in a moment what three times six is without doing it on their fingers and in the same way one may work one's verses in one's head quite as laboriously as on paper i maintain it i consider myself a very patient laborious writer though dear mr kenyon laughs me to scorn when i say so and just see how it could be otherwise if i were netting a purse i might be thinking of something else and drop my stitches or even if i were writing verses to please a popular taste i might be careless in it but the pursuit of an ideal acknowledged by the mind will draw and concentrate the powers of the mind and art you know is a jealous god and demands the whole man or woman i cannot conceive of a sincere artist who is also a careless one though one may have a quicker hand than another in general and though all are liable to vicissitudes in the degree of facility and to entanglements in the machinery notwithstanding every degree of facility you may write twenty lines one day or even three like euripides in three days and a hundred lines in one more day and yet on the hundred may have been expended as much good work as on the twenty and the three and also as you say the lamp is trimmed behind the wall and the act of utterance is the evidence of foregone study still more than it is the occasion to study the deep interest with which i read all that you had the kindness to write to me of yourself you must trust me for as i find it hard to express it it is sympathy in one way and interest every way and now see although you prove to me with admirable logic that for reasons which you know and reasons which you don't know i couldn't possibly know anything about you though that is all true and proven which is better than true i really did understand of you before i was told exactly what you told me yes i did indeed i felt sure that as a poet you fronted the future and that your chief works in your own apprehension were to come oh i take no credit of sagacity for it as i did not long ago to my sisters and brothers when i professed to have knowledge of all their friends whom i never saw in my life by the image coming with the name and threw them into shouts of laughter by giving out all the blue eyes and black eyes and hazel eyes and noses roman and gothic ticketed aright for the mr smiths and miss hawkinses and hit the bull's-eye and the true features of the case ten times out of twelve but you are different you are to be made out by the comparative anatomy system you have thrown out fragments of os sublime indicative of soul mammothism and you live to develop your nature if you live that is easy and plain you have taken a great range from those high faint notes of the mystics which are beyond personality to dramatic impersonations gruff with nature Grr, you swine and when these are thrown into harmony as in a manner they are in pippa passes which i could find in my heart to covet the authorship of more than any of your works the combinations of effect must always be striking and noble and you must feel yourself drawn on to such combinations more and more but i do not you say know yourself you i only know abilities and faculties well then teach me yourself you i will not insist on the knowledge and in fact you have not written the r b poem yet your rays fall obliquely rather than directly straight i see you only in your moon do tell me all of yourself that you can and will before the r b poem comes out and what is luria a poem and not a drama i mean a poem not in the dramatic form well i have wondered at you sometimes not for daring but for bearing to trust your noble works into the great mill of the rank popular playhouse to be ground to pieces between the teeth of vulgar actors and actresses i for one would as soon have my soul among lions there is a fascination in it says miss mitford and i am sure there must be to account for it publics in the mass are bad enough but to distill the dregs of the public and baptize oneself in that acrid moisture where can be the temptation i could swear by shakespeare as was once sworn by those dead at marathon that i do not see where i love the drama too i look to our old dramatists as to our kings and princes in poetry i love them through all the deeps of their abominations but the theatre in those days was a better medium between the people and the poet 
and the press in those days was a less sufficient medium than now still the poets suffered by the theatre even then and the reasons are very obvious how true how true is all you say about critics my convictions follow you in every word and i delighted to read your views of the poet's right aspect towards criticism i read them with the most complete appreciation and sympathy i have sometimes thought that it would be a curious and instructive process as illustrative of the wisdom and apprehensiveness of critics if any one would collect the critical soliloquies of every age touching its own literature as far as such may be extant and confer them with the literary product of the said ages professor wilson has begun something of the kind apparently in his initiatory paper of the last blackwood number on critics beginning with dryden but he seems to have no design in his notice it is a mere critique on the critic and then he should have begun earlier than dryden earlier even than sir philip sidney who in the noble discourse on poetry gives such singular evidence of being stone critic blind to the gods who moved around him as far as i can remember he saw even shakespeare but indifferently oh it was in his eyes quite an unillumed age that period of elizabeth which we see full of suns and few can see what is close to the eyes though they run their heads against it the denial of contemporary genius is the rule rather than the exception no one counts the eagles in the nest till there is a rush of wings and lo they are flown and here we speak of understanding men such as the sydneys and the drydens of the great body of critics you observe rightly that they are better than might be expected of their badness only the fact of their influence is no less undeniable than the reason why they should not be influential the brazen kettles will be taken for oracles all the world over but the influence is for to-day for this hour not for to-morrow and the day after unless indeed as you say the poet do himself perpetuate the influence by submitting to it do you know tennyson that is with a face-to-face -face knowledge i have great admiration for him in execution he is exquisite and in music a most subtle way out to the ear of fine airs that such a poet should submit blindly to the suggestions of his critics i do not say that suggestions from without may not be accepted with discrimination sometimes to the benefit of the acceptor blindly and implicitly to the suggestions of his critics is much as if babbage were to take my opinion and undo his calculating machine by it napoleon called poetry science creuse which although he was not scientific in poetry himself is true enough but anybody is qualified according to everybody for giving opinions upon poetry it is not so in chemistry and mathematics nor is it so i believe in whist and the polka but then these are more serious things yes and it does delight me to hear of your garden full of roses and soul full of comforts you have the right to both you have the key to both you have written enough to live by though only beginning to write as you say of yourself and this reminds me to remind you that when i talked of coveting most of the authorship of your pippa i did not mean to call it your finest work you might reproach me for that but just to express a personal feeling do you know what it is to covet your neighbour's poetry not his fame but his poetry i dare say not you are too generous and in fact beauty is beauty and whether it comes by our own hand or another's blessed be the coming of it i besides feel that and yet and yet i have been aware of a feeling within me which has spoken two or three times to the effect of a wish that i had been visited with the vision of pippa before you and confite or tibi i confess the baseness of it the conception is to my mind most exquisite and altogether original and the contrast in the working out of the plan singularly expressive of various faculty is the poem under your thumb emerging from it and in what metre may i ask such questions and does mr carlyle tell you that he has forbidden all singing to this perverse and froward generation which should work and not sing and have you told mr carlyle that song is work and also the condition of work i am a devout sitter at his feet and it is an effort to me to think him wrong in anything and once when he told me to write prose and not verse i fancied that his opinion was i had mistaken my calling 
a fancy which in infinite kindness and gentleness he stooped immediately to correct i never shall forget the grace of that kindness but then for him to have thought ill of me would not have been strange i often think ill of myself as god knows but for carlyle to think of putting away even for a season the poetry of the world was wonderful and has left me ruffled in my thoughts ever since i do not know him personally at all but as his disciple i ventured by an exceptional motive to send him my poems and i heard from him as a consequence dear and noble he is indeed and a poet unaware of himself all but the sense of music you feel it so do you not and the dear sir has let him have the letter of cromwell i hope and satisfied the obedient servant the curious thing in this world is not the stupidity but the upper handism of the stupidity the geese are in the capital and the romans in the farmyard and it seems all quite natural that it should be so both to geese and romans but there are things you say which seem to me supernatural for reasons which i know and for reasons which i don't know you will let me be grateful to you will you not you must if you will or not and also i would not wait for more leave if i could but see your desk as i do your death's heads and the spider webs appertaining but the soul of cornelius agrippa fades from me ever faithfully yours elizabeth b barrett End of section eight. Section nine of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R. B. to E. B. B. Wednesday morning, spring. Postmark february twenty sixth eighteen forty five real warm spring dear miss barrett and the birds know it and in spring i shall see you surely see you for when did i once fail to get whatever i had set my heart upon as i ask myself sometimes with a strange fear i took up this paper to write a great deal now i don't think i shall write much i shall see you i say that loria you inquire about shall be my last play for it is but a play woe's me i've one done here a soul's tragedy as it is properly enough called but that would not do to end with and i will and loria is a moor of othello's country and devotes himself to something he thinks florence and the old fortune follows all in my brain yet but the bright weather helps and i will soon loosen my braccio and puccio a pale discontented man antibertio de pisan good true fellow this one and domitia the lady loosen all these on dear foolish ravishing must his folly be golden-hearted loria all these with their worldly wisdom and tuscan shrewd ways and for me the misfortune is i sympathize just as much with these as with him so there can no good come of this wild company any longer and loria and the other sadder ruin of one Giappino, these got rid of i will do as you bid me and say first i have some romances and lyrics all dramatic to dispatch and then i shall stoop of a sudden under and out of this dancing ring of men and women hand in hand and stand still a while should my eyes dazzle and when that's over they will be gone and you will be there pavare for as i think i told you i always shiver involuntarily when i look no glance had this first poem of mine to be now i call it what upon my soul for a solemn matter it is what is to be done now believed now so far as it has been revealed to me solemn words truly and to find myself writing them to any one else enough now i know tennyson face to face 
no more than that i know carlyle and love him know him so well that i would have told you he had shaken that grand head of his at singing so thoroughly does he love and live by it when i last saw him fortnight ago he turned from i don't know what other talk quite abruptly on me with did you ever try to write a song of all things in the world that i should be proudest to do then came his definition of a song then with an appealing look to mrs c i always say that some day in spite of nature and my stars i shall burst into a song he is not mechanically musical he meant and the music is the poetry he holds and should enwrap the thought as don says an amber drop enwraps a bee and then he began to recite an old scotch song stopping at the first rude couplet the beginning words are merely to set the tune they tell me and then again at the couplet about or to the effect that give me but in broad scotch give me but my lass i care not for my koji he says quoth carlyle magisterially that if you allow him the love of his lass you may take away all else even his koji his cup or can and he cares not just as a professor expounds like a fron and just before i left england six months ago did not i hear him croon if not certainly sing charlie is my darling my darling with an adoring emphasis then he stood back as it were from the song to look at it better and said how must that notion of ideal wondrous perfection have impressed itself in this old jacobite's young cavalier they go to save their land and the young cavalier and i who care nothing about such a rag of a man cannot but feel as he felt in speaking his words after him after saying which he would be sure to counsel everybody to get their heads clear of all singing don't let me forget to clap hands we got the letter dearly bought as it was by the dear sirs etc an insignificant scrap as it proved but still it is got to my encouragement and diplomacy who told you of my skulls and spider webs horn last year i petted extraordinarily a fine fellow a garden spider there was the singularity the thin clever even for a spider sort and they are so spirited and sly all of them this kind makes a long cone of web with a square chamber of vantage at the end and then he sits loosely and looks about a great fellow that housed himself with real gusto in the jaws of a great skull whence he watched me as i wrote and i remember speaking to horn about his good points phrenologists look gravely at that great skull by the way and hope in their grim manner that its owner made a good end he looks quietly now out at the green little hill behind i have no little insight to the feelings of furniture and treat books and prints with a reasonable consideration how some people use their pictures for instance is a mystery to me very revealing all the same portraits obliged to face each other forever prints put together in portfolios my polidoro's perfect andromeda along with boar's carousing by ostade where i found her my own father's doing or i would say more and when i have said i like pippa better than anything else i have done yet i shall have answered all you bade me and now may i begin questioning no for it is all a pure delight to me so that you do but right i never was without good kind generous friends and lovers so they say so they were and are perhaps they came at the wrong time i never wanted them though that makes no difference in my gratitude i trust but i know myself surely and always have done so for is there not somewhere the little book i first printed when a boy with john mill the metaphysical head his marginal note that the 
writer possesses a deeper self-consciousness than i ever knew in a sane human being so i never deceived myself much nor called my feelings for people other than they were and who has a right to say if i have not that i had but i said that supernatural or no pray tell me too of your present doings and projects and never write yourself grateful to me who am grateful very grateful to you for none of your words but i take in earnest and tell me if spring be not coming come and i will take to writing the gravest of letters because this beginning is for gladness sake like carlyle's song couplet my head aches a little to-day and as poor dear kirk white said to the moon from his heap of mathematical papers i throw aside the learned sheet i cannot choose but gaze she looks so mildly sweet out on the foolish phrase but there's a hard rhyming without it ever yours faithfully robert browning end of section nine Section 10 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, 50 Wimpole Street, February 27th, 1845. Yes, but dear Mr. Browning, I want the spring according to the new style, mine, and not the old one of you and the rest of the poets. To me, unhappily, the snowdrop is much the same as the snow it feels as cold underfoot and i have grown sceptical about the voice of the turtle the east winds blow so loud april is a parthian with a dart and may at least the early part of it a spy in the camp that is my idea of what you call spring mine in the new style a little later comes my spring and indeed after such severe weather from which i have just escaped with my life i may thank it for coming at all how happy you are to be able to listen to the birds without the commentary of the east wind which like other commentaries spoils the music and how happy i am to listen to you when you write such kind open-hearted letters to me i am delighted to hear all you say to me of yourself and luria and the spider and to do him no dishonour in the association of the great teacher of the age carlyle who is also yours and mine he fills the office of a poet does he not by analyzing humanity back into its elements to the destruction of the conventions of the hour that is strictly speaking the office of the poet is it not and he discharges it fully and with a wider intelligibility perhaps as far as the contemporary period is concerned than if he did forthwith burst into a song but how i do wonder i meant to say and i will call myself back to say that spring will really come some day i hope and believe and the warm settled weather with it and that then i shall be probably fitter for certain pleasures than i can appear even to myself now and in the meantime i seem to see luria instead of you i have visions and dream dreams and the soul's tragedy which sounds to me like the step of a ghost of an old drama and you are not to think that i blaspheme the drama dear mr browning or that i ever thought of exhorting you to give up the solemn robes and tread of the buskin it is the theatre which vulgarizes these things the modern theatre in which we see no altar where the timelet is replaced by the caprice of a popular actor and also i have a fancy that your great dramatic power would work more clearly and audibly in the less definite mould but you write your own faculty as okeanus did his seahorse directing it by your will and woe to the impertinence which would dare to say turn this way or turn from that way it should not be my impertinence do not think i blaspheme the drama i have gone through all such reading as should never be read that is by women through my love of it on the contrary and the dramatic faculty is strong in you and therefore as i speak unto a wise man judge what i say for myself and my own doings you shall hear directly what i have been doing and what i am about to do some years ago as perhaps you may have heard but i hope not 
for the fewer who hear of it the better some years ago i translated or rather undid into english the prometheus of aeschylus to speak of this production moderately not modestly it is the most miserable of all miserable versions of the class it was completed in the first place in thirteen days the iambics thrown into blank verse the lyrics into rhymed octosyllabics and the like and the whole together as cold as caucasus and as flat as the nearest plain to account for this the haste may be something but if my mind had been properly awakened at the time i might have made still more haste and done it better well the comfort is that the little book was unadvertised and unknown and that most of the copies through my entreaty of my father are shut up in the wardrobe of his bedroom if ever i get well i shall show my joy by making a bonfire of them in the meantime the recollection of this sin of mine has been my nightmare and daymare too and the sin has been the blot on my escutcheon i could look in nobody's face with a thou canst not say i did it i know i did it and so i resolved to wash away the transgression and translate the tragedy over again it was an honest straightforward proof of repentance was it not and i have completed it except the transcription and last polishing if aeschylus stands at the foot of my bed now i shall have a little breath to front him i have done my duty by him not indeed according to his claims but in proportion to my faculty whether i shall ever publish or not remember remains to be considered that is a different side of the subject if i do it may be in a magazine or but this is another ground and then i have in my head to associate with the version a monodrama of my own not a long poem but a monologue of aeschylus as he sate a blind exile on the flats of sicily and recounted the past to his own soul just before the eagle cracked his great massy skull with a stone but my chief intention just now is the writing of a sort of novel poem a poem as completely modern as geraldine's courtship running into the midst of our conventions and rushing into drawing-rooms and the like where angels fear to tread and so meeting face to face and without mask the humanity of the age and speaking the truth as i conceive of it out plainly that is my intention it is not mature enough yet to be called a plan i am waiting for a story and i won't take one because i want to make one and i like to make my own stories because then i can take liberties with them in the treatment who told me of your skulls and spiders why couldn't i know it without being told did cornelius agrippa know nothing without being told mr horn never spoke it to my ears i never saw him face to face in my life although we have corresponded for long and long and he never wrote it to my eyes perhaps he does not know that i know it well then if i were to say that i heard it from you yourself how would you answer and it was so why are you not aware that these are the days of mesmerism and clairvoyance are you an infidel i have believed in your skulls for the last year for my part and i have some sympathy in your habit of feeling for chairs and tables i remember when i was a child and wrote poems in little clasped books i used to kiss the books and put them away tenderly because i had been happy near them and take them out by turns when i was going from home to cheer them by the change of air and the pleasure of the new place this not for the sake of the verses written in them and not for the sake of writing more verses in them but from pure gratitude other books i used to treat in a like manner and to talk to the trees and the flowers was a natural inclination but between me and that time the cypresses grow thick and dark is it true that your wishes fulfil themselves and when they do are they not bitter to your taste do you not wish them unfulfilled oh this life this life there is comfort in it they say and i almost believe but the brightest place in the house is the leaning out of the window at least for me of course you are self-conscious how could you be a poet otherwise tell me ever faithfully yours e b b and was the little book written with mr mill pure metaphysics or what end of section ten
Section 11 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Saturday night, March 1, 1845. Dear Miss Barrett, I seem to find of a sudden, surely I knew before, anyhow, I do find now that with the octaves on octaves of quite new golden strings you enlarge the compass of my life's harp with, there is added, too, such a tragic chord, that which you touched so gently in the beginning of your letter I got this morning, just escaping, etc. But if my truest heart's wishes avail, as they have hitherto done, you shall laugh at east winds yet as I do. See now, the sad feeling is so strange to me, that I must write it out. Must! And you might give me great, the greatest pleasure for years, and yet find me as passive as a stone used to wine libations, and as ready in expressing my sense of them. But when I am pained, I find the old theory of the uselessness of communicating the circumstances of it singularly untenable. I have been spoiled in this world, to such an extent, indeed, that I often reason out, make clear to myself, that I might very properly, so far as myself am concerned, take any step that would peril the whole of my future happiness, because the past is gained, secure, and on record, and though not another of the old days shall dawn on me, I shall not have lost my life, no, out of all which you are, please, to make a sort of sense, if you can, so as to express that I have been deeply struck to find a new, real, unmistakable sorrow, along with these as real, but not so new joys you have given me. How strangely this connects itself in my mind with another subject in your note. I looked at that translation for a minute, not longer, years ago, knowing nothing about it or you, and I only looked to see what rendering a passage had received that was often in my thoughts. I forget your version. It was not yours. My yours then. I mean, I had no extraordinary interest about it. But the original makes Prometheus, telling over his bestowments towards human happiness, say as something, pere terre tonte, that he stopped mortals, me pro terque smahum, to pi on erum, asks the chorus, tis me fere cona noson, whereto he replies, ti flasena a tisa e vitas ca to kisa, what you hear, men dissertate upon the hour, as proving the immortality of the soul, apart from revelation, undying yearnings, restless longings, instinctive desires which, unless to be eventually indulged, they were cruel to plant in us, etc., etc., but mero fali matisa tore solvirotis concludes the chorus like a sigh from the admitted Lucinian Escylus was. You cannot think how this foolish circumstance struck me this evening. So I thought I would even tell you at once, and be done with it. Are you not my dear friend already? And shall I not use you, and pray you not to lean out of the window when my own foot is only on the stair? Do wait a little for yours ever, R.B. End of section 11Section 12 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, March 5, 1845. But I did not mean to strike a tragic chord. Indeed, I did not. Sometimes one's melancholy will be uppermost, and sometimes one's mirth. The world goes round, you know. 
and i suppose that in that letter of mine the melancholy took the turn as to escaping with my life it was just a phrase at least it did not signify more than that the sense of mortality and discomfort of it is peculiarly strong with me when east winds are blowing and waters freezing for the rest i am essentially better and have been for several winters and i feel as if it were intended for me to live and not die and i am reconciled to the feeling yes i am satisfied to take up with the blind hopes again and have them in the house with me for all that i sit by the window by the way did the chorus utter scorn in the megaphelima i think not it is well to fly towards the light even where there may be some fluttering and bruising of wings against the window-panes is it not there is an obscurer passage on which i covet your thoughts where prometheus after the sublime declaration that with a full knowledge of the penalty reserved for him he had sinned of free will and choice goes on to say or to seem to say that he had not however foreseen the extent and detail of the torment the skyey rocks and the friendless desolation see verse two hundred seventy five the intention of the poet might have been to magnify to his audience the torment of the martyrdom but the heroism of the martyr diminishes in proportion and there appears to be a contradiction and oversight or is my view wrong tell me and tell me too if aeschylus is not the divinest of all the divine greek souls people say after quintilian that he is savage and rude a sort of poetic orson with his locks all wild but i will not hear it of my master he is strong as zeus is and not as a boxer and tender as power itself which always is tenderest but to go back to the view of life with the blind hopes you are not to think whatever i may have written or implied that i lean either to the philosophy or affectation which beholds the world through darkness instead of light and speaks of it wailingly now may god forbid that it should be so with me i am not desponding by nature and after a course of bitter mental discipline and long bodily seclusion i come out with two learned lessons as i sometimes say and oftener feel the wisdom of cheerfulness and the duty of social intercourse anguish has instructed me in joy and solitude in society it has been a wholesome and not unnatural reaction and altogether i may say that the earth looks the brighter to me in proportion to my own deprivations the laburnum trees and rose trees are plucked up by the roots but the sunshine is in their places and the root of the sunshine is above the storms what we call life is a condition of the soul and the soul must improve in happiness and wisdom except by its own fault these tears in our eyes these faintings of the flesh will not hinder such improvement and i do like to hear testimonies like yours to happiness and i feel it to be a testimony of a higher sort than the obvious one still it is obvious too that you have been spared up to this time the great natural afflictions against which we are nearly all called sooner or later to struggle and wrestle or your step would not be on the stair quite so lightly and so we turn to you dear mr browning for comfort and gentle spiriting remember that as you owe your unscathed joy to god you should pay it back to his world and i thank you for some of it already also writing as from friend to friend as you say rightly that we are i ought to confess that of one class of griefs which has been called too the bitterest i know as little as you the cruelty of the world and the treason of it the unworthiness of the dearest of these griefs i have scanty knowledge it seems to me from my personal experience that there is kindness everywhere in different proportions and more goodness and tender-heartedness than we read of in the moralists people have been kind to me even without understanding me and pitiful to me without approving of me nay have not the very critics tamed their burden for me and roared delicately as sucking doves on behalf of me i have no harm to say of your world though i am not of it as you see and i have the cream of it in your friendship and a little more and i do not envy much the milkers of the cows how kind you are how kindly and gently you speak to me some things you say are very touching and some surprising and although i am aware that you unconsciously exaggerate what i can be to you yet it is delightful to be broad awake and think of you as my friend 
May God bless you. Faithfully yours, Elizabeth B. Barrett. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday morning. Postmark. March 12, 1845. Your letter made me so happy, dear Miss Barrett, that I have kept quiet this while. Is it too great a shame if I begin to want more good news of you, and to say so? Because there has been a bitter wind ever since. Will you grant me a great favor? Always when you write, though about your own works, not Greek plays merely. Put me in, always, a little official bulletin line that shall say, I am better, or still better, will you? That is done then, and now... What do I wish to tell you first? The poem you propose to make, for the times, the fearless, fresh, living work you describe, is the only poem to be undertaken now by you or any one that is a poet at all. The only reality, only effective piece of service to be rendered God and man. It is what I have been all my life intending to do, and now shall be much, much nearer doing it since you will along with me. And you can do it. I know and am sure, so sure, that I could find in my heart to be jealous of your stopping in the way even to translate the Prometheus, though the accompanying monologue will make amends too. Or shall I set you a task I meant for myself, once upon a time, which, oh, how you would fulfill. Restore the Prometheus, Pierre Foros, as Shelley did the Leominos, when I say restore, I know, or very much fear, that the Pierre Foros was the same with the Pierre Kayafs, which, by a fragment, we sorrowfully ascertain to have been a satiric drama, but surely the capabilities of the subject are much greater than in this. We now wonder at nay they include all those of this list for just see how magnificently the story unrolls itself the beginning of jupiter's dynasty the calm in heaven after the storm the ascending stop i will get the book and give the words o post tahis daton patro on istro nan kathe zite fists dima sin ne me jera Ali sin ala ketalipa, all the while a Prometheus being the first among the first in honor, as keti the isa tis neas to tis tera tis alos ego pandelos ti o resa. Then the one black hand cloudlet storming the joyous blue and gold everywhere. Vroton te ton tale poron. Lagon uk es hen u tena, and the design of Zeus to blot out the whole race and plant a new one. And Prometheus, with his grand solitary Eho de Tolmisa, and is saving them as the first good from annihilation. Then comes the darkening brow of Zeus, and estrangement from the benign circle of grateful gods, and the dissuasion of old confederates and all the right that one may fancy in might the strongest reasons paves tropu philon tropu coming from the own mind of the titan if you will and all the while he shall be proceeding steadily in the alleviation of the sufferings of mortals whom ni pios on das tuprin e nos ke frinon e pivolos e tiki while still in proportion shall the doom he is about to draw on himself manifest itself more and more distinctly till at the last he shall achieve the salvation of man body by the gift of fire and soul by even those tifle el pithes hopes of immortality 
and so having rendered him utterly, according to the mythos here, independent of Jove, for observe, Prometheus in the play never talks of helping mortals more, of fearing for them more, of even benefiting them more by his sufferings. The rest is between Jove and himself. He will reveal the master secret to Jove, when he shall have released him, etc. There is no stipulation that the gifts to mortals shall be continued. Indeed, by the fact that it is Prometheus who hangs on Caucasus, while the ephemerals possess fire, one sees that somehow mysteriously they are past Jove's harming now. Well, this wholly achieved, Price is as wholly accepted, and off into the darkness passes in calm triumphant grandeur the Titan, with strength and violence, and Vulcan silent and downcast eyes. Then the gold clouds, in renewed flushings of felicity, shut up the scene again, with might in his old throne again, yet with a new element of mistrust, and conscious shame, and fear, that writes significantly enough above all the glory, and rejoicing that all is not as it was, nor will ever be. Such might be the framework of your drama, just what cannot help striking one at first glance, and would not such a drama go well before your translation? Do think of this and tell me. It nearly writes itself. You see, I meant the me o fe lima to be a deep, great truth, if there were no life beyond this. I think the hope in one would be an incalculable blessing for this life which is melancholy for one like Aeschylus, to feel, if he could only hope, because the argument as to the ulterior good of those hopes is cut clean away, and what had he left? I do not find it take away from my feeling of the magnanimity of Prometheus, that he should, in truth, complain, as he does from beginning to end, of what he finds himself suffering. He could have prevented all, and can stop it now, of that he never thinks for a moment. That was the old Greek way. They never let an antagonistic passion neutralize the other, which was to influence the man to his praise or blame. A Greek hero fears exceedingly, and battles it out, cries out when he is wounded, and fights on, does not say his love or hate makes him see no danger or feel no pain. Aeschylus, from first word to last, Eis them me e apasho, to istro res me os e thi ka pasho, insists on the unmitigated reality of the punishment which only the sun and divine ether and the godhead of his mother can comprehend. Still, still that is only what I suppose. A sky less to have done in your poem you shall make Prometheus our way. And now enough of Greek which I am fast forgetting, for I never look at books I loved once. It was your mention of the translation that brought out the old fast fading outlines of the poem in my brain. The Greek poem, that is. You think, for I must get to you, that I unconsciously exaggerate what you are to me. Now, you don't know what that is, nor can I very well tell you, because the language with which I talk to myself of these matters is spiritual attic and love's contractions, as grammarians say. But I read it myself, and well know what it means. That's why I told you I was self-conscious. I meant that I never mistook my own feelings, one for another. There, of what use is talking? Only do you stay here with me in the house these few short years. You think I shall see you in two months, three months? I may travel, perhaps. So you have got to like society, and would enjoy it, you think? For me, I always hated it, have put up with it these six or seven years past, lest by foregoing it I should let some unknown good escape me in the true time of it, and only discover my fault when too late. And now that I have done most of what is to be done, any lodge in a garden of cucumbers for me, I don't even care about reading now, the world and pictures of it, rather than writings about the world. But you must read books, in order to get words and forms for the public, if you write, and that you needs must do, if you fear God. 
I have no pleasure in writing myself, none in the mere act, though all pleasure in the sense of fulfilling a duty, whence, if I have done my real best, judge how heartbreaking a matter must it be to be pronounced a poor creature by critic, this acquaintance the other. But I think you like the operation of writing, as I should like that of painting or making music, do you not? After all, there is a great delight in the heart of the thing, and use and forethought have made me ready at all times to set to work. But, I don't know why, my heart sinks whenever I open this desk, and rises when I shut it. Yet, but for what I have written, you would never have heard of me, and though what you have written, not properly for it, I love and wish you well. Now, will you remember what I began my letter by saying? How you have promised to let me know if my wishing takes effect, and if you still continue better? And not even, since we are learned in magnanimity, don't even tell me that or anything else, if it teases you. But wait your own good time, and know me for, if these words were but my own, and fresh minted, for this moment's use. Yours ever faithfully, R. Browning. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, 50 Wimpole Street, March 20th, 1845. Whenever I delay to write to you, dear Mr. Browning, it is not to be sure that I take my own good time, but submit to my own bad time. It was kind of you to wish to know how I was, and not unkind of me to suspend my answer to your question, for indeed I have not been very well, nor have had much heart for saying so. This implacable weather, this east wind that seems to blow through the sun and moon, who can be well in such a wind? Yet for me I should not grumble. There has been nothing very bad the matter with me as there used to be. I only grow weaker than usual and learn my lesson of being mortal in a corner, and then all this must end. April is coming. There will be both a May and a June if we live to see such things, and perhaps after all we may. And as to seeing you besides, I observe that you distrust me and that perhaps you penetrate my morbidity and guess how, when the moment comes to see a living human face to which I am not accustomed, I shrink and grow pale in the spirit. Do you? You are learned in human nature, and you know the consequences of leading such a secluded life as mine, notwithstanding all my fine philosophy about social duties and the like. Well, if you have such knowledge, or if you have it not, I cannot say, but I do say that I will indeed see you when the warm weather has revived me a little and put the earth to rights again, so as to make pleasures of the sort possible. For if you think that I shall not like to see you, you are wrong, for all your learning. But I shall be afraid of you at first, though I am not in writing thus. You are Paracelsus, and I am a recluse, with nerves that have been all broken on the rack and now hang loosely, quivering at a step and breath. And what you say of society draws me on to many comparative thoughts of your life and mine. You seem to have drunken of the cup of life full, with the sun shining on it. I have lived only inwardly, or with sorrow for a strong emotion. Before this seclusion of my illness, I was secluded still, and there are few of the youngest women in the world who have not seen more, heard more, known more of society than I, who am scarcely to be called young now. I grew up in the country, had no social opportunities, had my heart in books and poetry, and my experience in reveries. My sympathies drooped towards the ground like an untrained honeysuckle, and but for one in my own house, but of this I cannot speak. It was a lonely life, growing green like the grass around it. Books and dreams were what I lived in, and domestic life only seemed to buzz gently around, like the bees about the grass. And so time passed, and passed, and afterwards, when my illness came, and I seemed to stand at the edge of the world with all done, and no prospect, as appeared at one time, of ever passing the threshold of one room again, why then, 
i turned to thinking with some bitterness after the greatest sorrow of my life had given me room and time to breathe that i had stood blind in this temple i was about to leave that i had seen no human nature that my brothers and sisters of the earth were names to me that i had beheld no great mountain or river nothing in fact i was as a man dying who had not read shakespeare and it was too late do you understand and do you also know what a disadvantage this ignorance is to my art why if i live on and yet do not escape from this seclusion do you not perceive that i labour under signal disadvantages that i am in a manner as a blind poet certainly there is a compensation to a degree i have had much of the inner life and from the habit of self-consciousness and self-analysis i make great guesses at human nature in the main but how willingly i would as a poet exchange some of this lumbering ponderous helpless knowledge of books for some experience of life and man for some but all grumbling is a vile thing we should all thank god for our measures of life and think them enough for each of us i write so that you may not mistake what i wrote before in relation to society although you do not see from my point of view and that you may understand what i mean fully when i say that i have lived all my chief joys and indeed nearly all emotions that go warmly by that name and relate to myself personally in poetry and in poetry alone like to write of course of course i do i seem to live while i write it is life for me why what is to live not to eat and drink and breathe but to feel the life in you down all the fibres of being passionately and joyfully and thus one lives in composition surely not always but when the wheel goes round and the procession is uninterrupted is it not so with you oh it must be so for the rest there will be necessarily a reaction and in my own particular case whenever i see a poem of mine in print or even smoothly transcribed the reaction is most painful the pleasure the sense of power without which i could not write a line is gone in a moment and nothing remains but disappointment and humiliation i never wrote a poem which you could not persuade me to tear to pieces if you took me at the right moment i have a seasonable humility i do assure you how delightful to talk about oneself but as you tempted me and i did eat i entreat your long suffering of my sin and ah if you would but sin back so in turn you and i seem to meet in a mild contrarious harmony as in the si no si no of an italian duet i want to see more of men and you have seen too much you say i am in ignorance and you in satiety you don't even care about reading now is it possible and i am as fresh about reading as ever i was as long as i keep out of the shadow of the dictionaries and of theological controversies and the like shall i whisper it to you under the memory of the last rose of last summer i am very fond of romances yes and i read them not only as some wise people are known to do for the sake of the eloquence here and the sentiment there and the graphic intermixtures here and there but for the story just as little children would sitting on their papa's knee my childish love of a story never wore out with my love of plum cake and now there is not a hole in it i make it a rule for the most part to read all the romances that other people are kind enough to write and woe to the miserable white who tells me how the third volume endeth have you in you any surviving innocence of this sort or do you call it idiocy if you do i will forgive you only smiling to myself i give you notice with a smile of superior pleasure mr chorley made me quite laugh the other day by recommending mary howitt's improvisatore with a sort of deprecating reference to the descriptions in the book just as if i never read a novel i i wrote a confession back to him which made him shake his head perhaps and now i confess to you unprovoked i am one who could have forgotten the plague listening to boccaccio's stories and i am not ashamed of it i do not even see the better part i am so silly ah you tempt me with a grand vision of prometheus i who have just escaped with my life after treading milton's ground you would send me to aeschylus's no i do not dare and besides i am inclined to think that we want new forms as well as thoughts 
the old gods are dethroned why should we go back to the antique moulds classical moulds as they are so improperly called if it is a necessity of art to do so why then those critics are right who hold that art is exhausted and the world too worn out for poetry i do not for my part believe this and i believe the so-called necessity of art to be the mere feebleness of the artist let us all aspire rather to life and let the dead bury their dead if we have but courage to face these conventions to touch this low ground we shall take strength from it instead of losing it and of that i am intimately persuaded for there is poetry everywhere the treasure see the old fable lies all over the field and then christianity is a worthy myth and poetically acceptable i had much to say to you or at least something of the blind hopes etc but am ashamed to take a step into a new sheet if you mean to travel why i shall have to miss you do you really mean it how is the play going on and the poem may god bless you ever and truly yours e b b end of section 14section fifteen of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b monday morning postmark march thirty one eighteen forty five when you read don quixote my dear romance reader do you ever notice that flower of an incident of good fellowship or the friendly squire of him of the moon or the looking glasses i forget which passes to sancho's dry lips all under a cork tree one morning a plump wine-skin and do you admire dear brave miguel's knowledge of thirsty nature when he tells you that the drinker having seriously considered for a space the pleiades or place where they should be fell as he slowly returned the shriveled bottle to its donor into a deep musing of an hour's length or thereabouts and then mark only then fetching a profound sigh broke silence with such a piece of praise as turns pale the labors in that way of rabelais and the tyan if he wasn't a byzantine monk alas and our Mr. Kenyon's stately self, since my own especial poet, ah moi, can do all with anybody, only sips like a fly, she says, and so cares not to compete with these behemoths that drink up Jordan. Well then, oh, I must get quicker to the sentence's end, and be brief as an oracle explainer. The giver is you, and the taker is I, and the letter is the wine, and the star-gazing is the reading the same and the brown study is how shall i deserve and be grateful enough to this new strange friend of my own that has taken away my reproach among men that have each and all their friend so they say not that i believe all they say they boast too soon sometimes no doubt i once was shown a letter wherein the truth stumbled out after this fashion dear smith i cause you dare because you are so in your shop and the great sigh is there is no deserving nor being grateful at all and the breaking silence is and the praise is ah there enough of it this sunny morning is as if i wished it for you ten strikes by the clock now tell me if at ten this morning you feel any good from my heart's wishes for you i will give you all you want out of my own life and gladness and yet keep twice the stock that should by right have sufficed the thin white face that is laughing at me and the glass yonder at the fancy of its making any one afraid and now with another kind of laugh at the thought that when its owner travels next he will leave off miss barrett along with port wine d mel iore p e s and among them to yours everywhere and at all times yours r browning i have all to say yet next letter r b end of section fifteen
Section 16 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday night. Postmark. April 16, 1845. I heard of you, dear Miss Barrett, between a polka and a salarius the other evening, of Mr. Kenyon, how this wind must hurt you, and yesterday I had occasion to go your way, past, that is, Wimpole Street, the end of it, and, do you know, I did not seem to have leave from you to go down it yet, much less count number after number till I came to yours, much least than less look up when I did come there. So I went on to a viperine she-friend of mine, who, I think, rather loves me, she does so hate me, and we talked over the chances of certain other friends, who were to be balloted for at the Athenaeum last night, one of whom, it seems, was in a fright about it, to such little purpose, said my friend, for he is so inoffensive now, if one were to style you that, or you, I said, and so we hugged ourselves in our grimness like tiger cats. Then there is a deal in the papers today about Maynooth, and a meeting presided over by Lord Mayor Gibbs, and the Reverend Mr. Somebody's speech, and Mrs. Norton has gone and book-made at a great rate about the Prince of Wales, pleasantly putting off till his time all that used of old to be put off till his mother's time. Altogether, I should dearly like to hear from you, but not till the wind goes and the sun comes, because I shall see Mr. Kenyon next week, and get him to tell me some more. And by the way, do you suppose anybody else looks like him? If you do, the first room full of real London people you go among, you will fancy to be lighted up by a saucer of burning salt and spirits of wine in the background. Monday, last night, when I could do nothing else, I began to write to you. Such writing as you have seen, strange. The proper time and season for good, sound, sensible, and profitable forms of speech. When ought it to have occurred, and how did I evade it in these letters of mine? For people begin with a graceful, skittish levity, lest you should be struck all of a heap with what is to come and that is sure to be the stuff and staple of the man, full of wisdom and sorrow. And then again comes the fringe of reeds and pink little stones on the other side, that you may put foot on land, and draw breath, and think what a deep pond you have swum across. But you are the real deep wonder of a creature, and I sail these paper boats on you rather impotently. But I always mean to be very grave one day, when I am in better spirits, and can go, for a dime. And one thing I want to persuade you of, which is, that all you gain by travel, is the discovery that you have gained nothing, and have done rightly in trusting to your innate ideas, or not rightly in distrusting them, as the case may be. You get, too, a little, perhaps a considerable good, in finding the world's accepted moulds everywhere into which you may run and fix your own fused metal, but not a grain troy weight do you get of new gold, silver, or brass. After this, you go boldly on your own resources, and are justified to yourself, that's all. Three scratches with a pen, even with this pen, and you have the green little Serenusa, where I have sate and heard the quails sing. One of these days I shall describe a country I have seen in my soul only, fruits, flowers, birds, and all. Ever yours, dear Miss Barrett, R. Browning. End of section 16section 17 of the letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett part 1 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Thursday morning. Postmark April 18th, 1845. 
if you did but know dear mr browning how often i have written not this letter i am about to write but another better letter to you in the midst of my silence you would not think for a moment that the east wind with all the harm it does to me is able to do the great harm of putting out the light of the thought of you to my mind for this indeed it has no power to do i had the pen in my hand once to write and why it fell out i cannot tell you and you see all your writing will not change the wind you wished all manner of good to me one day as the clock struck ten yes and i assure you i was better that day and i must not forget to tell you so though it is so long since and therefore i was logically bound to believe that you had never thought of me since unless you thought east winds of me that was quite clear was it not or would have been if it had not been for the supernatural conviction i had above all of your kindness which was too large to be taken in the hinge of a syllogism in fact i have long left off thinking that logic proves anything it doesn't you know but your lamia has taught you some subtle viperine reasoning and motiving for the turning down one street instead of another it was conclusive ah but you will never persuade me that i am the better or as well for the thing that i have not we look from different points of view and yours is the point of attainment not that you do not truly say that when all is done we must come home to place our engines and act by our own strength i do not want material as material no one does but every life requires a full experience a various experience and i have a profound conviction that where a poet has been shut from most of the outward aspects of life he is at a lamentable disadvantage can you speaking for yourself separate the results in you from the external influences at work around you that you say so boldly that you get nothing from the world you do not directly i know but you do indirectly and by a rebound whatever acts upon you becomes you and whatever you love or hate whatever charms you or is scorned by you acts on you and becomes you have you read the improvisatore or will you the writer seems to feel just as i do the good of the outward life and he is a poet in his soul it is a book full of beauty and had a great charm to me as to the polkas and selaiuses i do not covet them of course but what a strange world you seem to have to me at a distance what a strange husk of a world how it looks to me like mandarin life or something as remote nay not mandarin life but mandarin manners life even the outer life meaning something deeper in my account of it as to dear mr kenyon i do not make the mistake of fancying that many can look like him or talk like him or be like him i know enough to know otherwise when he spoke of me he should have said that i was better notwithstanding the east wind it is really true i am getting slowly up from the prostration of the severe cold and feel stronger in myself but mrs norton discourses excellent music and for the rest there are fruits in the world so overripe that they will fall without being gathered let maynooth witness to it if you think it worth while ever yours elizabeth b barrett and is it nothing to be justified to one's self in one's resources that's all indeed for the soul's country we will have it also and i know how well the birds sing in it how glad i was by the way to see your letter end of section 17section eighteen of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b wednesday morning postmark april thirty eighteen forty five if you did but know dear miss barrett how the full stop after morning just above has turned out the fullest of stops and how for but a quarter of an hour since the ink dried i have been reasoning out the why and wherefore of the stopping the wisdom of it and the folly of it by this time you see what you have got in me you ask me questions if i like novels if the 
improvisator is not good if travel and sightseeing do not affect this and that for one and what i am devising play or poem and i shall not say i could not answer at all manner of lengths but let me only begin some good piece of writing of the kind and no you shall have it have what i was going to tell you stops such judicious beginnings in a parallel case out of which your ingenuity shall please pick the meaning there is a story of disraeli's an old one with an episode of strange interest or so i found it years ago well you go breathlessly on with the people of it page after page till at last the end must come you feel and the tangled threads draw to one and an out-of-door feast in the woods helps you that is helps them the people wonderfully on and lo dinner is done and vivian gray is here and violet fain there and a detachment of the party is drafted off to go catch butterflies and only two or three stop behind at this moment mr somebody a good man and rather the lady's uncle in answer to a question from violet drew from his pocket a small neatly written manuscript and seating himself on an inverted wine cooler proceeded to read the following brief remarks upon the characteristics of the meso gothic literature this ends the page but you don't turn at once but when you do in bitterness of soul turn it you read on consideration i ben himself shall keep them from mr colburn's new magazine and deeply you draw thankful breath note this parallel case of mine is pretty sure to meet the usual fortune of my writings you will ask what it means and this it means or should mean all of it instance and reasoning and all that i am naturally earnest and earnest about whatever thing i do and little able to write about one thing while i think of another i think i will really write verse to you some day this day it is quite clear i had better give up trying no spite of all the lines in the world i will make an end of it as ophelia with her swan song for it grows too absurd but remember that i write letters to nobody but you and that i want method and much more that book you like so the danish novel must be full of truth and beauty to judge from the few extracts i have seen in reviews that a dane should write so confirms me in an old belief that italy is stuff for the use of the north and no more pure poetry there is none nearly as possible none in dante even material for poetry in the pitifulest romanticists of their thousands on the contrary strange that those great wide black eyes should stare nothing out of the earth that lies before them alfieri with even gray eyes and a life of travel writes you some fifteen tragedies as colorless as salad grown under a garden glass with matting over it as free that is from local coloring touches of the soil they are said to spring from think of saul and his greek attempts i expect to see mr kenyon at a place where i was last week but he kept away here is the bad wind back again and the black sky i am sure i never knew till now whether the east or west or south were the quarter to pray for but surely the weather was a little better last week and you were you not better and do you know but it's all self-flattery i believe so i cannot help fancying the east wind does my head harm too ever yours faithfully r browning End of section 18section 19 of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b thursday postmark may second eighteen forty five people say of you and of me dear mr browning that we love the darkness and use a sphinx seen idiom in our talk and really you do talk a little like a sphinx in your argument drawn from vivian gray once i sate up all night to read vivian gray 
but I never drew such an argument from him. Not that I give it up, nor you up, for a mere mystery, nor that I can see what you have got in you from a mere guess. But just observe, if I ask questions about novels, is it not because I want to know how much elbow room there may be for our sympathies, and whether there is room for my loose sleeves and the lace lappets, as well as for my elbows, and because I want to see you by the refracted lights as well as by the direct ones, and because I am willing for you to know me from the beginning, with all my weaknesses and foolishnesses, as they are accounted by people who say to me, no one would ever think without knowing you that you were so and so. Now if I send all my idle questions to Colburn's magazine with other Gothic literature and take to standing up in a perpendicular personality like the angel on the schoolman's needle in my letters to come, without further leaning to the left or the right, why the end would be that you would take to running after the butterflies for change of air and exercise. And then, oh, then my small neatly written manuscripts might fall back into my desk not a full stop. Indeed, I do assure you, I never for a moment thought of making conversation about the improvisatore, or novels in general, when I wrote what I did to you. I might to other persons, perhaps, certainly not to you. I was not dealing round from one pack of cards to you and to others. That's what you meant to reproach me for, you know, and of that I am not guilty at all. I never could think of making conversation in a letter to you, never. Women are said to partake of the nature of children, and my brothers call me absurdly childish sometimes, and I am capable of being childishly in earnest about novels and straws and such puppy-dog's tales as my flushes. Also, I write more letters than you do. I write, in fact, almost as you pay visits, and one has to make conversation in turn, of course. But give me something to vow by. Whatever you meant in the Vivian Grey argument, you were wrong in it and you never can be much more wrong, which is a comfortable reflection. Yet you leap very high at Dante's crown, or you do not leap, you simply extend your hand to it and make a rustling among the laurel leaves, which is somewhat profane. Dante's poetry only materials for the northern rhymers? I must think of that, if you please, before I agree with you. Dante's poetry seems to come down in hail rather than in rain, but count me the drops congealed in one hailstone. Oh, the flight of the Duchess, do let us hear more of her. Are you, I wonder, not a self-flatterer, but a flatterer? Ever yours, E.B.B. End of section 19《The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett》Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Saturday morning. Postmark. May 3, 1845. Now shall you see what you shall see. Here shall be sound speech, not to be reproved. For this morning you are to know that the soul of me has it all her own way, dear Miss Barrett. This green cool nine in the morning time for my chestnut tree over there, and for me who only coaxed my good-natured, really, body up after its three hours night rest on condition it should lounge or creep about incognito and without consequences, and so it shall all but my right hand which is half spirit, and cuts its poor relation, and passes itself off for somebody, that is, some soul, and is doubly active, and ready on such occasions. Now I shall tell you all about it, first what last letter meant, and then more. You are to know, then, that for some reason that looked like an instinct. I thought I ought not send shaft on shaft, letter plague on letter, with such an uninterrupted clanging that I ought to wait, say a week at least, having killed all your mules for you, before I shot down your dogs, but not exactly Fivos Apollon. But you ought to know further that when I did think I might go modestly on, oh me, let me get out of this slough of a simile, 
never mind with what dislocation of ankles plainly from waiting and turning my eyes away not from you but from you in your special capacity of being written to not spoken to when i turned again you had grown formidable somehow though that's not the word nor are you the person either it was my fortune my privilege of being your friend this one way that it seemed a shame for me to make no better use of than taking it up with talk about books and i don't know what write what i will you would read for once i think well then what i shall write shall be something on this book and the other book and my own books and mary howe's books and at the end of it good-bye and i hope here is a quarter of an hour rationally spent so the thought of what i should find in my heart to say and the contrast with what i suppose i ought to say all these things are against me but this is very foolish all the same i need not be told and as part and parcel of an older indeed primitive body of mine which i shall never wholly get rid of of desiring to do nothing when i cannot do all seeing nothing getting enjoying nothing where there is no seeing and getting and enjoying wholly and in this case moreover you are you and know something about me if not much and have read boz and the art of supplying ellipses and after particularly i have confessed all this why and how it has been you will saw by dire when i pull out my medieval gothic architectural manuscript so it was i remember now and instruct you about corbeys and ogives though after all it was none of vivian's doing that all the uncle kind of man's which i never profess to be now you see how i came to say some nonsense i very vaguely think what about dante some desperate splash i know i made for the beginning of my picture as when a painter at his wit's end and hunger's beginning says here shall the figure's hand be and spots that down meaning to reach it naturally from the other end of his canvas and leaving off tired there you see the spectral disjoined thing and nothing between it and rationality i intended to shade down and soften off and put in and leave out and before i had done bring italian poets round to their old place again in my heart giving new praise if i took old anyhow dante is out of it all as who knows but i with all of him in my head and heart but they do fret one those tantalizing creatures of fine passionate class with such capabilities and such a facility of being made pure mind of and the special instance that vexed me was that a man of sands and dog roses and white rock and green sea water just under should come to italy where my heart lives and discover the sights and sounds certainly discover them and so do all northern writers for take up handfuls of sonati rhyme poemetti doing of those who never did anything else and try and make out for yourself what say what flowers they tread on or trees they walk under as you might bid them those tree and flower loving creatures pick out of our north poetry a notion of what our daisies and harebells and furze bushes and brambles are odorosi fioretti rose porporeni biancamissimi gigli and of which you eternal triflers was it called yourself shelley and so told me years ago that in the mountains it was a feast when one should find those globes of deep red gold which in the woods the strawberry tree doth bear suspended in their emerald atmosphere so that when my uncle walked into a sorb tree not to tumble sheer over mont calvano and i felt the fruit against my face the little ragged bare-legged guide fairly laughed at my knowing them so well Nyersi sorbi no no does not all naples bay and half sicily shore and inland come flocking once a year to the pita grotta fete only to see the blessed king's volante or livery servants all in their best and though heaven opened and would not i engage to bring the whole of the piano of sorrento 
and likeness to a red velvet dressing gown properly spangled over before the priest that held it out on a pole had even begun his story how noah's son shem the founder of sorrento threw it off to swim thither as the world knows he did oh it makes one's soul angry so enough of it but never enough of telling you bring all your sympathies come with the loosest sleeves and longest lace lappets and you and yours shall find elbow room oh shall you not for never did man woman or child greek hebrew or as danish as our friend like a thing not to say love it but i liked it and loved it one liking neutralizing the rebellious stir of its fellow so that i don't go about now wanting the fixed stars before my time this world has not escaped me thank god and what other people say is the best of it may not escape me after all though until so very lately i made up my mind to do without it perhaps on that account and to make fair amends to other people who i have no right to say complain without cause i have been surprised rather with something not unlike illness of late i have had a constant pain in the head for these two months which only very rough exercise gets rid of and which stops my loria and much besides i thought i never could be unwell just now all of it is gone thanks to poking all night and walking home by broad daylight to the surprise of the thrushes in the bush here and do you know i said this must go cannot mean to stay so i will not tell miss barrett why this and this is not done but i mean to tell you all or more of the truth because you call me flatterer so that my eyes widened again i and in what and of whom pray not of you at all events of whom then do tell me because i want to stand with you and am quite in earnest here and the flight of the duchess to leave nothing out is only the beginning of a story written some time ago and given to the poor hood in his emergency at a day's notice the true stuff and story is all to come the flight and what you allude to is the mere introduction but the magazine has passed into other hands and i must put the rest in some bell or other it is one of my dramatic romances so is a certain saul i should like to show you one day an ominous liking for nobody ever sees what i do till it is printed but as you do know the printed little part of me i should not be sorry if in justice you knew all i have really done written in the portfolio there though that would be far enough from this me the wishes to you now i should like to write something in concert with you how i would try i read your letter through again does this clear up all the difficulty and do you see that i never dreamed of reproaching you for dealing out of one sort of cards to me and everybody else's but that why that which i have i hope said so need not re-say i will tell you sydney smith laughed somewhere at some methodist or other whose want was on meeting an acquaintance in the street to open at once on him with some inquiry after the state of his soul sydney knows better now and sees that one might quite as wisely ask such questions as the price of illinois stock or condition of Gleebland, and i could say such could the plague of it so no more at present from your loving or let me tell you i am going to see mr kenyon on the twelfth instant that you do not tell me how you are that yet if you do not continue to improve in health i shall not see you not 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 what not to untie surely the wind that sets my chestnut tree dancing all its baby come blossoms green now rocking like fairy castles on a hill in an earthquake that is southwest surely god bless you and me and that and do write to me soon and tell me who was the flatterer and how he never was yours r b end of section twenty
Section twenty one of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett. Part one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. E B B to R B. Monday and Tuesday. Postmark May sixth, eighteen forty five. So when wise people happen to be ill, they sit up till six o'clock in the morning and get up again at nine do tell me how lurias can ever be made out of such ungodly imprudences if the wind blows east or west where can any remedy be while such evil deeds are being committed and what is to be the end of it and what is the reasonableness of it in the meantime when we all know that thinking dreaming creating people like yourself have two lives to bear instead of one and therefore ought to sleep more than others throwing over and buckling in that fold of death to stroke the life purple smoother you have to live your own personal life and also luria's life and therefore you should sleep for both it is logical indeed and rational which logic is not always and if i had the tongue of men and of angels i would use it to persuade you polka for the rest may be good but sleep is better i think better of sleep than i ever did now that she will not easily come near me except in a red hood of poppies and besides praise your good-natured body as you like it is only a seeming good nature bodies bear malice in a terrible way be very sure appear mild and smiling for a few short years and then out with the cold steel and the soul has it with a vengeance according to the phrase you will not persist will you in this experimental homicide or oh, tell me if you will that i may do some more tearing it really really is wrong exercise is one sort of rest and you feel relieved by it and sleep is another one being as necessary as the other this is the first thing i have to say the next is a question what do you mean about your manuscripts about saul and the portfolio for i am afraid of hazardously supplying ellipses and your bows comes to bows epiglossy i get half bribed to silence by the very pleasure of fancying but if it could be possible that you should mean to say you would show me can it be or am i reading this attic contraction quite the wrong way you see i am afraid of the difference between flattering myself and being flattered the fatal difference and now will you understand that i should be too overjoyed to have revelations from the portfolio however incarnated with blots and pen scratches to be able to ask impudently of them now is that plain it must be at any rate that if you would like to write something together with me i should like it still better i should like it for some ineffable reasons and i should not like it a bit the less for the grand supply of jests it would administer to the critical board of trade about visible darkness multiplied by two mounting into palpable obscure we should not mind should we you would not mind if you had got over certain other considerations deconsiderating to your coadjutor yes but i dare not do it i mean think of it just now if ever and i will tell you why in a medieval gothic architectural manuscript the only poet by profession if i may say so except yourself with whom i ever had much intercourse even on paper if this is near too much has been mr horne we approached each other on the point of one of miss mitford's annual editorships and ever since he has had the habit of writing to me occasionally and when i was too ill to write at all in my dreary devonshire days i was his debtor for various little kindnesses for which i continue his debtor in my opinion he is a true-hearted and generous man do you not think so well long and long ago he asked me to write a drama with him on the greek model that is for me to write the choruses and for him to do the dialogue just then it was quite doubtful in my own mind and worse than doubtful whether i ever should write again and the very doubtfulness made me speak my yes more readily then i was desired to make a subject to conceive a plan and my plan was of a man haunted by his own soul making her a separate personal psyche a dreadful beautiful psyche the man being haunted and terrified through all the turns of life by her did you ever feel afraid of your own soul as i have done 
i think it is a true wonder of our humanity and fit subject enough for a wild lyrical drama i should like to write it by myself at least well enough but with him i will not now it was delayed delayed he cut the plan up into scenes i mean into a list of scenes a sort of ground map to work on and there it lies nothing more was done it all lies in one sheet and i have offered to give up my copyright of idea in it if he likes to use it alone or i should not object to work it out alone on my own side since it comes from me only i will not consent now to a double work in it there are objections none be it well understood in mr horne's disfavour for i think of him as well at this moment and the same in all essential points as i ever did he is a man of fine imagination and is besides good and generous in the course of our acquaintance on paper for i never saw him i never was angry with him except once and then i was quite wrong and had to confess it but this is being too medieval only you will see from it that i am a little entangled on the subject of compound works and must look where i tread and you will understand if you ever hear from mr kenyon or elsewhere that i am going to write a compound poem with mr horne how it was true and isn't true any more yes you are going to mr kenyon's on the twelfth and yes my brother and sister are going to meet you and your sister there one day to dinner shall i have courage to see you soon i wonder if you ask me i must ask myself but oh this make-believe may it can't be may after all if a south-west wind sate in your chestnut tree it was but for a few hours the east wind came up this way by the earliest opportunity of succession as the old mysteries showed beelzebub with a bearde even so has the east wind had a bearde of late in a full growth of bristling exaggerations the english spring winds have excelled themselves in evil this year and i have not been downstairs yet but i am certainly stronger and better than i was that is undeniable and i shall be better still you are not going away soon are you in the meantime you do not know what it is to be a little afraid of paracelsus so right about the italians and the rose porporine which made me smile how is the head ever yours e b b is the flight of the duchess in the portfolio of course you must ring the bell that poem has a strong heart in it to begin so strongly poor hood and all those thoughts fall mixed together may god bless you End of section 21. Section 22 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Sunday, in the last hour of it. Postmark, May 12, 1845. May I ask how the head is? just under the bag mr kenyon was here to-day and told me such bad news that i cannot sleep to-night although i did think once of doing it without asking such a question as this dear mr browning let me hear how you are will you and let me hear if i can that it was prudence or some unchristian virtue of the sort and not a dreary necessity which made you put aside the engagement for tuesday for monday i had been thinking so of seeing you on tuesday with my sister's eyes for the first sight and now if you have done killing the mules and the dogs let me have a straight quick arrow for myself if you please just a word to say how you are i ask for no more than a word lest the writing should be hurtful to you may god bless you always your friend e b b end of section twenty two Section 23 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Monday, Postmark, May 12, 1845. My dear, own friend, I am quite well now, or next to it, this is how it was 
I have gone out a great deal of late, and my head took to ringing such a literal alarum that I wondered what was to come of it, and at last, a few evenings ago, as I was dressing for a dinner somewhere, I got really bad of a sudden, and kept at home to my friend's heart-rending disappointment. Next morning I was no better, and it struck me that I should be really disappointing, dear kind Mr. Kenyon, in wasting his time, if that engagement too were broken with his little warning. So I thought it best to forego all hopes of seeing him at such a risk, and that done, I got rid of every other promise to pay visits for next week and next, and told everybody, with considerable dignity, that my London season was over for this year, as it assuredly is, and I shall be worried no more, and let walk in the garden, and go to bed at ten o'clock, and get done with what is most expedient to do, and my flesh shall come again like a little child's, and one day, oh the day, I shall see you with my own, own eyes, for how little you understand me, or rather yourself, if you think I would dare see you without your leave that way. Do you suppose that your power of giving and refusing ends when you have shut your room door? Did I not tell you I turned down another street, even the other day, and why not down yours? And often as I see Mr. Kenyon, have I ever dreamed of asking any but the merest conventional questions about you? your health, and no more. I will answer your letter, the last one, tomorrow. I have said nothing of what I want to say. Ever yours, R.B. End of section 23section 24 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, part 1 this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday, postmark, May 13, 1845. Did I thank you with any effect in the lines I sent yesterday, dear Miss Barrett? I know I felt most thankful, and, of course, began reasoning myself into that impropriety of allowing a more or a most in feelings of that sort towards you i am thankful for you all about you as do you not know thank you from my soul now let me never pass occasion of speaking well of horn who deserves your opinion of him it is my own too he has unmistakable genius and is a fine honest enthusiastic chivalrous fellow it is the fashion to affect to sneer at him. Of late, I think, the people he has praised, fancying that they pose themselves sculpturesquely in playing the greatly indifferent and the other kind, shaking each other's hands in hysterical congratulations at having escaped such a dishonor. I feel grateful to him. I know for his generous criticism and glad and proud of in any way approaching such a man's standard of poetical height. And he might be a disappointed man, too, for the players trifled with and teased out his very nature, which has a strange aspiration for the horrible tin and lacquer crown they give one from their clouds of smooth-shaven deal done over blue. And he don't give up the bad business yet, but thinks a small theatre would somehow not be a theater, and an actor not quite an actor. I forget in what way, but the upshot is, he hates not a jot in that rouged, wiggled, padded, empty-headed, heartless tribe of grimacers that came and canted me. Not I, them, a thing he cannot understand. So I am not the one he would have picked out to praise, had he not been loyal." I know he admires your poetry properly. God help him, and send some great artist from the country, who can read and write beside comprehending Shakespeare, and who exasperates his H's when the feat is to be done, to undertake the part of Cosmo, or Gregory, 
or what shall most soothe his spirit the subject of your play is tempting indeed and reminds one of that wild drama of calderon's which frightened shelley just before his death also of fuseli's theory with reference to his own picture of macbeth in the witch's cave wherein the apparition of the armed head from the cauldron is macbeth's own if you ask me i must ask myself that is when i am to see you i will never ask you you do not know what i shall estimate that permission at nor do i quite but you do do not you know so much of me as to make my asking worse than a form i do not ask you to write to me not directly ask at least i will tell you i ask you not to see me so long as you are unwell or mistrustful of uh, no no that is being too grand do see me when you can and let me not be only writing myself yours r b a kind so kind note from mr kenyon came we i and my sister are to go in june instead i shall go nowhere till then i am nearly well and save one little wheel in my head that keeps on its sostenuto that you are better i am most thankful next letter to say how you must help me with all my new romances and lyrics and lays and plays and read them and heed them and end them and mend them end of section twenty four Section 25 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sonia. EBB to RB. Thursday, postmark May 16th, 1845. But how, mistrustfulness? And how, that way? What have I said or done? I, who am not apt to be mistrustful of anybody, and should be a miraculous monster if I began with you what can i have said i say to myself again and again one thing at any rate i have done that way or this way i have made what is vulgarly called a piece of work about little or seemed to make it forgive me i am shy by nature and by position and experience by having had my nerves shaken to excess and by leading a life of such seclusion by these things together and by others besides i have appeared shy and ungrateful to you only not mistrustful you could not mean to judge me so mistrustful people do not write as i write surely for wasn't it a richelieu or mazarin or who who said that with five lines from any one's hand he could take off his head for a corollary i think so well but this is to prove that i am not mistrustful and to say that if you care to come to see me you can come and that it is my gain as i feel it to be and not yours whenever you do come you will not talk of having come afterwards i know because although i am fast bound to see one or two persons this summer besides yourself whom i receive of choice and willingly i cannot admit visitors in a general way and putting the question of health quite aside it would be unbecoming to lie here on the sofa and make a company show of an infirmity and hold a beggar's head for sympathy i should blame it in another woman and the sense of it has had its weight with me sometimes for the rest when you write that i do not know how you would value etc nor yourself quite you touch very accurately on the truth and so accurately in the last clause that to read it made me smile tant bien que mal certainly you cannot quite know or know at all whether the least straw of pleasure can go to you from knowing me otherwise than on this paper and i for my part quite know my own honest impression dear mr browning that none is likely to go to you there is nothing to see in me nor to hear in me i never learned to talk as you do in london although i can admire that brightness of carved speech in mr kenyon and others if my poetry is worth anything to any eye it is the flower of me i have lived most and been most happy in it and so it has all my colours the rest of me is nothing but a root fit for the ground and the dark and if i write all this egotism it is for shame 
and because i feel ashamed of having made a fuss about what is not worth it and because you are extravagant in caring so for a permission which will be nothing to you afterwards not that i am not touched by your caring so at all i am deeply touched now and presently i shall understand come then there will be truth and simplicity for you in any case and a friend and do not answer this i do not write it as a fly-trap for compliments your spider would scorn me for it too much also as to the how and when you are not well now and it cannot be good for you to do anything but be quiet and keep away that dreadful musical note in the head i entreat you not to think of coming until that is all put to silence satisfactorily when it is done you must choose whether you would like best to come with mr kenyon or to come alone and if you would come alone you must tell me on what day and i will see you on any day unless there should be an unforeseen obstacle any day after two or before six and my sister will bring you upstairs to me and we will talk or you will talk and you will try to be indulgent and like me as well as you can if on the other hand you would rather come with mr kenyon you must wait i imagine till june because he goes away on monday and is not likely immediately to return no on saturday to-morrow in the meantime why i should be thanked is an absolute mystery to me but i leave it you are generous and impetuous that i can see and feel and so far from being of an inclination to mistrust you or distrust you i do profess to have as much faith in your full pure loyalty as if i had known you personally as many years as i have appreciated your genius believe this of me for it is spoken truly in the matter of shakespeare's poor players you are severe and yet i was glad to hear you severe it is a happy excess i think when men of intense reality as all great poets must be give their hearts to be trodden on and tied up with ribbons in turn by men of masks there will be torture if there is not desecration not that i know much of such things but i have heard heard from mr kenyon heard from miss mitford who however is passionately fond of the theatre as a writer's medium not at all from mr horne himself except when he has printed on the subject yes he has been infamously used on the point of the new spirit only he should have been prepared for the infamy it was leaping into a gulf not to save the republic but pour rire it was not merely putting one's foot into a hornet's nest but taking off a shoe and stocking to do it and to think of dickens being dissatisfied to think of tennyson's friends grumbling he himself did not i hope and trust for you you certainly were not adequately treated and above all you were not placed with your peers in that chapter but that there was an intention to do you justice and that there is a righteous appreciation of you in the writer i know and am sure and that you should be sensible to this is only what i should know and be sure of you mr horne is quite above the narrow vicious hateful jealousy of contemporaries which we hear reproached too justly sometimes on men of letters i go on writing as if i were not going to see you soon perhaps remember that the how and the when rest with you except that it cannot be before next week at the soonest you are to decide always your friend e b b end of section twenty five Section 26 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Friday Night, Postmark, May 17, 1845. My friend is not mistrustful of me, no because she don't fear I shall make main prize of the stray cloaks and umbrellas downstairs, or turn an article for Colburn's on her sayings and doings upstairs. But spite of that, she does mistrust, so mistrust my common sense, nay, uncommon in dramatic poet sense, if I am put on asserting it, all which pieces of mistrust I could detect and catch struggling and pin to death in a moment, and put a label in, with name, genus, and species, just like a horrible entomologist. Only I won't, 
because the first visit of the north wind will carry the whole tribe into the red sea and those horns and tails and scale wings are best forgotten altogether and now will i say a cutting thing and have done have i trusted my friend so or said even to myself much less to her she is even as mr simpson who desireth the honour of the acquaintance of mr b whose admirable works have long been his simpson's especial solace and private and who accordingly is led to that personage by mutual friend simpson blushing as only adorable ingenuousness can and twisting the brim of his hat like a sailor giving evidence whereupon mr b beginneth by remarking that the rooms are growing hot or that he supposes mr s has not heard if there will be another adjournment of the house to-night whereupon mr s looketh up all at once brusheth the brim smooth again with his sleeve and takes to his assurance once more in something of a huff and after staying his five minutes out for a decency's sake nodeth familiarly and adieu and spinning round on his heel ejaculateth mentally well i did expect to see something different from that little yellow commonplace man and now i come to think there was some precious trash in that book of his have i said so will miss barrett ejaculate dear miss barrett i thank you for the leave you give me and for the infinite kindness of the way of giving it i will call it two on tuesday not sooner that you may have time to write should any adverse circumstances happen not that they need inconvenience you because what I want particularly to tell you for now and hereafter, do not mind my coming in the least. But should you be unwell, for instance, and just send or leave word, and I will come again and again and again. My time is of no importance, and I have acquaintances thick in the vicinity. Now, if I do not seem grateful enough to you, am I so much to blame? You see, it is high time you saw me, for I have clearly written myself out ever yours r b end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b saturday postmark may seventeenth eighteen forty five i shall be ready on tuesday i hope but i hate and protest against your horrible entomology beginning to explain would thrust me lower and lower down the circles of some sort of an inferno only with my dying breath i would maintain that i never could consciously or unconsciously mean to distrust you or the least in the world to simpsonize you what i said it was you that put it into my head to say it for certainly in my usual disinclination to receive visitors such a feeling does not enter there now there i am a whole giro lower now you will say perhaps that i distrust you and nobody else so it is best to be silent and bear all the cutting things with resignation that is certain still i must really say under this dreadful incubus charge of simpsonism that you who know everything or at least make awful guesses at everything in one's feelings and motives and profess to be able to pin them down in a book of classified inscriptions should have been able to understand better or misunderstand less in a matter like this yes i think so i think you should have made out the case in some such way as it was in nature viz that you had lashed yourself up to an exorbitant wishing to see me you who could see any day people who are a hundredfold and to all social purposes my superiors because i was unfortunate enough to be shut up in a room and silly enough to make a fuss about opening the door and that i grew suddenly abashed by the consciousness of this how different from a distrust of you how different ah if after this day you ever see any interpretable sign of distrustfulness in me you may be cutting again and i will not cry out in the meantime here is a fact for your entomology i have not so much distrust as will make a doubt as will make a curiosity for next tuesday not the simplest modification of curiosity enters into the state of feeling with which i wait for tuesday and if you are angry to hear me say so why 
you are more unjust than ever let it be three instead of two if the hour be as convenient to yourself before you come try to forgive me for my infinite kindness in the manner of consenting to see you is it the cruelest cut of all when you talk of infinite kindness yet attribute such villainy to me well but we are friends till tuesday and after perhaps ever yours e b b if on tuesday you should be not well pray do not come now that is my request to your kindness End of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b tuesday evening postmark may twenty one eighteen forty five i trust to you for a true account of how you are if tired if not tired if I did wrong in anything, or, if you please, right in anything, only not one word about my kindness, which, to get done with, I will grant is acceptive. But let us so arrange matters if possible, and why should it not be, that my great happiness, such as it will be if I see you, as this morning, from time to time, may be obtained at the cost of as little inconvenience to you as we can contrive for an instance just what strikes me they all say here i speak very loud a trick caught from having often to talk with a deaf relative of mine and did i stay too long i will tell you unhesitatingly of such corrigenda nay i will again say do not humiliate me do not again by calling me kind in that way i am proud and happy in your friendship now and ever may god bless you r b end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b wednesday morning postmark may twenty second eighteen forty five indeed there was nothing wrong how could there be and there was everything right as how should there not be and as for the loud speaking i did not hear any and instead of being worse i ought to be better for what was certainly to speak it or be silent of it happiness and honour to me yesterday which reminds me to observe that you are so restricting our vocabulary as to be ominous of silence in a full sense presently first one word is not to be spoken and then another is not and why why deny me the use of such words as have natural feelings belonging to them and how can the use of such be humiliating to you if my heart were open to you you could see nothing offensive to you in any thought there or trace of thought that has been there but it is hard for you to understand with all your psychology and to be reminded of it i have just been looking at the preface of some poems by some mr gurney where he speaks of the reflective wisdom of a wordsworth and the profound psychological utterances of a browning it is hard for you to understand what my mental position is after the peculiar experience i have suffered and what tiemi kaisi a sort of feeling is irrepressible from me to you when from the height of your brilliant happy sphere you ask as you did ask for personal intercourse with me what words but kindness but gratitude but i will not in any case be unkind and ungrateful and do what is displeasing to you and let us both leave the subject with the words because we perceive in it from different points of view we stand on the black and white sides of the shield and there is no coming to a conclusion but you will come really on tuesday and again when you like and can together and it will not be more inconvenient to me to be pleased i suppose than it is to people in general will it do you think ah how you misjudge why it must obviously and naturally be delightful to me to receive you here when you like to come 
and it cannot be necessary for me to say so in set words. Believe it of your friend, E.B.B. End of section 29《セクション・サディ・オフ・デ・レッターズ・オフ・ロバート・ブラウニング・アンド・エリザベス・バレット・バレット・パート・ワン。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. Mr. Browning's letter, to which the following is in answer, was destroyed. EBB to RB. Friday evening, postmark May 24th, 1845. I intended to write to you last night and this morning, and could not. You do not know what pain you give me in speaking so wildly, and if I disobey you, my dear friend, in speaking, I, for my part of your wild speaking, I do it not to displease you, but to be in my own eyes, and before God, a little more worthy, or less unworthy, of a generosity from which I recoil by instinct, and at the first glance, yet conclusively, and because my silence would be the most disloyal of all means of expression in reference to it. Listen to me then in this. You have said some intemperate things, fancies, which you will not say over again, nor unsay, but forget at once and forever having said at all, and which, so, will die out between you and me alone, like a misprint between you and the printer. And this you will do for my sake, who am your friend, and you have none truer, and this I ask, because it is a condition necessary to our future liberty of intercourse. You remember, surely you do, that I am in the most exceptional of positions, and that just because of it I am able to receive you as I did on Tuesday, and that for me to listen to unconscious exaggerations is as unbecoming to the humilities of my position, as unpropitious, which is of more consequence, to the prosperities of yours. Now if there should be one word of answer attempted to this, or of reference, I must not, I will not see you again, and you will justify me later in your heart. So for my sake you will not say it, I think you will not, and spare me the sadness of having to break through an intercourse just as it is promising pleasure to me, to me who have so many sadnesses and so few pleasures. You will, and I need not be uneasy, and I shall owe you that tranquillity as one gift of many." for that i have much to receive from you in all the free gifts of thinking teaching master spirits that i know it is my own praise that i appreciate you as none can more your influence and help in poetry will be full of good and gladness to me for with many to love me in this house there is no one to judge me now your friendship and sympathy will be dear and precious to me all my life if you indeed leave them with me so long or so little your mistakes in me, which I cannot mistake, and which have humbled me by too much honouring, I put away gently, and with grateful tears in my eyes, because all that hail will beat down and spoil crowns as well as blossoms. If I put off next Tuesday to the week after, I mean your visit, shall you care much? For the relations I name to you are to be in London next week, and I am to see one of my aunts, whom I love, and have not met since my great affliction, and it will all seem to come over again, and I shall be out of spirits and nerves. On Tuesday week you can bring a tomahawk and do the criticism, and I shall try to have my courage ready for it. Oh, you will do me so much good, and Mr. Kenyon calls me docile sometimes, I assure you, when he wants to flatter me out of being obstinate, and in good earnest I believe I shall do everything you tell me. The Prometheus is done, but the monodrama is where it was, and the novel not at all. But I think of some half-promises half-given about something I read for Saul and the flight of the Duchess. Where is she? You are not displeased with me. No, that would be hail and lightning together. I do not write as I might of some words of yours, but you know that I am not a stone, even if silent like one. And if in the unsilence I have said one word to vex you, Pity me for having had to say it, and for the rest, may God bless you far beyond the reach of vexation from my words or my deeds. Your friend in grateful regard, E.B.B. End of section 30 
Section 31 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Saturday morning. Postmark. May 24, 1845. Don't you remember I told you, once on a time, that you knew nothing of me, whereat you demurred, but I meant what I said, and knew it was so, to be grand in a simile, for every poor speck of a Vesuvius, or a Stromboli, in my microcosm, there are huge layers of ice, and pits of black cold water, and I make the most of my two or three fire eyes, because I know by experience, alas, how these tend to extinction, and the ice grows and grows. Still this last is true part of me, most characteristic part, best part, perhaps, and I disown nothing, only when you talked of knowing me. Still I am utterly unused, of these late years particularly, to dream of communicating anything about that to another person. All my writings are purely dramatic, as I am always anxious to say, that when I make never so little an attempt, no wonder if I bungle notably. Language, too, is an organ that never studded this heavy, heavy head of mine. Will you not think me very brutal if I tell you I could almost smile at your misapprehension of what I meant to write? Yet I will tell you, because it will undo the bad effect of my thoughtlessness, and at the same time exemplify the point I have all along been honestly earnest to set you right upon. My real inferiority to you. Just that, and no more. I wrote to you in an unwise moment, on the spur of being again thanked, and, unwisely writing, just as if thinking to myself, said what must have looked absurd enough as seen apart from the horrible counterbalancing never to be written rest of me by the side of which could it be written and put before you my note would sink to its proper and relative place and become a mere thank you for your good opinion which i assure you is far too generous for i really believe you to be my superior in many respects and feel uncomfortable till you see that too, since I hope for your sympathy and assistance and frankness is everything in such a case. I do assure you that had you read my note, only having known so much of me as is implied in having inspected, for instance, the contents merely of that fatal and often referred to portfolio there, Dii meliora peis. You would see in it the note, not the portfolio, the blandest utterance ever mild gentleman gave birth to. But I forgot that one may make too much noise in a silent place by playing the few notes on the ear piercing fife, which in Othello's regimental band might have been thumped into decent subordination by his spirit-stirring drum, to say nothing of gong and ophiclade. Will you forgive me, on promise to remember for the future, and be more considerate? Not that you must too much despise me, neither, nor, of all things, apprehend I am at too denizing Ale Byron, giving you to understand unutterable somethings, longings for leith and all that far from it i never committed murders and sleep the soundest of sleeps but the heart is desperately wicked that is true and though i dare not say i know mine yet i have had signal opportunities i who began life from the beginning and can forget nothing but names and the date of the battle of waterloo and have known good and wicked men and women, gentle and simple, shaking hands with 
Edmund Keene and Father Matthew, you and Ottima. Then I had a certain faculty of self-consciousness, years and years ago, at which John Mill wondered, and which ought to be improved by this time, if constant use helps at all, and, meaning, on the whole, to be a poet, if not the poet, for I am vain and ambitious some nights. I do myself justice, and dare call things by their names to myself, and say boldly, This I love, this I hate, this I would do, this I would not do, under all kinds of circumstances, and talking, thinking, in this style to myself, and beginning, however tremblingly, in spite of conviction, to write in this style for myself, on the top of the desk, which contains my Songs of the Poets, number one, M.P. I wrote, which you now forgive, I know, because I am, from my heart, sorry that by a foolish fit of inconsideration I should have given pain for a minute to you, towards whom, on every account, I would rather soften and sleeken every word as to a bird, and not such a bird as my black self that go screeching about the world for dead horse, Corvus, Picus, Mirandola. I, too, who have been at such pains to acquire the reputation I enjoy in the world, asked Mr. Kenyon, and who dine and wine and dance and enhance the company's pleasure till they make me ill, and I keep house, as of late, Mr. Kenyon, for I only quote where you may verify, if you please. He says my common sense strikes him, in its contrast with my muddy metaphysical poetry. And so it shall strike you, for though I am glad that, since you did misunderstand me, you said so, and have given me an opportunity of doing by another way what I wish to do in that, yet, if you had not alluded to my writing, as I meant you should not, you would have certainly understood something of its drift, when you found me next Tuesday, precisely the same quiet. No, for I feel I speak too loudly, in spite of your kind disclaimer, but the same mild man about town you were gracious to the other morning, for indeed my own way of worldly life is marked out long ago, as precisely as yours can be, and I am set going with a hand, winker-wise, on each side of my head, and a directing finger before my eyes, to say nothing of an instinctive dread I have, that a certain whiplash is vibrating somewhere in the neighborhood in playful readiness. So, I hope here be proofs, Dogberry's satisfaction that, first, I am but a very poor creature compared to you, and entitled, by my wants, to look up to you. All I meant to say from the first of the first, and that, next, I shall be too much punished if, for this piece of mere inconsideration, you deprive me, more or less, or sooner or later, of the pleasure of seeing you, a little over-boisterous gratitude, for which, perhaps, caused all the mischief. The reasons you give for deferring my visits next week are too cogent for me to dispute. That is too true, and, being now and henceforward, on my good behavior, I will at once cheerfully submit to them, if needs must, but should your mere kindness and forethought, as I half suspect, have induced you to take such a step, you will now smile with me at this new and very unnecessary addition to the fears of me. I have got so triumphantly over in your case. Wise man, was I not, to clench my first favorable impression so adroitly, like a recent Cambridge worthy my sister heard of, who, being on his theological, or rather scripture-historical, examination, was asked by the tutor who wished to let him off easily. Who was the first king of Israel? Saul, answered the trembling youth. Good, 
nodded approvingly the tutor. Otherwise called Paul, subjoined the youth in his elation. Now I have begged pardon, and blushingly assured you that was only a slip of the tongue, and that I did really mean all the while, Paul, or no Paul, the veritable son of Kish, he that owned the asses, and found listening to the harp the best of all things for an evil spirit. Pray write me a line to say, Oh, and if that's all, and remember me for good, which is very compatible with a moment's stupidity, and that me not for one fault, and that the only one that shall be, lose any pleasure for your friendship. I am sure I have not lost. God bless you, my dear friend. R. Browning. And by the way, will it not be better as cooperating with you more effectually in your kind promise to forget the printer's error in my blotted proof, to send me back that same proof, if you have not inflicted proper and summary justice on it, when Mephistopheles last came to see us in this world, outside here, he consult sundry of us, never to write a letter, and never to burn one. Do you know that? But I never mind what I am told. Seriously, I am ashamed. I shall next ask a servant for my paste in the high fantastical style of my own Loria. End of section 31「Section 32 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Sunday, May 25th, 1845. I owe you the most humble of apologies, dear Mr. Browning, for having spent so much solemnity on so simple a matter, and I hasten to pay it, confessing at the same time, as why should I not, that I am quite as much ashamed of myself as I ought to be, which is not a little. You will find it difficult to believe me, perhaps, when I assure you that I never made such a mistake, I mean of over-seriousness to indefinite compliments, no, never in my life before. Indeed, my sisters have often jested with me, in matters of which they were cognizant, on my supernatural indifference to the superlative degree in general, as if it meant nothing in grammar." I usually know well that boots may be called for in this world of ours, and that to bring bootes were the vilest of mala propositis. Also, I should have understood boots where you wrote it, in the letter in question, if it had not been for the relation of two things in it. And now I perfectly seem to see how I mistook that relation, seem to see, because I have not looked into the letter again since your last night's commentary, and will not inasmuch as I have observed before in my own mind that a good deal of what is called obscurity in you arises from a habit of very subtle association, so subtle that you are probably unconscious of it, and the effect of which is to throw together on the same level and in the same light things of likeness and unlikeness, till the reader grows confused as I did, and takes one for another. I may say, however, in a poor justice to myself, that I wrote what I wrote so unfortunately through reverence for you, and not at all from vanity on my own account, although I do feel palpably while I write these words here and now that I might as well leave them unwritten, for that no man of the world who ever lived in the world, not even you, could be expected to believe them, though said, sung, and sworn. For the rest, it is scarcely an apposite moment for you to talk, even dramatically, of my superiority to you. Unless you mean, which perhaps you do mean, my superiority in simplicity, and verily, to some of the adorable ingenuousness sacred to the shade of Simpson, I may put in a modest claim, and have my claim allowed. Pray do not mock me. I quote again from your Shakespeare, to you who are a dramatic poet, and I will admit anything that you like, being humble just now, even that I did not know you. I was certainly innocent of the knowledge of the ice and cold water you introduced me to, and am only just shaking my head, as flush would, after a first wholesome plunge. Well, if I do not know you, I shall learn, I suppose, in time. 
I am ready to try humbly to learn, and I may perhaps, if you are not done in Sanskrit, which is too hard for me, notwithstanding that I had the pleasure yesterday to hear from America of my profound skill in various languages less known than Hebrew, a liberal paraphrase on Mr. Horne's large fancies on the like subject, and a satisfactory reputation in itself, as long as it is not necessary to deserve it. So I here enclose to you your letter back again, as you wisely desire, although you never could doubt, I hope for a moment, of its safety with me in the completest of senses, and then from the heights of my superior stultity and other qualities of the like order, I venture to advise you, however, to speak of the letter critically and as the dramatic composition it is, it is to be admitted to be very beautiful and well worthy of the rest of its kin in the portfolio, lays of the poets or otherwise, I venture to advise you to burn it at once. And then, my dear friend, I ask you, having some claim, to burn at the same time the letter I was fortunate enough to write to you on Friday, and this present one. Don't send them back to me, I hate to have letters sent back, but burn them for me, and never mind Mephistopheles after which friendly turn you will do me the one last kindness of forgetting all this exquisite nonsense and of refraining from mentioning it by breath or pen to me or another now i trust you so far you will put it with the date of the battle of waterloo and i with every date in chronology seeing that i can remember none of them and we will shuffle the cards and take patience and begin the game again if you please and I shall bear in mind that you are a dramatic poet, which is not the same thing, by any means, with us of the primitive simplicities, who don't tread on cothorns or shift the mask in the scene. And I will reverence you both as a poet and as the poet, because it is no false ambition, but a right you have, and one which those who live longest will see justified to the uttermost. In the meantime, I need not ask Mr. Kenyon if you have any sense, because I have no doubt that you have quite sense enough, and even if I had a doubt, I shall prefer judging for myself without interposition, which I can do, you know, as long as you like to come and see me, and you can come this week if you do like it, because our relations don't come till the end of it, it appears, not that I made a pretense out of kindness, pray don't judge me so outrageously, but if you like to come, not on Tuesday, but on Wednesday at three o'clock, I shall be very glad to see you. And I, for one, shall have forgotten everything by that time, being quick at forgetting my own faults usually. If Wednesday does not suit you, I am not sure that I can see you this week, but it depends on circumstances. Only don't think yourself obliged to come on Wednesday. You know I began by entreating you to be open and sincere with me, and no more. I require no sleekening of every word. I love the truth and can bear it, whether in word or deed, and those who have known me longest would tell you so fullest. Well, may God bless you. We shall know each other some day, perhaps, and I am always and faithfully your friend, E.B.B. End of section 32《Section 33 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Postmark, May 26, 1845. Nay, I must have last word, as all people in the wrong desire to have, and then no more of the subject. You said I had given you great pain. So long as I stop that, think anything of me you choose or can. But before your former letter came, I saw the preordained uselessness of mine. Speaking is to some end, apart from foolish self-relief, which, after all, I can do without. And where there is no end, you see, or to finish characteristically, since the offering to cut off one's right hand to save anybody a headache is in vile taste, even for our melodramas, 
seeing that it was never yet believed in on the stage or off it how much worse to really make the ugly chop and afterwards come sheepishly in one's arm in a black sling and find that the delectable gift had changed aching to nausea there and now exit prompt side nearest door loria and enter r b next wednesday as boldly as he suspects most people do just after they have been soundly frightened i shall be most happy to see you on the day and at the hour you mention god bless you my dear friend r b end of section thirty three Section 34 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Monday morning, postmark, May 27th, 1845. You will think me the most changeable of all the changeable, but indeed it is not my fault that I cannot, as I wished, receive you on Wednesday. There was a letter this morning and our friends not only come to london but come to this house on tuesday to-morrow to pass two or three days until they settle in a hotel for the rest of the season therefore you see it is doubtful whether the two days may not be three and the three days four but if they go away in time and if saturday should suit you i will let you know by a word and you can answer by a yea or nay while they are in the house i must give them what time i can and indeed it is something to dread altogether tuesday i sent you the note i had begun before receiving yours of last night and also a fragment from mrs hadley's herein enclosed a full and complete certificate that you may know quite know what the real and only reason of the obstacle to wednesday is on saturday perhaps or on monday more certainly there is likely to be no opposition at least not on the cote gauche my side to our meeting but i will let you know more for the rest we have both been a little unlucky there's no denying in overcoming the embarrassments of a first acquaintance but suffer me to say as one other last word and quite quite the last this time in case there should have been anything approaching however remotely to a distrustful or unkind tone in what i wrote on sunday and i have a sort of consciousness that in the process of my self-scorning i was not in the most sabbatical of moods perhaps that i do recall and abjure it and from my heart entreat your pardon for it and profess notwithstanding it neither to choose nor to be able to think otherwise of you than i have done as of one most generous and most loyal for that if i chose i could not and that if i could i should not choose ever and gratefully your friend e b b and now we shall hear of luria shall we not and much besides and miss mitford has sent me the most high comical of letters to read addressed to her by r b hayden historical painter which has made me quite laugh and would make you expressing his righteous indignation at the great fact and gross impropriety of any man who has thoughts too deep for tears agreeing to wear a bag wig the case of poor wordsworth going to court you know mr hayden being infinitely serious all the time and yet holding the doctrine of the divine right of princes in his left hand how is your head may i be hoping the best for it may god bless you end of section thirty four section thirty five of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Postmark, May 28, 1845. Saturday, Monday, as you shall appoint. No need to say that, or my thanks. But this note troubles you, out of my bounden duty to help you, or Miss Mitford, to make the painter run violently down a steep place into the sea if that will amuse you, by further informing him what I know on the best authority, that Wordsworth's a bagwig, 
or at least the more important of his court habiliments were considerately furnished for the nonce by mr rogers from his own wardrobe to the manifest advantage of the laureate's pocket but more problematic improvement of his last person when one thinks on the astounding difference of build in the two poets the fact should be put on record if only as serving to render less chimerical a promise sometimes figuring in the columns of provincial newspapers that the two apprentices some grocer or other advertises for will be boarded and clothed like one of the family may not your unfinished really good head of the great man have been happily kept waiting for the body which can now be added on with all this picturesqueness of circumstances precept on precept but then line upon line is allowed by as good authority and may i not draw my confirming black line after yours yet not break pledge i am most grateful to you for doing me justice doing yourself your own judgment justice since even the playwright of theseus and the amazon found it one of his hardest devices to write me a speech lest the lady be frightened wherein it shall be said that i pyramus am not pyramus but etc etc god bless you one thing more but one you could never have misunderstood the asking for the letter again i feared you might refer to it poor constator lefate and now i am yours r b my head is all but well now thank you end of section thirty five Section 36 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Friday morning. Postmark May 30th, 1845. Just one word to say that if Saturday, tomorrow, should be fine, because in the case of its raining, I shall not expect you, you will find me at three o'clock yes the circumstances of the costume were mentioned in the letter mr rogers bagwig and the rest and david wilkie's sword and also that the laureate so equipped fell down upon both knees in the superfluity of etiquette and had to be picked up by two lords in waiting it is a large exaggeration i do not doubt and then i never sympathized with the sighing kept up by people about that acceptance of the laureateship which drew the bagwig as a corollary after it not that the laureateship honoured him but that he honoured it and that so honouring it he preserves a symbol instructive to the masses who are children and to be taught by symbols now as formerly isn't it true or at least may it not be true and won't the court laurel such as it is be all the worthier of you for wordsworth having worn it first and in the meantime i shall see you to-morrow perhaps or if it should rain on monday at the same hour ever yours my dear friend e b b end of section thirty six section thirty seven of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b friday morning postmark june seventh eighteen forty five when i see all you have done for me in this prometheus i feel more than half ashamed both of it and of me for using your time so and forced to say in my own defence not to you but myself that i never thought of meaning to inflict such work on you who might be doing so much better things in the meantime both for me and for others because you see it is not the mere reading of the manuscript but the comparing of the text and the melancholy comparisons between the english and the greek quite enough to turn you from your philanthropu tropu that i brought upon you and indeed i did not mean so much nor so soon yet as you have done it for me for me who expected a few jottings down with a pencil and a general opinion it is of course of the greatest value besides the pleasure and pride which come of it and i must say of the translation before putting it aside for the nuns 
that the circumstance of your paying it so much attention and seeing any good in it is quite enough reward for the writer and quite enough motive for self-gratulation if it were all torn to fragments at this moment which is a foolish thing to say because it is so obvious and because you would know it if i said it or not and while you were doing this for me you thought it unkind of me not to write to you yes and you think me at this moment the very princess of apologies and excuses and depreciations and all the rest of the small family of distrust or of hypocrisy who knows well but you are wrong wrong to think so and you will let me say one word to show where you are wrong not for you to controvert because it must relate to myself especially and lies beyond your cognizance and is something which i must know best after all and it is that you persist in putting me into a false position with respect to fixing days and the like and in making me feel somewhat as i did when i was a child and papa used to put me up on the chimney-piece and exhort me to stand up straight like a hero which i did straighter and straighter and then suddenly was where as we say in the ballads of the walls growing alive behind me and extending two stony hands to push me down that frightful precipice to the rug where the dog lay dear old havana and where he and i were likely to be dashed to pieces together and mix our uncanonized bones now my present false position which is not the chimney pieces is the necessity you provide for me in the shape of my having to name this day or that day and of your coming because i name it and of my having to think and remember that you come because i name it through a weakness perhaps or morbidness or one knows not how to define it i cannot help being uncomfortable in having to do this it is impossible not that i distrust you you are the last in the world i could distrust and then although you may be sceptical i am naturally given to trust to a fault as some say or to a sin as some reproach me and then again if i were ever such a distruster it could not be of you but if you knew me i will tell you if one of my brothers omits coming to this room for two days i never ask why it happened if my own father omits coming upstairs to say good night i never say a word and not from indifference do try to make out these readings of me as a dixit casau bonus and don't throw me down as a corrupt text nor convict me for an infidel which i am not on the contrary i am grateful and happy to believe that you like to come here and even if you came here as a pure act of charity and pity to me as long as you chose to come i should not be too proud to be grateful and happy still i could not be proud to you and i hope you will not fancy such a possibility which is the remotest of all yes and i am anxious to ask you to be wholly generous and leave off such an interpreting philosophy as you made use of yesterday and forgive me when i beg you to fix your own days for coming for the future will you it is the same thing in one way if you like to come really every week there is no hindrance to it you can do it and the privilege and obligation remain equally mine and if you name a day for coming on any week where there is an obstacle on my side you will learn it from me in a moment why i might as well charge you with distrusting me because you persist in making me choose the days and it is not for me to do it but for you i must feel that and i cannot help chafing myself against the thought that for me to begin to fix days in this way just because you have quick impulses like all imaginative persons and wish me to do it now may bring me to the catastrophe of asking you to come when you would rather not which as you say truly would not be an important vexation to you but to me would be worse than vexation to me and therefore i shrink from the very imagination of the possibility of such a thing and ask you to bear with me and let it be as i prefer left to your own choice of the moment and bear with me above all because this shows no want of faith in you none but comes from a simple fact with its ramifications that you know little of me personally yet and that you guess even but very little of the influence of a peculiar experience over me and out of me and if i wanted a proof of this 
we need not seek further than the very point of discussion and the hard worldly thoughts you thought i was thinking of you yesterday i who thought not one of them but i am so used to discern the correcting and ministering angels by the same footsteps on the ground that it is not wonderful i should look down there at any approach of a philia taxis whatever to this personal me have i not been ground down to browns and blacks and is it my fault if i am not green not that it is my complaint i should not be justified in complaining i believe as i told you that there is more gladness than sadness in the world that is generally and if some natures have to be refined by the sun and some by the furnace the less genial ones both means are to be recognized as good however different in pleasurableness and painfulness and though furnace fire leaves scorched streaks upon the fruit i assured you there was nothing i had any power of teaching you and there is nothing except grief which i would not teach you you know if i had the occasion granted it is a multitude of words about nothing at all this but i am like mariana in the moated grange and sit listening too often to the mouse in the wainscot be as forbearing as you can and believe how profoundly it touches me that you should care to come here at all much more so often and try to understand that if i did not write as you have asked it was just because i failed at the moment to get up enough pomp and circumstance to write on purpose to certify the important fact of my being a little stronger or a little weaker on one particular morning that i am always ready and rejoice to write to you you know perfectly well and i have proved by superfluity of naughtiness and prolixity through some twenty posts and this and therefore you will agree altogether to attribute no more to me on these counts and determine to read me no more backwards with your hebrew putting in your own vowel points without my leave shall it be so here is a letter grown from a note which it meant to be and i have been interrupted in the midst of it or it should have gone to you earlier let what i have said in it of myself pass unquestioned and unnoticed because it is of me and not of you and if in any wise lunatical all the talking and writing in the world will not put the implied moon into another quarter only be patient with me a little and let us have a smooth ground for the poems which i am foreseeing the sight of with such pride and delight such pride and delight and one thing which is chief though it seems to come last you will have advice will you not if that pain does not grow much better directly it cannot be prudent or even safe to let a pain in the head go on so long and no remedy be attempted for it and you cannot be sure that it is a merely nervous pain and that it may not have consequences and this quite apart from the consideration of suffering so you will see someone with an opinion to give and take it do i beseech you you will not say no also if on wednesday you should be less well than usual you will come on thursday instead i hope seeing that it must be right for you to be quiet and silent when you suffer so and the journey into london can let you be neither otherwise i hold to my day wednesday and may god bless you my dear friend ever yours e b b you are right i see nearly everywhere if not quite everywhere in the criticisms but of course i have not looked very closely that is i have read your papers but not in connection with the my side of the argument but i shall lose the post after all End of section 37section thirty eight of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b saturday morning postmark june seventh eighteen forty five i venture to hope this morning might bring me news of you first east winds on you then myself than those criticisms i do assure you i am properly apprehensive how are you may i go on wednesday without too much athavia pray remember what i said and wrote to the effect that my exceptions were in almost every case to be the reading 
not to your version of it but i have not specified the particular ones not written down the greek of my suggested translations have i and if you do not find them in the margin of your copy how you must wonder thus in the last speech but one of hermes i prefer porson and blomfeld's e me tha ti hon ti ma la ma ni no to the old combinations that include f t he though there is no manuscript authority for emendation it seems but in what respect does prometheus fare well or better even since the beginning and it is not the old argument over again that when a man fails he should repent of his ways and while thinking of hermes let me say that methi methi plas o thas pros is surely don't subject me to the trouble of a second journey by paying no attention to the first so says surely asked a and so backs him surely asked b especially created it should appear to show there could be in rerum natura such another as his predecessor a few other remarks occur to me which i will tell you if you please now i really want to know how you are and write for that ever yours r b end of section thirty eight section thirty nine of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b postmark june nine eighteen forty five just after my note left yours came i will try so to answer it as to please you and i begin by promising cheerfully to do all you bid me about naming days etc i do believe we are friends now and for ever there could be no reason therefore that i should cling tenaciously to any one or other time of meeting as if losing that i lost everything and for the future i will provide against sudden engagements outrageous weather etc to your heart's content nor am i going to accept against here and there a little wrong i could get up as when you imply from my quick impulses and the like no my dear friend for i seem sure i shall have quite quite time enough to do myself justice in your eyes let time show perhaps i feel a none the less sorely when you thank me for such company as mine that i cannot avoid confessing to myself that it would not be so absolutely out of my power perhaps to contrive really and deserve thanks and a certain acceptation i might really try at all events and amuse you a little better when i do have the opportunity and i do not but there is the thing it is all of a piece i do not seek your friendship in order to do you good any good only to do myself good though i would knows do that too enough of this i am much better indeed but will certainly follow your advice should the pain return and you you have tried a new journey from your room have you not do recollect at any turn any chance so far in my favour that i am here and yours should you want any fetching and carrying in this outside london world your brothers may have their own business to mind mr kenyon is at new york we will suppose here am i what else what else makes me count my cleverness to you as i know i have done more than once by word and letter but the real wish to be set at work i should have i hope better taste than to tell any everyday acquaintance who could not go out one single morning even on account of a headache that the weather was delightful much less that i had been walking five miles and meant to run ten yet to you i boasted once of poking and waltzing and more but then would it not be a very superfluous piece of respect in a four-footed bird to keep his wings to himself because his master oceanos could fly forsooth whereas he begins to wave a flap and show how ready they are to be off for what else were the good of him think of this 
and know me for yours. R.B. For good you are, to those notes you shall have more, that is, the rest. On Wednesday, then, at three, accept as you accept. God bless you. Oh, let me tell you, I suppose Mr. Horn must be in town, as I received a letter two days ago from the contriver of some literary society or other, who had before written to get me to belong to it, protesting against my reasons for refusing, and begging that, at all events, I would suspend my determination till I had been visited by Mr. H. on the subject. And, as they can hardly mean to bring him express from the Drachenfels, for just that, he is returned, no doubt, and as he is your friend, I take the opportunity of mentioning the course I shall pursue with him, or any other friend of yours I may meet, and everybody else I may add, the course I understand you to desire with respect to our own intimacy. While I may acknowledge, I believe, that I correspond with you, I shall not, in any case, suffer it to be known that I see or have seen you. This I just remind you of, lest any occasion of embarrassment should arise, for a moment, from your not being quite sure how I had acted in any case. Conche le baccio le mana e riverdala. End of section 39《Section Section Forty of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. E B B to R B. Tuesday morning. Postmark June tenth, eighteen forty-five. I must thank you by one word for all your kindness and consideration, which could not be greater nor more felt by me. In the first place, afterwards if that should not be irish dialect do understand that my letter passed from my hands to go to yours on friday but was thrown aside carelessly downstairs and covered up they say so as not to be seen until late on saturday and i can only humbly hope to have been cross enough about it having conscientiously tried to secure a little more accuracy another time and then if ever i should want anything done or found a rock's egg or the like you may believe me that i shall not scruple to ask you to be the finder but at this moment i want nothing indeed except your poems and that is quite the truth now do consider and think what i could possibly want in your outside london world you who are the genius of the lamp why if you light it and let me read your romances etc by it is not that the best use for it and am i likely to look for another only i shall remember what you say gratefully and seriously and if ever i should have a good fair opportunity of giving you trouble as if i had not done it already you may rely upon my evil intentions even though dear mr kenyon should not actually be at new york which he is not i am glad to say as i saw him on saturday which reminds me that he knows of your having been here of course and will not mention it as he understood from me that you would not thank you also there was an especial reason which constrained me on pain of appearing a great hypocrite to tell miss mitford the bare fact of my having seen you and reluctantly i did it though placing some hope in her promise of discretion and how necessary the discretion is will appear in the awful statistical fact of our having at this moment as my sisters were calculating yesterday some forty relations in london to say nothing of the right wing of the enemy for mr horne i could have told you and really i thought i had told you of his being in england last paragraph of all is that i don't want to be amused or rather that i am amused by everything and anything why surely surely you have some singular ideas about me so till to-morrow e b b instead of writing this note to you yesterday as should have been i went downstairs or rather was carried and am not the worse end of section forty section forty one of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain 
read by Sonia. E B B to R B Friday, postmark June fourteenth, eighteen forty five. Yes, the poem is too good in certain respects for the prizes given in colleges when all the pure parsley goes naturally to the rabbits and has a great deal of beauty here and there in image and expression. Still, I do not quite agree with you that it reaches the Tennyson standard anywise, and for the blank verse, I cannot for a moment think it comparable to one of the grand passages in Inoni and Arthur and the like. In fact, I seem to hear more in that latter blank verse than you do, to hear not only a mighty line as in Marlowe, but a noble full orbicular wholeness in complete passages which always struck me as the mystery of music and great peculiarity in tennyson's versification inasmuch as he attains to these complete effects without that shifting of the pause practised by the masters shelley and others a linked music in which there are no links that you would take to be a contradiction and yet something like that my ear has always seemed to perceive and i have wondered curiously again and again how there could be so much union and no fastening only of course it is not model versification and for dramatic purposes it must be admitted to be bad which reminds me to be astonished for the second time how you could think such a thing of me as that i wanted to read only your lyrics or that i preferred the lyrics or something barbarous in that way you don't think me ambidexter or either-handed and both hands open for what poems you will vouchsafe to me and yet if you would let me see anything you may have in a readable state by you the flight of the duchess or act or scene of the soul's tragedy i shall be so glad and grateful to you oh if you change your mind and choose to be bien prié i will grant it is your right and begin my liturgy directly but this is not teasing in the intention of it and i understand all about the transcription and the inscrutableness of rough copies that is if you write as i do so that my guardian angel or mr champollion cannot read what is written only whatever they can remember i can and you are not to mind trusting me with the cacistography possible to mortal readers the sun shines so that nobody dares complain of the east wind and indeed i am better altogether May God bless you, my dear friend. E. B. B. End of section 41。Section 42 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. Section 42 r b to e b b postmark june fourteenth eighteen forty five when i ask my wise self what i really do remember of the prize poem the answer is both of chapman's lines atop quite worth any prize for their quarter then the good epithet of green europe contrasting with africa then deep in the piece a picture of a vestal in a vault where I see a dipping and winking lamp, plainest, and last of all the ominous, all was dark, that dismisses you. I read the poem many years ago, and never since, though I have an impression that the versification is good, yet from your commentary I see, I must have said a good deal more in its praise than that. And have you not discovered by this time that I go on talking with my thoughts anyway? I know, I have always been jealous of my own musical faculty, I can write music. Now that I see the uselessness of such jealousy, and am loosing and letting it go, it may be cramped, possibly. Your music is in more various and exquisite than any modern writers to my ear. One should study the mechanical part of the art, as nearly all that there is to be studied. For the more one sits and thinks over the creative process, the more it confirms itself as inspiration, nothing more nor less. Or at worst, write down old inspirations what you remember of them but with that it begins reflection is exactly what it names itself a re-presentation in scattered rays from every angle of incidents of what first of all became present in a great light a whole one 
So tell me how these lights are born if you can. But I can tell anybody how to make melodious verses. Let him do it, therefore. It should be exacted of all writers. You do not understand what a new feeling it is for me to have someone who is to like my verses, or I shall not ever like them after. So far differently was I circumstanced of old that I used rather to go about for a subject of offense to people, writing ugly things in order to warn the ungenial and timorous off my grounds at once. I shall never do so again, at least. As it is, I will bring all I dare, in as great quantities as I can, if not next time, after then certainly. I must make an end, print this autumn my last four bells, lyrics, romances, the tragedy, and Luria, and then go on with a whole heart to my own poem. Indeed, I have just resolved not to begin any new song, even till this grand clearance is made. I will get the tragedy transcribed to bring, <laughs> to bring next Wednesday, if you know how happy you make me. May I not say that, my dear friend, when I feel it from my soul? I thank God that you are better. Do pray make fresh endeavors to profit by this partial respite of the weather. All about you must urge that. But even from my distance, some effect might come of such wishes. But you are better. Look so and speak so. God bless you. R.B. You let flowers be sent you in a letter. Everyone knows. And this hot day draws out our very first yellow rose. End of section 42、section、43 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Monday, postmark June 17, 1845. Yes, I quite believe, as you do, that what is called the creative process in works of art is just inspiration and no less which made somebody say to me not long since and so you think that shakespeare's othello was of the affluence of the holy ghost rather a startling deduction only not quite as final as might appear to somebody's perhaps at least it does not prevent my going on to agree with the saying of spiridion do you remember tout ce que l'homme appelle inspiration Je l'appelle aussi révélation. If there is not something too self-evident in it, after all, my sole objection. And is it not true that your inability to analyze the mental process in question is one of the proofs of the fact of inspiration? As the gods were known of old by not being seen to move their feet, coming and going in an equal sweep of radiance, and still more wonderful than the first transient great light you speak of, and far beyond any work of reflection, except in the pure analytical sense in which you use the word, appears that gathering of light on light upon particular points, as you go, in composition, step by step, till you get intimately near to things, and see them in a fullness and clearness, and an intense trust in the truth of them, which you have not in any sunshine of noon, called real, but which you have then, and struggle to communicate an ineffectual struggle with most writers oh how ineffectual and when effectual issuing in the pippa passes and other masterpieces of the world you will tell me what you mean exactly by being jealous of your own music you said once that you had had a false notion of music or had practised it according to the false notions of other people but did you mean besides that you ever had meant to despise music altogether because that it is hard to set about trying to believe of you indeed. And then, you can praise my verses for music? Why are you aware that people blame me constantly for wanting harmony? From Mr. Boyd, who moans aloud over the indisposition of my trochees, and no less a person than Mr. Tennyson, who said to somebody who repeated it that in the want of harmony lay the chief defect of the poems, although it might verily be retrieved, as he could fancy that I had an ear by nature. Well, but I am pleased that you should praise me, right or wrong. I mean, whether I am right or wrong in being pleased. And I say so to you openly, although my belief is that you are under a vow to Our Lady of Loretto to make giddy with all manner of high vanities, some head, 
not too strong for such things but too low for them before you see again the embroidery on her divine petticoat only there's a flattery so far beyond praise even your praise as where you talk of your verses being liked etc and of your being happy to bring them here that is scarcely a lawful weapon and see if the madonna may not signify so much to you seriously you will not hurry too uncomfortably or uncomfortably at all about the transcribing another day you know will do as well and patience is possible to me if not native to the soil also i am behaving very well in going out into the noise not quite out of doors yet on account of the heat and i am better as you say without any doubt at all and stronger only my looks are a little deceitful and people are apt to be heated and flushed in this weather one hour to look a little more ghastly an hour or two after not that it is not true of me that i am better mind because i am the flower in the letter was from one of my sisters from arabelle though many of these poems are ideal will you understand and your rose came quite alive and fresh though in act of dropping its beautiful leaves because of having to come to me instead of living on in your garden as it intended but i thank you for this and all my dear friend e b b end of section forty three Section 44 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Thursday morning. Postmark. June 19, 1845. When I next see you, do not let me go on and on to my confusion about matters i am more or less ignorant of but always ignorant i tell you plainly i only trench on them and entrench in them from gaucherie pure and respectable i should certainly grow instructive on the prospects of hay crops and pasture land if deprived of this resource and now here is a week to wait before i shall have any occasion to relapse into greek literature when i am thinking all the while now i will just ask simply what flattery there was etc etc which as i had not courage to say then i keep to myself for shame now this i will say then wait and know me better as you will one long day at the end why i write now is because you did not promise as before to let me know how you are this morning is miserably cold again. Will you tell me at your own time? God bless you, my dear friend, R.B. End of section 44section 45 of the letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia e b b to r b thursday evening postmark june twentieth eighteen forty five if on greek literature or anything else it is your pleasure to cultivate a reputation for ignorance i will respect your desire and indeed the point of the deficiency in question being far above my sight i am not qualified either to deny or assert the existence of it so you are free to have it all your own way about the flattery however there is a difference and i must deny a little having ever used such a word as far as i can recollect and i have been trying to recollect as that word of flattery perhaps i said something about your having vowed to make me vain by writing this or that of my liking your verses and so on and perhaps i said it too lightly which happened because when one doesn't know whether to laugh or to cry it is far best as a general rule to laugh but the serious truth is that it was all nonsense to gather what i wrote and that instead of talking of your making me vain i should have talked if it had been done sincerely of your humbling me inasmuch as nothing does humble anybody so much as being lifted up too high you know what vaulting ambition did once for himself and when it is done for him by another 
his fall is still heavier and one moral of all this general philosophy is that if when your poems come you persist in giving too much importance to what i may have courage to say of this or of that in them you will make me a dumb critic and i shall have no help for my dumbness so i tell you beforehand nothing extenuating nor exaggerating nor putting down in malice i know so much of myself as to be sure of it even as it is the insolence which people blame me for and praise me for the recklessness which my friends talk of with mitigating countenances seems gradually going and going and really it would not be very strange without that if i who was born a hero worshipper and have so continued and who always recognized your genius should find it impossible to bring out critical doxies on the workings of it well i shall do what i can as far as impressions go you understand and you must promise not to attach too much importance to anything said so that is a covenant my dear friend and i am really gaining strength and i will not complain of the weather as long as the thermometer keeps above sixty i am content for one and the roses are not quite dead yet which they would have been in the heat and last and not least may i ask if you were told that the pain in the head was not important or was in the causes and was likely to be well soon or was not i am at the end e b b upon second or third thoughts isn't it true that you are a little suspicious of me suspicious at least of suspiciousness End of section 45section 46 of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano section 46 r b to e b b sunday afternoon postmark june 23 1845 and if i am suspicious of your suspiciousness who gives cause pray the matter was long ago settled i thought when you first took exception to what i said about higher and lower and i consented to this much that you should help seeing if you could our true intellectual and moral relation each to the other so long as you would allow me to see what is there fronting me is my eye evil because yours is not good my own friend if i wished to make you vain if having found the bower i did really address myself to the wise business of spoiling its rose roof i think that at least where there was such a will there would be also something not unlike a way that i should find a proper hooked stick to tear down flowers with and write you other letters than these quite quite others i feel though i am far from going to imagine even for a moment what might be the precise prodigy like the notable son of zeus that was to have been and done the wonders only he did not because etc etc but i have a restless head to-day and so let you off easily well you ask me about it that head and i am not justified in being positive when my doctor is dubious as for the causes they are neither superfluity of study nor fancy nor care nor any special naughtiness that i know how to amend so if i bring you nothing to signify on wednesday though i hope to do more than that you will know exactly why it happens i will finish and transcribe the flight of the duchess since you spoke of that first i am truly happy to hear that your health improves still for me going out does me good reading writing and what is odd infinitely most of all sleeping do me the harm never any great harm and all the while i am yours ever r b end of section forty six Section 47 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. E B B to R B. Monday, postmark June twenty fourth, eighteen forty five. I had begun to be afraid that I did not deserve to have my questions answered, and I was afraid of asking them over again. But it is worse to be afraid that you are not better at all in any essential manner after all your assurances and that the medical means have failed so far did you go to somebody who knows anything because there is no excuse you see in common sense for not having the best and most experienced opinion when there is a choice of advice and i am confident that that pain should not be suffered to go on without something being done what i said about nerves related to what you had told me of your mother's suffering and what you had fancied of the relation of it to your own and not that i could be thinking about imaginary complaints i wish i could not either that i believe in the relation because such things are not hereditary are they and the bare coincidence is improbable well but i wanted particularly to say this don't bring the duchess with you on wednesday i shall not expect anything i write distinctly to tell you and i would far far rather that you did not bring it you see it is just as i thought for that whether too much thought or study did or did not bring on the illness yet you admit that reading and writing increase it as they would naturally do any sort of pain in the head therefore if you will but be in earnest and try to get well first we will do the bells afterwards and there will be time for a whole peal of them i hope and trust before the winter now do admit that this is reasonable and agree reasonably to it and if it does you good to go out and take exercise why not go out and take it nay why not go away and take it why not try the effect of a little change of air or even of a great change of air if it should be necessary or even expedient anything is better you know or if you don't know i know than to be ill really seriously i mean for you to be ill who have so much to do and to enjoy in the world yet and all those bells waiting to be hung so that if you will agree to be well first i will promise to be ready afterwards to help you in anything i can do transcribing or anything to get the books through the press in the shortest of times and i am capable of a great deal of that sort of work without being tired having the habit of writing in any sort of position and the long habit since before i was ill even i never used to write at a table or scarcely ever but on the arm of a chair or on the seat of one sitting myself on the floor and calling myself a lollard for dignity so you will put by your duchess will you not or let me see just that one sheet if one should be written which is finished up to this moment you understand finished now and if i have tired and teased you with all these words it is a bad opportunity to take and yet i will persist in saying through good and bad opportunities that i never did give cause as you say to your being suspicious of my suspiciousness as i believe i said before i deny my suspiciousness altogether it is not one of my faults nor is it quite my fault that you and i should always be quarrelling about over appreciations and under appreciations and after all i have no interest nor wish i do assure you to depreciate myself and you are not to think that i have the remotest claim to the monthian prize for good deeds in the way of modesty of self-estimation only when i know you better as you talk of and when you know me too well the right and the wrong of these conclusions will appear in a fuller light than ever so much arguing can produce now is it unkindly written of me no i feel it is not and that now and ever we are friends just as you think i think besides and am happy in thinking so and could not be distrustful of you if i tried so may god bless you my ever dear friend and mind to forget the duchess and to remember every good counsel not that i do particularly confide in the medical oracles they never did much for me then when my pulse was above a hundred and forty with fever to give me digitalis to make me weak and when i could not move without fainting with weakness to give me quinine to make me feverish again yes and they could tell from the stethoscope how very little was really wrong in me if it were not on a vital organ and how i should certainly live if i didn't die sooner but then nothing has power over affections of the chest except god and his winds and i do hope that an obvious quick remedy may be found for your head 
but do give up the writing and all that does harm ever yours my dear friend e b b miss mitford talked of spending wednesday with me and i have put it off to thursday and if you should hear from mr chorley that he is coming to see her and me together on any day do understand that it was entirely her proposition and not mine and that certainly it won't be acceded to as far as i am concerned as i have explained to her finally i have been vexed about it but she can see him downstairs as she has done before and if she calls me perverse and capricious which she will do i shall stop the reflection by thanking her again and again as i can do sincerely for her kindness and goodness in coming to see me herself so far End of section 47. Section 48 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday morning, postmark, June 24, 1845. So, my friend, did not in the spirit see me write that first letter on Friday which was too good and true to send, and met five minutes after, its natural fate accordingly. Then on Saturday I thought to take health by storm, and walked myself half dead all the morning, about town too. Last post hour from this two lee of a suburb, 4 p.m. on Saturdays, next expedition of letters, 8 a.m. on Mondays, and then my real letter set out with the others and it should seem set at rest a wonder whether thy friend's questions deserved answering deserved answering parenthetically so much i want most though to tell you leaving out any slightest attempt at thanking you that i am much better quite well to-day that my doctor has piloted me safely through two or three illnesses and knows all about me i do think and that he talks confidently of getting rid of all the symptoms complained of and has made a good beginning if i may judge by to-day as for going abroad that is just the thing i most want to avoid for a reason not so hard to guess perhaps as why my letter was slow in arriving so till to-morrow my light through the dark week god ever bless you dear friend r b End of section 48section 49 of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part 1 this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia ebb to rb tuesday evening postmark june 25th 1845 what will you think when i write to ask you not to come to-morrow wednesday but on friday perhaps instead but do see how it is and judge if it is to be helped i have waited hour after hour hoping to hear from miss mitford that she would agree to take thursday in change for wednesday and just as i begin to wonder whether she can have received my letter at all or whether she may not have been vexed by it into taking a vengeance and adhering to her own devices for it appealed to her esprit de sex on the undeniable axiom of women having their way and she might choose to act it out just as i wonder over all this and consider what a confusion of the elements it would be if you came and found her here and mr chorley at the door perhaps waiting for some of the light of her countenance comes a note from mr kenyon to the effect that he will be here at four o'clock p m and comes a final note from my aunt mrs hadley supposed to be at brighton for several months to the effect that she will be here at twelve o'clock m so do observe the constellation of adverse stars or the covey of bad birds as the romans called them and that there is no choice but to write as i am writing it can't be helped can it for take away the doubt about miss mitford and mr kenyon remains and take away mr kenyon and there is mrs hadley and thus it must be for friday which will learn to be a fortunate day for the nuns, unless Saturday should suit you better. I do not speak of Thursday because of the doubt about Miss Mitford, and if any harm should happen to Friday, I will write again. 
but if you do not hear again and are able to come then you will come perhaps then in the meantime i thank you for the better news in your note if it is really really to be trusted in but you know you have said so often that you were better and better without being really better that it makes people suspicious yet it is full amends for the disappointment to hope here i must break off or be too late may god bless you my dear friend e b b end of section forty nine Section 50 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. 12 Wednesday. Postmark. June 25, 1845. Pomegranates you may cut deep down the middle and see into, but not hearts. So why should I try and speak? Friday is best day, because nearest, but Saturday is next best. It is next near, you know. If I get no note, therefore, Friday is my day. Now is post time, which happens properly. God bless you, and so your own, R.B. End of Section 50《Section 51 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, Thursday evening, postmark June 27th, 1845. After all, it must be for Saturday, as Mrs. Hadley comes again on Friday, tomorrow, from New Cross, or just beyond it, Alton Park to london for a few days on account of the illness of one of her children i write in the greatest haste after miss mitford has left me and so tired to say this that if you can and will come on saturday or if not on monday or tuesday there is no reason against it your friend always e b b end of section fifty one Section 52 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Friday morning. Postmark. June 27, 1845. Let me make haste and write down tomorrow, Saturday, and not later lest my selfishness be thoroughly got under in its struggle with a better feeling that tells me you must be far too tired for another visitor this week. What shall I decide on? Well, Saturday is said, but I will stay not quite so long, nor talk nearly so loud as of old times. Nor will you, if you understand anything of me, fail to send down word, should you be at all indisposed. I should not have the heart to knock at the door, unless I really believed you would do that. Still saying this, and providing against the other, does not amount, I well know, to the generosity, or justice rather, of staying away for a day or two altogether. But what a day or two may not bring forth, change to you, change to me. Not all of me, however, can change. Thank God. Yours truly, R.B. Or, write as last night, if needs be. Monday, Tuesday, is not so long to wait. Will you write? End of section 52 Section 53 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia EBB to RB Friday evening, postmark June 28th, 1845. You are very kind and always, but really that does not seem a good reason against your coming tomorrow, so come, if it should not rain. If it rains, it concludes for Monday or Tuesday, whichever may be clear of rain. I was tired on Wednesday by the confounding confusion of more voices than usual in this room, 
but the effect passed off and though miss mitford was with me for hours yesterday i am not unwell to-day and pray speak bona verba about the awful things which are possible between this now and wednesday you continue to be better i do hope i am forced to the brevity you see by the post on one side and my friends on the other who have so long overstayed the coming of your note but it is enough to assure you that you will do no harm by coming only give pleasure ever yours my dear friend e b b end of section fifty three Section 54 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Monday, June 30th, 1845. I send back the prize poems which have been kept far too long, even if I do not make excuses for the keeping. But our sins are not always to be measured by our repentance for them then i am well enough this morning to have thought of going out till they told me it was not at all a right day for it too windy soft and delightful as the air seems to be particularly after yesterday when we had some winter back again in an episode and the roses do not die which is quite magnanimous of them considering their reverses and their buds are coming out in most exemplary resignation like birds singing in a cage now that the windows may be open the flowers take heart to live a little in this room and think of my forgetting to tell you on saturday that i had known of a letter being received by somebody from miss martineau who is at ambleside at this time and so entranced with the lakes and mountains as to be dreaming of taking or making a house among them to live in for the rest of her life mrs trollope you may have heard had something of the same nympholepsy no her daughter was settled in the neighbourhood that is the more likely reason for mrs trollope and the spirits of the hills conspired against her the first winter and almost slew her with the fog and drove her away to your italy where the oridocracy has gentler manners and miss martineau is practising mesmerism and miracles on all sides she says and counts on archbishop wortley as a new adherent i even fancy that he has been to see her in the character of a convert all this from mr kenyon there's a strange wild book called the autobiography of heinrich stilling one of those true devout deep-hearted germans who believe everything and so are nearer the truth i am sure than the wise who believe nothing but rather over german sometimes and redolent of sauerkraut and he gives a tradition somewhere between mesmerism and mysticism of a little spirit with gold shoe buckles who was his familiar spirit and appeared only in the sunshine i think mottling it over with its feet perhaps as a child might snow take away the shoe buckles and i believe in the little spirit don't you but these english mesmerists make the shoe buckles quite conspicuous and insist on them broadly and the archbishop's Watley may be drawn by them who can tell more than by the little spirit itself how is your head to-day now really and nothing extenuating i will not ask of poems till the quite well is authentic may god bless you always my dear friend e b b after all the book must go another day i live in chaos do you know and i am too hurried at this moment yes it is here end of section fifty four Section 55 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday morning. How are you? May I hope to hear soon? I don't know exactly what possessed me to set my next day so far off as Saturday, as it was said. However, so let it be, and I will bring the rest of the Duchess four or five hundred lines. Hugh herba mala cresset, as I once saw mournfully penciled on a white wall at Oslo. Will you tell me if you will quite remember the main of the first part? Parts there are none except in the necessary process of chopping up to suit the limits of a magazine. 
and I gave them as much as I could transcribe at a sudden warning, because, if you please, I can bring the whole, of course. After seeing you that Saturday, I was caught up by a friend and carried to see Vidoc, who did the honors of his museum of knives and nails and hooks that have helped great murderers to their purposes. He scarcely admits, I observe, an implement with only one attestation to its efficacy, but the one or two exceptions rather justify his latitude in their favor. This one little sort of desert knife did only take one life, but then, says Vidoc, it was the man's own mother's life, with fifty-two blows and all four, I think, fifteen francs she had got. So prattles good-naturedly Vidoc, one of his best stories of that Le Sonnaire, Jean homme de un caractère fort et vente, mais était un poet, quoth he, turning sharp on me out of two or three other people round him. Here your letter breaks in, and sunshine too. Why do you send me that book? Now let me take it. What trouble for nothing? An old French friend of mine, a dear foolish, very French heart and soul, is coming presently. His poor brains are whirling with mesmerism, in which he believes, as in all other unbelief. He and I are to dine alone. I have not seen him these two years, and I shall never be able to keep from driving the great wedge right through his breast and descending lower from riveting his two foolish legs to the wintry chasm. For I that stammer and answer haphazard with you get proportionately valiant and voluble with a mere cupful of Diderot's risings and a man into the bargain. If you were prevented from leaving the house yesterday, assuredly today you will never attempt such a thing the wind, rain, all is against it. I trust you will not make the first experiment except under really favorable auspices, for by its success you will naturally be induced to go on or leave off. Still, you are better. I fully believe, dare to believe, that will continue. As for me, since you ask, find me something to do, and see if I shall not be well though I am, well, now, almost. How good you are to my roses! They are not of my making, to be sure. Never, by the way, did Miss Martineau work such a miracle as I now witness in the garden. I gathered at Rome, close to the fountain of Agaria, a handful of fennel seeds from those indisputable plant of fennel I ever chanced upon. And, lo, they are coming up. Hemlock, or something akin, in two places, moreover, wherein does hemlock resemble fennel? How could I mistake? No wonder that a stone's cast off from that agorious fountain is the temple of the goddess Ridiculous. Well, on Saturday, then, at three, and I will certainly bring the verses you mention, and trust to find you still better. Viva Felice, my dear friend, God bless you. R.B. End of section 55。section 56 of the letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Wednesday to Thursday evening. Postmark July 4th, 1845. Yes, I know the first part of the Duchess, and have it here, and for the rest of the poem, don't mind about being very legible, or even legible in the usual sense, and remember how it is my boast to be able to read all such manuscript writing as never is read by people who don't like caviar. Now you won't mind, really, I rather like blots than otherwise, being a sort of patron saint of all manner of untidiness. If Mr. Kenyon's reproaches, of which there is a stereotyped edition, are justified by the fact, and he has a great organ of order, and knows disorderly people at a glance, I suppose. But you won't be particular with me in the matter of transcription. That is what I want to make sure of. And even if you are not particular, I am afraid you are not well enough to be troubled by writing, and writing and the thinking that comes with it. 
it would be wiser to wait till you are quite well now wouldn't it and my fear is that the almost well means very little better and why when there is no motive for hurrying run any risk don't think that i will help you to make yourself ill that i refuse to do even so much work as the little dessert knife in the way of murder do think so upon the whole i expect nothing on saturday from this distance and if it comes unexpectedly i mean the duchess and not saturday let it be at no cost or at the least cost possible will you i am delighted in the meanwhile to hear of the quantity of mala erba and hemlock does not come up from every seed you sow though you call it by ever such bad names talking of poetry i had a newspaper in help of social and political progress sent to me yesterday from america addressed to just my name poetess london think of the simplicity of those wild americans in calculating that people in general here in england know what a poetess is well the post office authorities after deep meditation i do not doubt on all probable varieties of the chimpanzee and a glance to the surrey gardens on one side and the zoological department of regent's park on the other thought of poet's corner perhaps and wrote at the top of the parcel inquire at paternoster row whereupon the paternoster row people wrote again go to mr moxon and i received my newspaper and talking of poetesses i had a note yesterday again which quite touched me from mr hemans charles the son of felicia written with so much feeling that it was with difficulty i could say my perpetual no to his wish about coming to see me his mother's memory is surrounded to him he says with almost a divine lustre and as it cannot be to those who knew the writer alone and not the woman do you not like to hear such things said and is it not better than your tradition about shelley's son and is it not pleasant to know that that poor noble pure-hearted woman the vittoria colonna of our country should be so loved and comprehended by some by one at least of her own house not that in naming shelley i meant for a moment to make a comparison there is no equal ground for it vittoria colonna does not walk near dante no and if you promised never to tell mrs jameson nor miss martineau i would confide to you perhaps my secret profession of faith which is which is that let us say and do what we please and can there is a natural inferiority of mind in women of the intellect not by any means of the moral nature and that the history of art and of genius testifies to this fact openly oh i would not say so to mrs jameson for the world i believe i was a coward to her altogether for when she denounced carpet-work as injurious to the mind because it led the workers into fatal habits of reverie i defended the carpet-work as if i were striving pro aris et focis i who am so innocent of all that knowledge and said not a word for the poor reveries which have frayed away so much of silken time for me and let her go away repeating again and again oh but you may do carpet-work with impunity yes because you can be writing poems all the while think of people making poems and rugs at once there's a complex machinery for you i told you that i had a sensation of cold blue steel from her eyes and yet i really liked and like and shall like her she is very kind i believe and it was my mistake and i correct my impressions of her more and more to perfection as you tell me who know more of her than i only i should not dare ever i think to tell her that i believe women all of us in a mass to have minds of quicker movement but less power and depth and that we are under your feet because we can't stand upon our own not that we should either be quite under your feet so you are not to be too proud if you please and there is certainly some amount of wrong but it will never be righted in the manner and to the extent contemplated by certain of our own prophetesses nor ought to be i hold in intimate persuasion one woman indeed now alive and only that one down all the ages of the world seems to me to justify for a moment an opposite opinion that wonderful woman georges sand who has something monstrous in combination with her genius there is no denying at moments for she has written one book lilia which i could not read 
though i am not easily turned back but whom in her good and evil together i regard with infinitely more admiration than all other women of genius who are or have been such a colossal nature in every way with all that breadth and scope of faculty which women want magnanimous and loving the truth and loving the people and with that hate of hate too which you extol so eloquent and yet earnest as if she were dumb so full of a living sense of beauty and of noble blind instincts toward an ideal purity and so proving a right even in her wrong by the way what you say of the vidocq museum reminds me of one of the chamber of masonic trial scenes in consuelo could you like to see those knives i began with the best intentions of writing six lines and see what is written and all because i kept my letter back from a doubt about saturday but it has worn away and the appointment stands good for me i have nothing to say against it but belief in mesmerism is not the same thing as general unbelief to do it justice now is it it may be super belief as well not that there is not something ghastly and repelling to me in the thought of dr elliotson's great bony fingers seeming to touch the stops of a whole soul's harmonies as in freno magnetism and i should have liked far better than hearing and seeing that to have heard you pour the cupful of diderot's rinsings out and indeed i can fancy a little that you and how you could do it and break the cup too afterwards another sheet and for what what is written already if you read you do so meritoriously and it's an example of bad writing if you want one in the poems i am ashamed you may see of having written too much besides which is much worse but one writes and writes i do at least for you are irreproachable ever yours my dear friend as if i had not written or had e b b end of section 56section 57 of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b monday afternoon postmark july 7 1845 well i write this three o'clock you may be going out i will hope for the day is very fine perhaps all the better for the wind yet i got up this morning sure of bad weather i shall not try to tell you how anxious i am for the result and to know it you will of course feel fatigued at first but persevering as you mean to do do you not persevering the event must be happy i thought and still think to write to you about george sand and the vexed question a very bermute of the mental claims of the sexes relatively considered so was called the i do believe worst poem i ever read in my life and mrs hemmins and all and some of the points referred to in your letter but by my fay i cannot reason to-day and by a consequence i feel the more so i say how i want news of you which when they arrive i shall read meritoriously do you think my friend what i ought to tell you on that head or the reverse rather of your discourse i should like to match you at a fancy flight if i could give you nearly as pleasant an assurance that there's no merit in the case but the hot weather and lack of wit get the better of my good will besides i remember once to have admired a certain enticing simplicity in the avowal of the treasurer of a charitable institution at a dinner got up in its behalf the funds being at lowest debt at highest in fact this dinner was the last chance of the charity and this treasurer's speech the main feature in the chance and our friend inspired by the emergency went so far as to say with a bland smile do not let it be supposed that we despise annual contributors we rather solicit their assistance all which means do not think that i take any merit for making myself supremely happy i rather etc etc always rather mean to deserve it a little better 
but never shall. So it should be for you and me. And as it was at the beginning, so it is still. You are the... But you know, and why should I tease myself with words? Let me send this off now, and tomorrow some more, because I trust to hear you have made the first effort, and with success. Ever yours, my dear friend, R.B. End of section 57「Section 58 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, Monday, postmark July 8, 1845. Well, I have really been out, and I am really alive after it, which is more surprising still. Alive enough, I mean, to write even so tonight. But perhaps I say so with more emphasis to console myself for failing in my great ambition of getting into the park and of reaching Mr. Kenyon's door just to leave a cart there vaingloriously, all which I did fail in, and was forced to turn back from the gates of Devonshire Place. The next time it will be better, perhaps, and this time there was no fainting or anything very wrong, not even cowardice on the part of the victim, be it recorded, for one of my sisters was as usual in authority, and ordered the turning back just according to her own prudence, and not my self-will. Only you will not, any of you, ask me to admit that it was all delightful, pleasanter work than what you wanted to spare me in taking care of your roses on Saturday. Don't ask that, and I will try it again presently. I ought to be ashamed of writing this I and me-ism, but since your kindness made it worth while asking about— I must not be overwise and silent on my side. Tuesday. Was it fair to tell me to write, though, and be silent of the Duchess, and when I was sure to be so delighted, and you knew it? I think not indeed, and to make the obedience possible, I go on fast to say that I heard from Mr. Horne a few days since, and that he said, Your envelope reminds me of you, he said, and so asked if you were in England still, and meant to write to you to which I have answered that I believe you to be in England, thinking it strange about the envelope, which, as far as I remember, was one of those long ones, used the more conveniently to enclose to him back again a manuscript of his own, I had offered with another of his, by his desire, to Colburn's magazine, as the productions of a friend of mine, when he was in Germany, and afraid of his proper fatal onimousness, yet in difficulty how to approach the magazines as a nameless writer you will not mention this of course and when he was in germany i remember writing just as your first letter came that i mentioned it to him and was a little frankly proud of it but since your name has not occurred once not once certainly and it is strange only he can't have heard of your having been here and it must have been a chance remark altogether taking an imaginary emphasis from my evil conscience perhaps talking of evils how wrong of you to make that book for me, and how ill I thanked you after all. Also, I couldn't help feeling more grateful still for the Duchess, who is under Ben. And for how long, I wonder. My dear friend, I am ever yours. E.B.B. End of section 58「Section 59 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Wednesday morning, postmark, July 9, 1845. You are all that is good and kind. I am happy and thankful. The beginning and worst of it is over, and so well. The park and Mr. Kenyon's all in good time, and your sister was most prudent, and you mean to try again. God bless you, all to be said or done, but as I say it, no vain word, no doubt it was a mere chance thought, and apropos de bot of horn, neither he or any other can know or even fancy how it is. Indeed, the one other grounds I should be all so proud of being known for your friend by everybody, 
yet there's no denying the deep delight of playing the eastern jew's part here in this london they go about you know by travel books with the tokens of extreme destitution and misery and steal by blind ways and by paths to some blank dreary house or an obscure door in it which being well shut behind them they grope on through a dark corridor or so and then a blaze follows the lifting a curtain or the like for they are in a palace hall with fountains and lights and marble and gold of which the envious are never to dream and i too love to have few friends and to live alone and to see you from week to week do you not suppose i am grateful and you do like the duchess as much as you have got of it that delights me too for every reason but i fear i shall not be able to bring you the rest to-morrow thursday my day because i have been broken in upon more than one morning nor though much better in my head can i do anything at night just now all will come right eventually i hope and i shall transcribe the other things you are to judge to-morrow then only and that is why i would write do do know me for what i am and treat me as i deserve in that one respect and go out without a moment's thought or care if to-morrow should suit you leave word to that effect and i shall be as glad as if i saw you or more reason gladness you know or you can write though that is not necessary at all do think of all this i am yours ever dear friend r b end of section fifty nine Section 60 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Postmark, July 12, 1845. You understand that it was not a resolution passed in favor of formality when I said what I did yesterday about not going out at the time you were coming. Surely you do, whatever you might signify to a different effect if it were necessary for me to go out every day or most days even it would be otherwise but as it is i may certainly keep the day you come free from the fear of carriages let the sun shine its best or worst without doing despite to you or injury to me and that's all i meant to insist upon indeed and indeed you see jupiter tonans was good enough to come to-day on purpose to deliver me one evil for another for i confess with shame and contrition that i never wait to inquire whether it thunders to the left or the right to be frightened most ingloriously isn't it a disgrace to any one with a pretension to poetry dr chambers a part of whose office it is papa says to reconcile foolish women to their follies used to take the side of my vanity and discourse at length on the passive obedience of some nervous systems to electrical influences but perhaps my faint-heartedness is besides traceable to a half-reasonable terror of a great storm in herefordshire where great storms most do congregate such storms round the malvern hills these mountains of england we lived four miles from their roots through all my childhood and early youth in a turkish house my father built himself crowded with minarets and domes and crowned with metal spires and crescents to the provocation as people used to observe of every lightning of heaven once a storm of storms happened and we all thought the house was struck and the tree was so really within two hundred yards of the windows while i looked out the bark rent from the top to the bottom torn into long ribbons by the dreadful fiery hands and dashed out into the air over the heads of other trees or left twisted in their branches torn into shreds in a moment as a flower might be by a child did you ever see a tree after it has been struck by lightning the whole trunk of that tree was bare and peeled and up that new whiteness of it ran the finger mark of the lightning in a bright beautiful rose colour none of your roses brighter or more beautiful the fever sign of the certain death though the branches themselves were for the most part untouched and spread from the peeled trunk in their full summer foliage 
and birds singing in them three hours afterwards and in that storm two young women belonging to a festive party were killed on the malvern hills each sealed to death in a moment with a sign on the chest which a common seal would cover only the sign on them was not rose-coloured as on our tree but black as charred wood so i get possessed sometimes with the effects of these impressions and so does one at least of my sisters in a lower degree and oh how amusing and instructive all this is to you when my father came into the room to-day and found me hiding my eyes from the lightning he was quite angry and called it disgraceful to anybody who had ever learned the alphabet to which i answered humbly that i knew it was but if i had been impertinent i might have added that wisdom does not come by the alphabet but in spite of it don't you think so in a measure non obstantibus bradbury and evans there's a profane question and ungrateful too after the duchess i accept the duchess and her peers and be sure she will be the world's duchess and received as one of your most striking poems full of various power the poem is i cannot say how deeply it has impressed me but though i want the conclusion i don't wish for it and in this am reasonable for once you will not write and make yourself ill will you or read sibyl at unlawful hours even are you better at all what a letter and how very foolishly to-day i am yours e b b end of section sixty section sixty one of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b sunday morning postmark july fourteenth eighteen forty five very well i shall say no more on the subject though it was not any piece of formality on your part that i deprecated nor even your over-kindness exactly i rather wanted you to be really wisely kind and do me a greater favor than the next great one in degree but you must understand this much in me how you can lay me under deepest obligation i dare say you think you have some perhaps many to whom your well-being is of deeper interest than to me well if that be so do for their sakes make every effort with the remotest chance of proving serviceable to you nor set yourself against any little irksomeness these carriage drives may bring with them just at the beginning and you may say if you like how i shall delight those friends if i can make this newest one grateful and as from the known quantity one reasons out the unknown this newest friend will be one glow of gratitude he knows that if you can warm your fingertips and so do yourself that much real good by setting light to a dozen duchesses why ought i not to say this when it is so true besides people profess as much to their merest friends for i have been looking through a poem-book just now and was told under the head of album verses alone that for a the writer would die and for b die too but a crueler death and for c too and d and so on i wonder whether they have since wanted to borrow money of him on the strength of his professions but you must remember we are in july the thirteenth it is and summer will go and cold weather stay come forsooth now is the time of times still i feared the rain would hinder you on friday but the thunder did not frighten me for you your father must pardon me for holding most firmly with dr chambers his theory is quite borne out by my own experience for i have seen a man it were foolish to call a coward a great fellow too all but die away in a thunderstorm though we had quite science enough to explain why there was no immediate danger at all whereupon his younger brother suggested that he should just go out and treat us to a repetition of franklin's experiment with the cloud and the kite a well-timed proposition which sent the explainer down with a white face into the cellar what a grand sight your tree was is for i see it my father has a print of a tree so 
struck torn to ribbons, as you describe, but the rose mark is striking and new to me. We had a good storm on our last voyage, but I went to bed at the end, as I thought, and only found there had been lightning next day by the bare poles under which we were riding. But the finest mountain fit of the kind I ever saw has an unfortunately ludicrous association. It was at Posano among the Euganian hills, and I was at a poor house in the town. An old woman was before a little picture of the Virgin, and at every fresh clap she lighted with the oddest sputtering muttering, mouthful of prayer imaginable, an inch of guttery candle, which the instant the last echo had rolled away, she as constantly blew out again for saving sake, having, of course, to light the smoke of it about an instant after that. The expenditure in wax at which the elements might be propitiated, you see, was a matter for curious calculation. I suppose I ought to have brought the whole taper for some four or five centesimi, one hundred of which make eight pence English, and so kept the countryside safe for about a century of bad weather. Lee Hunt tells you a story he had from Byron of kindred philosophy in a Jew who was surprised by a thunderstorm while he was dining on bacon. He tried to eat between whiles, but the flashes were as pertinacious as he, so at last he pushed his plate away, just remarking with a compassionate shrug, All this fuss about a piece of pork. By the way, what a characteristic of an Italian late evening is summer lightning. It hangs in broad, slow sheets, dropping from cloud to cloud, so long in dropping and dying off. The Bora, which you only get at Trieste, brings wonderful lightning. You are in glorious June weather, the fancy of an evening, under green shock-headed acacias, so thick and green, with the cicalas stunning you above, and all about you men, women, rich and poor, sitting, standing, and coming and going, and through all the laughter and screaming and singing, the loud clink of the spoons against the glasses, the way of calling for fresh sorbetti, for all the world is at open coffee house at such an hour, when suddenly there is a stop in the sunshine, a blackness drops down, then a great white column of dust drives straight on like a wedge, and you see the acacia head snap off, now one, then another, and all the people scream, Labora, Labora, and you are caught up in the whirl and landed in some interior. The man with the guitar on one side of you, and the boy with the cage full of little brown owls for sale on the other. Meanwhile, the thunder claps, claps with such a persistence, and the rain, for a finale, falls in a mass, as if you had knocked out the whole bottom of a huge tank at once. Then there is a second stop. Out comes the sun. Somebody clinks at his glass. All the world bursts out laughing and prepares to pour out again. But you, the stranger, do make the best of your way out, with no preparation at all, whereupon you infallibly put your foot and half your leg into a river, really that of rainwater. That's a bora, and that comment of yours, a justifiable pun. Such things you get in Italy, but better, better, the best of all things you do not, I do not, get those. And I shall see you on Wednesday, please, remember, and bring you the rest of the poem. That you should like it gratifies me more than I will try to say. But then, do not you be tempted by that pleasure of pleasing which I think is your besetting sin. May it not be? And so cut me off from the other pleasure of being profited. As I told you, I like so much to fancy that you see, and will see, what I do as I see it while it is doing, as nobody else in the world should, certainly, even if they thought it was worth while to want. But when I try and build a great building, I shall want you to come with me, and judge it, and counsel me before the scaffolding is taken down, and while you have time to make your way over hods and mortar and heaps of lime, and trembling tubs of size, 
and those thin, broad, white washing brushes I always had a desire to take up and be spattered with. And now, good-bye. I am to see you on Wednesday, I trust, and to hear you say you are better, still better, much better. God grant that, and all else good for you, dear friend, and so for R.B. Ever Yours. End of Section 61《Section 62 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, postmark July 18th, 1845. I suppose nobody is ever expected to acknowledge his or her besetting sin. It would be unnatural and therefore you will not be surprised to hear me deny the one imputed to me for mine. I deny it quite and directly, and if my denial goes for nothing, which is but reasonable, I might call in a great cloud of witnesses, a thundercloud, talking of storms, and even seek no further than this table for a first witness. This letter I had yesterday, which calls me, let me see how many hard names, unbending, disdainful cold-hearted arrogant yes arrogant as women always are when men grow humble there's a charge against all possible and probable petticoats beyond mine and through it not that either they or mine deserve the charge we do not to the lowest hem of us for i don't pass to the other extreme mind and adopt besetting sins over the way and in antithesis it's an undeserved charge and unprovoked and in fact the very flower of self-love self-tormented into ill-temper and shall remain unanswered for me and should even if i could write mortal epigrams as your lamia speaks them only it serves to help my assertion that people in general who know something of me my dear friend are not inclined to agree with you in particular about my having an over-pleasure in pleasing for a besetting sin. If you had spoken of my sister Henrietta, indeed you would have been right, so right, but for me, alas, my sins are not half as amiable, nor given to lean to virtue's side with half such a grace, and then I have a pretension to speak the truth like a Roman, even in matters of literature, where Mr. Kenyon says falseness is a fashion, and really and honestly i should not be afraid i should have no reason to be afraid if all the notes and letters written by my hand for years and years about presentation copies of poems and other sorts of books were brought together and conferred as they say of manuscripts before my face i should not shrink and be ashamed not that i always tell the truth as i see it but i never do speak falsely with intention and consciousness never and I do not find that people of letters are sooner offended than others are by the truth told in gentleness. I do not remember to have offended anyone in this relation and by these means. Well, but from me to you, it is all different, you know. You must know how different it is. I can tell you truly what I think of this thing and of that thing in your duchess, but I must of a necessity hesitate and fall into misgiving of the adequacy of my truth so called to judge at all of a work of yours i must look up to it and far up because whatever faculty i have is included in your faculty and with a great rim all round it besides and thus it is not at all from an over pleasure in pleasing you not at all from an inclination to depreciate myself that i speak and feel as i do and must on some occasions it is simply the consequence of a true comprehension of you and of me and apart from it i should not be abler i think but less able to assist you in anything i do wish you would consider all this reasonably and understand it as a third person would in a moment and consent not to spoil the real pleasure i have and am about to have in your poetry by nailing me up into a false position with your gold-headed nails of chivalry which won't hold to the wall through this summer now you will not answer this you will only understand it and me and that i am not servile but sincere but earnest but meaning what i say and when i say i am afraid 
you will believe that i am afraid and when i say i have misgivings you will believe that i have misgivings you will trust me so far and give me liberty to breathe and feel naturally according to my own nature probably or certainly rather i have one advantage over you one of which women are not fond of boasting that of being older by years for the essay on mind which was the first poem published by me and rather more printed than published after all the work of my earliest youth half childhood half womanhood was published in eighteen twenty six i see and if i told mr kenyon not to let you see that book it was not for the date but because coleridge's daughter was right in calling it a mere girl's exercise because it is just that and no more no expression whatever of my nature as it ever was pedantic and in some things pert and such as altogether and to do myself justice which i would fain do of course i was not in my whole life bad books are never like their writers you know and those under age books are generally bad also i have found it hard work to get into expression though i began rhyming from my very infancy much as you did and this with no sympathy near to me i have had to do without sympathy in the full sense and even in my seraphim days my tongue clove to the roof of my mouth from leading so conventional recluse a life perhaps and all my better poems were written last year the very best thing to come if there should be any life or courage to come i scarcely know sometimes it is the real truth i have haste to be done with it all it is the real truth however to say so may be an ungrateful return for your kind and generous words which i do feel gratefully let me otherwise feel as i will or must but then you know you are liable to such prodigious mistakes about besetting sins and even besetting virtues to such a set of small delusions that are sure to break one by one like other bubbles as you draw in your breath as i see by the law of my own star my own particular star the star i was born under the star wormwood on the opposite side of the heavens from the constellations of the lyre and the crown in the meantime it is difficult to thank you or not to thank you for all your kindnesses algos de sigan only mrs jameson told me of lady byron's saying that she knows she is burned every day in effigy by half the world but that the effigy is so unlike herself as to be inoffensive to her and just so or rather just in the converse of so it is with me and your kindnesses they are meant for quite another than i and are too far to be so near the comfort is in seeing you throw all those ducats out of the window and how many ducats go in a figure to a dozen duchesses it is profane to calculate the comfort is that you will not be the poorer for it in the end since the people beneath are honest enough to push them back under the door rather a bleak comfort and occupation though and you may find better work for your friends who are some of them weary even unto death of the uses of this life and now you who are generous be generous and take no notice of all this i speak of myself not of you so there is nothing for you to contradict or discuss and if there were you would be really kind and give me my way in it also you may take courage for i promise not to vex you by thanking you against your will more than may be helped some of this letter was written before yesterday and in reply of course to yours so it is to pass for two letters being long enough for just six yesterday you must have wondered at me for being in such a maze altogether about the poems and so now i rise to explain that it was assuredly the wine song and no other which i read of yours in hoods and then what did i say of the dante and beatrice because what i referred to was the exquisite page or two or three on that subject in the pentameron i do not remember anything else of landor's with the same bearing do you as to montaigne with the threads of my thoughts smoothly disentangled i can see nothing coloured by him nothing do bring all the hood poems of your own inclusive of the tokay because i read it in such haste as to whirl up all the dust you saw from the wheels of my chariot the duchess is past speaking of here but you will see how i am delighted 
and we must make speed, only taking care of your head, for I heard today that papa and my aunt are discussing the question of sending me off either to Alexandria or Malta for the winter. Oh, it is quite a passing talk and thought, I dare say, and it would not be in any case until September or October, though in every case, I suppose, I should not be much consulted. And all cases and places would seem better to me, if I were, than Madeira, which the physicians used to threaten me with long ago. So take care of your headache, and let us have the bells rung out clear before the summer ends. And pray don't say again anything about clear consciences and unclear ones, in granting me the privilege of reading your manuscripts, which is all clear privilege to me, with pride and gladness waiting on it. May God bless you always, my dear friend. E.B.B. You left behind your sister's little basket, but I hope you did not forget to thank her for my carnations. End of section 62《セクション63 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. No date. I shall just say, at the beginning of a note, as at the end, I am yours ever, and not till summer ends and my nails fall out and my breath breaks bubbles ought you to write thus having restricted me as you once did and do still you tie me like a shrove tuesday fowl to a stake and then pick the thickest cudgel out of your lot and at my head it goes i wonder whether you remembered having predicted exactly the same horror once before i was to see you and you were to understand do you do you understand my own friend with that superiority in years too for i confess to that you need not throw that in my teeth as soon as i read your essay on mind which of course i managed to do about twelve hours after mr k s positive refusal to keep his promise and give me the book from preface to the vision of fame at the end and reflected on my own doings about that time eighteen twenty six i did indeed see and wonder at your advance over me in years what then i have got nearer you considerably if only nearer since then and prove it by the remarks i make at favourable times such as this for instance which occurs in a poem you are to see, written some time ago, which advises nobody who thinks nobly of the soul to give, if he or she can help, such a good argument to the materialist as the owning that any great choice of that soul, which it is born to make and which, in its determining, as it must, the whole future course and impulses of that soul, which must endure forever, even though the object that induced the choice should disappear owning i say that such a choice may be scientifically determined and produced at any operator's pleasure by a definite number of ingredients so much youth so much beauty so much talent etc etc with the same certainty and precision that another kind of operator will construct you an artificial volcano with so much steel filings and flour of sulphur and what not there is more in the soul than rises to the surface and meets the eye whatever does that is for this world's immediate uses and were this world all all in us would be producible and available for use as it is with the body now but with the soul what is to be developed afterward is the main thing and instinctively asserts its rights so that when you hate or love you shall not be so able to explain why you is the ordinary creature enough of my poem he may not be so able there i will write no more 
you will never drop me off the golden hooks i dare believe and the rest is with god whose finger i see every minute of my life alexandria well and may i not as easily ask leave to come to-morrow at the musin as next wednesday at three god bless you do not be otherwise than kind to this letter which it cost me pains great pains to avoid writing better as truthfuller this you get is not the first begun come you shall not have the heart to blame me for see i will send all my sins of commission with hood blame them tell me about them and meantime let me be dear friend yours r b End of section 63section sixty four of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b monday postmark july twenty first eighteen forty five but i never did strike you or touch you and you are not in earnest in the complaint you make and this is really all i am going to say to-day what i said before was wrung from me by words on your part while you know far too well how to speak so as to make them go deepest and which sometimes it becomes impossible or over hard to bear without deprecation as when for instance you talk of being grateful to me well i will try that there shall be no more of it no more provocation of generosities and so this once as you express it i will not have the heart to blame you except for reading my books against my will which was very wrong indeed mr kenyon asked me i remember he had a mania of sending my copy-book literature round the world to this person and that person and i was roused at last into binding him by a vow to do so no more i remember he asked me is mr browning to be accepted to which i answered that nobody was to be accepted and thus he was quite right in resisting to the death or to dinner time just as you were quite wrong after dinner now could a woman have been more curious could the very author of the book have done worse but i leave my sins and yours gladly to get into the hood poems which have delighted me so and first to the saint praxits which is of course the finest and most powerful and indeed full of the power of life and of death it has impressed me very much then the angel and child with all its beauty and significance and the garden fancies some of the stanzas about the name of the flower with such exquisite music in them and grace of every kind and with that beautiful and musical use of the word meandering which i never remember having seen used in relation to sound before it does to mate with your simmering quiet in sordello which brings the summer air into the room as sure as you read it then i like your burial of the pedant so much you have quite the damp smell of funguses and the sense of creeping things through and through it and the laboratory is hideous as you meant to make it only i object a little to your tendency which is almost a habit and is very observable in this poem i think of making lines difficult for the reader to read see the opening lines of this poem not that music is required everywhere nor in them certainly but that the uncertainty of rhythm throws the reader's mind off the rail and interrupts his progress with you and your influence with him where we have not direct pleasure from rhythm and where no peculiar impression is to be produced by the changes in it we should be encouraged by the poet to forget it altogether should we not i am quite wrong perhaps but you see how i do conceal my wrongnesses where they mix themselves up with my sincere impressions and how could it be that no one within my hearing ever spoke of these poems because it is true that i never saw one of them never except the tokay which is inferior to all and that i was quite unaware of your having printed so much with hood or at all except this tokay and this duchess the world is very deaf and dumb i think but in the end we need not be afraid of its not learning its lesson could you come for i am going out in the carriage and will not stay to write of your poems even any more to-day could you come on thursday or friday 
the day left to your choice instead of on wednesday if i could help it i would not say so it is not a caprice and i leave it to you whether thursday or friday and alexandria seems discredited just now for malta and anything but madeira i go on saying to myself these hood poems are all to be in the next bells of course of necessity may god bless you my dear friend my ever dear friend e b b end of section sixty four section sixty five of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b tuesday morning postmark july twenty two eighteen forty five i will say with your leave thursday nor attempt to say anything else without your leave the temptation of reading the essay was more than i could bear and a wonderful work it is every way the other poems and their music wonderful and you go out still so continue better i cannot write this morning i should say too much and have to be sorry and afraid let me be safely yours ever my own dear friend r b i am but too proud of your praise when will the blame come at malta End of section sixty five. Section sixty six of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part One. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. E. B. B. to R. B. Postmark July twenty fifth, eighteen forty five. Are you any better today? and will you say just the truth of it and not attempt to do any of the writing which does harm nor of the reading even which may do harm and something does harm to you you see and you told me not long ago that you knew how to avoid the harm now did you not and what could it have been last week which you did not avoid and which made you so unwell beseech you not to think that i am going to aid and abet in this wronging of yourself for i will not indeed and i am only sorry to have given you my querulous queries yesterday and to have omitted to say in relation to them too how they were to be accepted in any case as just passing thoughts of mine for your passing thoughts some right it may be some wrong it must be and none insisted on even by the thinker just impressions and by no means pretending to be judgments now will you understand also i intended as a proof of my fallacy to strike out one or two of my doubts before i gave the paper to you so whichever strikes you as the most foolish of them of course must be what i meant to strike out there's ingenuity for you the poem did for the rest as will be suggested to you give me the very greatest pleasure and astonish me in two ways by the versification mechanically considered and by the successful evolution of pure beauty from all that roughness and rudeness of the sin of the boar pinner successfully evolved without softening one hoarse accent of his voice but there is to be a pause now you will not write any more no nor come here on wednesday if coming into the roar of this london should make the pain worse as i cannot help thinking it must and you were not well yesterday morning you admit it you will take care and if there should be a wisdom in going away was it very wrong of me doing what i told you of yesterday very imprudent i am afraid but i never knew how to be prudent and then there is not a sharing of responsibility in any sort of imaginable measure but a mere going away of so many thoughts apart from the thinker or of words apart from the speaker just as i might give away a pocket handkerchief to be newly marked and mine no longer i did not do and would not have done one of those papers singly it would have been unbecoming of me in every way it was simply a writing of notes of slips of paper now on one subject and now on another which were thrown into the great cauldron and boiled up with other matter and retranslated from my idiom where there seemed a need for it 
and I am not much afraid of being ever guessed at, except by those Oedipuses, who astounded me once for a moment, and were, after all, I hope, baffled by the Sphinx, or ever betrayed, because, besides the black Stygian oaths and indubitable honour of the editor, he has some interest, even as I have the greatest, in being silent and secret, and nothing is mine, if something is of me, or from me, rather. Yet it was wrong and foolish, I see plainly, wrong in all but the motives. How dreadful to write against time, and with a sideways running conscience. And then the literature of the day was wider than his knowledge all round, and the booksellers were barking distraction on every side. I had some of the mottoes to find, too, but the paper relating to you I never was consulted about, or in one particular way it would have been better, as easily it might have been. May God bless you, my dear friend. E.B.B. End of section 66section sixty seven of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b friday morning postmark july twenty five eighteen forty five you would let me now i dare say call myself grateful to you yet such is my jealousy in these matters so do i hate the material when it puts down or tries the immaterial in the offices of friendship that i could almost tell you i was not grateful and try if that way i could make you see the substantiality of those other favours you refuse to recognise and reality of the other gratitude you will not admit but truth is truth and you are all too generosity, and will draw none but the fair inference. So I thank you as well as I can for this also, this last kindness, and you know its value too. How, if there were another you in the world, who had done all you have done, and whom I merely admired for that, if such an one had sent me such a criticism, so exactly what I want, and can use and turn to good, you know how I would have told you, my you, I saw yesterday, all about it, and been sure of your sympathy and gladness. But the two in one? For the criticism itself, it is all true, except the overeating. All the suggestions are to be adopted, the improvements accepted. I so thoroughly understand your spirit in this, that, just in this beginning, I should really like to have found some point in which I could cooperate with your intention, and help my work by disputing the effect of any alteration proposed. If it ought to be disputed, that would answer your purpose exactly as well as agreeing with you, so that the benefit to me were apparent. But this time I cannot dispute one point. All is for best. So much for this Duchess, which I shall ever rejoice in, wherever was a bud even, in that strip of may bloom a live musical bee hangs now i shall let it lie my poem till so just before i print it and then go over it alter at the places and do something for the places where i really wrote anyhow almost to get done it is an odd fact yet characteristic of my accomplishings one and all in this kind that of the poem the real conception of an evening two years ago fully of that not a line is written though perhaps after all what i am going to call the accessories in the story are real though indirect reflexes of the original idea and so supersede properly enough the necessity of its personal appearance so to speak but as i conceived the poem it consisted entirely of the gypsy's description of the life the lady was to lead with her future gypsy lover a real life not an unreal one like that with the duke and as i meant to write it all their wild adventures would have come out and the insignificance of the former vegetation have been deducible only as the main subject has become now 
of course it comes to the same thing for one would never show half by half like a cut orange will you write to me caring though so much for my best interests as not to write if you can work for yourself or save yourself fatigue i think before writing or just after writing such a sentence but reflection only justifies my first feeling i would rather go without your letters without seeing you at all if that advantaged you my dear first and last friend my friend and now surely i might dare say you may if you please get well through god's goodness with persevering patience surely and this next winter abroad which you must get ready for now every sunny day will you not if i venture to weary you again with all this is there not the cause of causes and did not the prophet write that there was a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the e b b led on to the fortune of your r b oh let me tell you in the bitterness of my heart that it was only four o'clock that clock i inquired about and that no i shall never say with any grace what i want to say and now dare not that you all but owe me an extra quarter of an hour next time as in the east you give a beggar something for a few days running and you miss him and next day he looks indignant when the regular dole falls and murmurs and for yesterday do i stay too long i want to know too long for the voice and head and all but the spirit that may not so soon tire knowing the good it does if you would but tell me god bless you end of section sixty seven Section 68 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, Saturday, postmark July 28th, 1845. You say too much indeed in this letter which has crossed mine, and particularly as there is not a word in it of what I most wanted to know and want to know, how you are for you must observe if you please that the very paper you pour such kindness on was written after your own example and pattern when in the matter of my prometheus such different wearying matter you took trouble for me and did me good judge from this if even in inferior things there can be gratitude from you to me or rather do not judge but listen when i say that i am delighted to have met your wishes in writing as i wrote only that you are surely wrong in refusing to see a single wrongness in all that heap of weedy thoughts and that when you look again you must come to the admission of it one of the thistles is the suggestion about the line was it singing was it saying which you wrote so and which i propose to amend by an intermediate or thinking of it at a distance it grows clear to me that you were right and that there should be and must be no or to disturb the listening pause now should there and there was something else which i forget at this moment and something more than the something else your account of the production of the poem interests me very much and proves just what i wanted to make out from your statements the other day and they refused i thought to let me that you are more faithful to your first idea than to your first plan is it so or not orange is orange but which half of the orange is not predestinated from all eternity is it so sunday i wrote so much yesterday and then went out not knowing very well how to speak or how to be silent is it better to-day of some expressions of yours and of your interest in me which are deeply affecting to my feelings whatever else remains to be said of them and you know that you make great mistakes of fennel for hemlock of four o'clocks for five o'clocks and of other things of more consequence one for another and may not be quite right besides as to my getting well if i please which reminds me a little of what papa says sometimes when he comes into this room unexpectedly and convicts me of having dry toast for dinner and declares angrily that obstinacy and dry toast 
have brought me to my present condition and that if i pleased to have porter and beefsteaks instead i should be as well as ever i was in a month but where is the need of talking of it what i wished to say was this that if i get better or worse as long as i live and to the last moment of life i shall remember with an emotion which cannot change its character all the generous interest and feeling you have spent on me wasted on me i was going to write but i would not provoke any answering and in one obvious sense it need not be so i never shall forget these things my dearest friend nor remember them more coldly god's goodness i believe in it as in his sunshine here which makes my head ache a little while it comes in at the window and makes most other people gayer it does me good too in a different way and so may god bless you and me in this just this that i may never have the sense intolerable in the remotest apprehension of it of being in any way directly or indirectly the means of ruffling your smooth path by so much as one of my flint stones in the meantime you do not tire me indeed even when you go later for sooner and i do not tire myself even when i write longer and duller letters to you if the last is possible than the one i am ending now as the most grateful leave me that word of your friends e b b how could you think that i should speak to mr kenyon of the book all i ever said to him has been that you had looked through my prometheus for me and that i was not disappointed in you these two things on two occasions i do trust that your head is better End of section 68section sixty nine of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b postmark july twenty eighth eighteen forty five how must i feel and what can or could i say even if you let me say all i am most grateful most happy most happy come what will will you let me try and answer your note to-morrow before wednesday when i am to see you i will not hide from you that my head aches now and i have let the hours go by one after one i am better all the same and more right as i say am i better you ask yours i am ever yours my dear friend r b End of section sixty nine. Section seventy of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett. Part one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R. B. to E. B. B. Thursday. Postmark July thirty one. 1845. In all I say to you, write to you, I know very well that I trust to your understanding be almost beyond the warrant of any human capacity. But as I began, so I shall end. I shall believe you remember what I am forced to remember. You who do me the superabundant justice on every possible occasion, you will never do me injustice when i sit by you and talk about italy and the rest to-day i cannot write though i am very well otherwise but i shall soon get into my old self-command and write with as much ineffectual fire as before but meantime you will write to me i hope telling me how you are i have but one greater delight in the world than in hearing from you god bless you my best dearest friend think what i would speak ever yours r b end of section seventy section seventy one of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b thursday postmark august second eighteen forty five 
let me write one word not to have it off my mind because it is by no means heavily on it but lest i should forget to write it at all by not writing it at once what could you mean i have been thinking since you went away by applying such a grave expression as having a thing off your mind to that foolish subject on the stupid book mine and by making it worth your while to account logically for your wish about my not mentioning it to mr kenyon you could not fancy for one moment that i was vexed in the matter of the book or in the other matter of your wish now just hear me i explained to you that i had been silent to mr kenyon first because the fact was so and next and a little because i wanted to show how i anticipated your wish by a wish of my own though from a different motive your motive i really did take to be never suspecting my dear kind cousin of treason to be a natural reluctancy of being convicted forgive me of such an arch womanly curiosity for my own motive motives they are more than one you must trust me and refrain as far as you can from accusing me of an over love of eleusinian mysteries when i ask you to say just as little about your visits here and of me as you find possible even to mr kenyon as to every other person whatever as you know and yet more than you know i am in a peculiar position and it does not follow that you should be ashamed of my friendship or that i should not be proud of yours if we avoid making it a subject of conversation in high places or low places there that is my request to you or commentary on what you put off your mind yesterday probably quite unnecessary as either request or commentary yet said on the chance of its not being so because you seem to mistake my remark about mr kenyon and your head how is it and do consider if it would not be wise and right on that account of your health to go with mr chorley you can neither work nor enjoy while you are subject to attacks of the kind and besides and without reference to your present suffering and inconvenience you ought not to let them master you and gather strength from time and habit i am sure you ought not worse last week than ever you see and no prospect perhaps of bringing out your bells this autumn without paying a cost too heavy therefore the therefore is quite plain and obvious friday just as it is how anxious flush and i are to be delivered from you by these sixteen heads of the discourse of one of us written before your letter came ah but i am serious and you will consider will you not what is best to be done and do it you could write to me you know from the end of the world if you could take the thought of me so far and for me no and yet yes i will say this much for i am not inclined to do you injustice but justice when you come here the justice of wondering to myself how you can possibly possibly care to come which is true enough to be unanswerable if you please or i should not say it as i began so i shall end did you as i hope you did thank your sister for flush and for me when you were gone he graciously signified his intention of eating the cakes brought the bag to me and emptied it without a drawback from my hand cake after cake and i forgot the basket once again and talking of italy and the cardinals and thinking of some cardinal points you are ignorant of did you ever hear that i was one of those schismatics of amsterdam whom your dr don would have put into the dykes unless he meant the baptists instead of the independents the holders of the independent church principle no not schismatical i hope hating as i do from the roots of my heart all that rending of the garment of christ which christians are so apt to make the daily weekday of this christianity so called and caring very little for most dogmas and doxies in themselves too little as people say to me sometimes when they sent me new testaments to learn from with very kind intentions and believing that there is only one church in heaven and earth with one divine high priest to it let exclusive religionists build what walls they please and bring out what chrisms but i used to go with my father always when i was able to the nearest dissenting chapel of the congregationalists from liking the simplicity of that praying and speaking without books and a little too from disliking the theory of state churches 
there is a narrowness among the dissenters which is wonderful an arid grey puritanism in the clefts of their souls but it seems to me clear that they know what the liberty of christ means far better than those do who call themselves churchmen and stand altogether as a body on higher ground and so you see when i talked of the sixteen points of my discourse it was the foreshadowing of a coming event and you have had it at last in the whole length and breadth of it but it is not my fault if the wind began to blow so that i could not go out as i intended as i shall do to-morrow and that you have received my dullness in a full libation of it in consequence my sisters said of the roses you blasphemed yesterday that they never saw such flowers anywhere anywhere here in london and therefore if i had thought so myself before it was not so wrong of me i put your roses you see against my letter to make it seem less dull and yet i do not forget what you say about caring to hear from me i mean i do not affect to forget it may god bless you far longer than i can say so e b b end of section seventy one Section 72 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Sunday evening. Postmark. August 4, 1845. I said what you comment on about Mr. Kenyon, because I feel I must always tell you the simple truth and not being quite at liberty to communicate the whole story, though it would at once clear me from the charge of over-curiosity, if I much cared for that, I made my first request in order to prevent your getting at any part of it from him which should make my withholding seem disingenuous for the moment, that is, till my explanation came, if it had an opportunity of coming, and then, when I fancied you were misunderstanding the reason of that request, and supposing I was ambitious of making a higher figure in his eyes than your own, I then felt it on my mind, and so spoke, a natural mode of relief, surely. For, dear friend, I have once been untrue to you, when and how and why, you know, but I thought it pedantry, and worse to hold by my words and increase their fault. You have forgiven me that one mistake, and I only refer to it now, because if you should ever make that a precedent, and put any least most trivial word of mine under the same category, you would wrong me as you never wronged human being, and that is done with. For the other matter, the talk of my visits, it is impossible that any hint of them can ooze out of the only three persons in the world to whom I ever spoke of them my father mother and sister to whom my appreciation of your works is no novelty since some years in whom i may comprehend exactly your position and the necessity for the absolute silence i enjoined respecting the permission to see you you may depend on them and miss mitford is in your keeping mind and dear mr kenyon if there should be never so gentle a touch of garrulous god innocence about these kind of lips of his come let me snatch at that clue out of the maze and say how perfect absolutely perfect are those three or four pages in the vision which present the poets a line a few words and the man there one twang of the bow and the arrow head in the white shelley's white ideal all statue blind is perfect how can I coin words? And dear, deaf, old Hesiod, and all, all are perfect, perfect. But the moon's regality will hear no praise. Will then, will she hear blame? Can it be you, my own you past putting away? You are a schismatic and frequenter of independent dissenting chapels. And you confess this to me, whose father and mother went this morning to the very independent chapel where they took me all those years back to be baptized and where they heard this morning a sermon preached by the very minister who officiated 
on that other occasion. Now, will you be particularly encouraged by this successful instance to bring forward any other point of disunion between us that may occur to you? Please do not, for so sure as you begin proving that there is a gulf fixed between us, so sure shall I end proving that. Anne Radcliffe avert it, that you are just my sister. Not that I am much frightened, but that there are such surprises in novels. Blame the next, yes. Now this is to be real blame. And I meant to call your attention to it before. Why, why do you blot out, in that unutterably provoking manner, whole lines, not to say words, in your letters, and in the criticism on the Duchess? If it is a fact that you have a second thought, as it ceased to be as genuine a fact, that first thought you please to efface. Why, give a thing and take a thing. Is there no significance in putting on record that your first impression was to a certain effect, and your next to a certain other, perhaps completely opposite one? If any proceeding of yours could go near to deserve the harsh word impertinent, which you have twice, in speech and writing, been pleased to apply to your observations on me. Certainly this does go as near as can be, as there is but one step to take from Southampton Pier to New York Quay, for travellers westward. Now will you lay this to heart, and perpend, lest in my righteous indignation I, some words effaced here, for my own health, it improves, thank you, and I shall go abroad all in good time, never fear. For my bells, Mr. Chorley tells me there is no use in the world of printing them before November at earliest, and by that time I shall get done with these romances, and certainly one tragedy. That could go to press next week, and proof of which I will bring you, if you let me, a few more hundreds of lines next Wednesday. But my poet, if I would, as is true, Sacrifice all my works to do your fingers even good. What would I not offer up to prevent you staying? Perhaps to correct my very verses. Perhaps read and answer my very letters. Staying the production of more Bertas and Caterinas and Geraldines. More great and beautiful poems of which I shall be. How proud! Do not be punctual in paying tithes of time, mint, anise, and cumin and leaving unpaid the real weighty dues of the law, nor affect a scrupulous acknowledgment of what you owe me in petty manners, while you leave me to settle such a charge as accessory to the hiding the talent as best I can. I have thought of this again and again, and I would have spoken of it to you, had I ever felt myself fit to speak of any subject nearer home and me and you than Rome and Cardinal Acton. For, observe, you have not done, yes, the Prometheus, no doubt, but with that exception, have you written much lately, as much as last year when you wrote all your best things, you said, I think. Yet you are better now than then. Dearest friend, I intend to write more, and very likely to be praised more, now I care less than ever for it, but still more do I look to have you ever before me, in your place and with more poetry, and more praise still, and my own heartfelt praise over on the top, like a flower on the water. I have said nothing of yesterday's storm. Thunder, may you not have been out in it? The evening draws in, and I will walk out. May God bless you, and let you hold me by the hand till the end. Yes, dearest friend, R.B. End of Section 72。Section 73 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, postmark August 8, 1845. Just to show what may be lost by my crossings out, I will tell you the story of the one in the Duchess, and in fact it is almost worth telling to a metaphysician like you, on other grounds, that you may draw perhaps some psychological good from the absurdity of it. Here, then, 
when i had done writing the sheet of annotations and reflections on your poem i took up my pencil to correct the passages reflected on with the reflections by the crosses you may observe just glancing over the writing as i did so well and where that erasure is i found a line purporting to be extracted from your duchess with sundry acute criticisms and objections quite undeniably strong following after it only to my amazement as i looked and looked the line so acutely objected to and purporting as i say to be taken from the duchess was by no means to be found in the duchess nor anything like it and i am certain indeed that in the duchess or out of it you never wrote such a bad line in your life and so it became a proof thing to me that i had been enacting in a mystery both poet and critic together and one so neutralizing the other that i took all that pains you remark upon to cross myself out in my double capacity and i am now telling the story of it notwithstanding and there's an obvious moral to the myth isn't there for critics who bark the loudest commonly bark at their own shadow in the glass as my flush used to do long and loud before he gained experience and learned the gnothi seaton in the apparition of the brown dog with the glittering dilating eyes and as i did under the erasure and another moral springs up of itself in this productive ground for you see quand je me fasse il n'y a pas grand mal and i am to be made to work very hard am i but you should remember that if i did as much writing as last summer i should not be able to do much else i mean to go out and walk about for really i think i could manage to read your poems and write as i am writing now with ever so much headwork of my own going on at the same time but the bodily exercise is different and i do confess that the novelty of living more in the outer life for the last few months than i have done for years before make me idle and inclined to be idle and everybody is idle sometimes even you perhaps are you not for me you know i do carpet work ask mrs jameson and i never pretend to be in a perpetual motion of mental industry still it may not be quite as bad as you think i have done some work since prometheus only it is nothing worth speaking of and not a part of the romance poem which is to be some day if i live for it lyrics for the most part which lie written illegibly in pure egyptian oh there is time enough and too much perhaps and so let me be idle a little now and enjoy your poems while i can it is pure enjoyment and must be but you do not know how much or you would not talk as you do sometimes so wide of any possible application and do not talk again of what you would sacrifice for me if you affect me by it which is true you cast me from you farther than ever in the next thought that is true the poems yours which you left with me are full of various power and beauty and character and you must let me have my own gladness from them in my own way now i must end this letter did you go to chelsea and hear the divine philosophy tell me the truth always will you i mean such truths as may be painful to me though truths may god bless you ever dear friend e b b End of section 73Section 74 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Friday afternoon. Postmark, August 8, 1845. Then there is one more thing off my mind. I thought it might be with you as with me not remembering how different are the causes that operate against us, different in kind as in degree. So much reading hurts me. For instance, whether the reading be light or heavy, fiction or fact, and so much writing, whether my own, such as you have seen, or the merest compliment returning to the weary tribe that exacted of one. But your health, that before all, as assuring all eventually, and, on the other accounts you must know, never 
pray, pray, never lose one sunny day or propitious hour to go out or walk about. But do not surprise me one of these mornings by walking up to me when I am introduced, or I shall infallibly, in spite of all the after-repentance and begging pardon, I shall, words effaced. So here you learn the first painful truth I have it in my power to tell you. I sent you the last of our poor roses this morning, considering that I fairly owed that kindness to them. Yes, I went to Chelsea and found dear Carlyle alone. His wife is in the country where he will join her as soon as his book's last sheet returns corrected and fit for press, which will be at the month's end about. He was all kindness and talked like his own self while he made tea, and afterward brought chairs into the little yard rather than garden, and smoked his pipe with apparent relish. At night he would walk as far as Vauxhall Bridge on my way home. If I use the word sacrifice, and you do well to object, I can imagine nothing ever to be done by me worthy such a name. God bless you, dearest friend. Shall I hear from you before Tuesday? Ever your own, R.B. End of section 74《セクション75 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, Friday, postmark August 8, 1845. It is very kind to send these flowers, too kind. Why are they sent? And without one single word? Which is not too kind, certainly. I looked down into the heart of the roses and turned the carnations over and over to the peril of their leaves, and in vain. Not a word do I deserve today, I suppose. And yet, if I don't, I don't deserve the flowers either. There should have been an equal justice done to my demerits, O oh Zeus with the scales. After all, I do thank you for these flowers, and they are beautiful, and they came just in a right current of time, just when I wanted them, or something like them. So I confess that humbly, and do thank you, at last, rather as I ought to do. Only you ought not to give away all the flowers of your garden to me. And your sister thinks so, be sure, if as silently as you sent them. Now I shall not write any more, not having been written to. What with the Wednesday's flowers and these, you may think how I in this room look down on the gardens of Damascus, let your Jew say what he pleases of them and the Wednesday's flowers are as fresh and beautiful, I must explain, as the new ones. They were quite supererogatory, the new ones, in the sense of being flowers. Now the sense of what I am writing seems questionable, does it not? At least more so than the nonsense of it. Not a word, even under the little blue flowers. E.B.B. End of section 75 Section 76 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Sunday afternoon. Postmark, August 11, 1845. How good you are to the smallest thing I try and do, to show I would please you for an instant if I could rather than from any hope such poor efforts as i am restricted to can please you or aught and that you should care for the note that was not there but i was surprised by the summons to seal and deliver since time and the carrier were peremptory and so i dare divine almost i should hear from you by our midday post which happened and the answer to that you received on friday night did you not I had to go to Holborn, of all places, not to pluck strawberries in the bishop's garden like Richard Crouchback, but to get a book, and there I carried my note, thinking to expedite its delivery, this notelet of yours, quite as little in its kind as my blue flowers. This came last evening, and here are my thanks, dear E.B.B., dear friend. 
In the former note, there is a phrase I must not forget to call on you to account for, that where it confesses to having done some work, only nothing worth speaking of. Just see, will you be first and only compact breaker? Nor misunderstand me here. Please, as I said, I am quite rejoiced that you go out now, walk about now, and put off the writing that will follow thrice as abundantly, all because of the stopping to gather strength. So I want no new word, not to say poem, not to say the romance poem. Let the finches in the shrubberies grow restless in the dark. I am inside with the lights and music, but what is done is done. Pavere. And worth is, dear my friend, pardon me, not in your arbitration quite. Let me tell you an odd thing that happened at Chorley's the other night. I must have mentioned to you that I forget my own verses so surely after they are once on paper, that I ought, without affectation, to mend them infinitely better, able as I am to bring fresh eyes to bear on them. When I say, once on paper, that is just what I mean, and no more. For after the sad revising begins, they do leave their mark, distinctly or less so according to circumstances. Well, Miss Cushman, the new American actress, clever and truthful-looking, was talking of a new novel by the Dane Anderson, he of the Improvisator, which will reach us, it should seem, in translation, via America. She looked over two or three proofs of the work in the press, and Chorley was anxious to know something about its character. The title, she said, was capital, Only a Fiddler, and she enlarged on that word, only, and its significance, so put, and I quite agreed with her for several minutes, till first one reminiscence flitted to me, then another, and at last I was obliged to stop my praises and say, But now I think of it, I seem to have written something with a similar title. Nay, a play, I believe. Yes, and in five acts, only an actress. And from that time, some two years or more ago to this, I have been every way relieved of it. And when I got home next morning, I made a dark pocket in my russet horror of a portfolio, give up its dead, and there fronted me, only a player girl, the real title, and the sayings and doings of her and the others, such others. So I made haste and just tore out one sample page, being seen the first, and sent it to our friend as earnest and proof I had not been purely dreaming, as might seem to be the case. And what makes me recall it now is that it was Russian and about a fair on the Neva, and booths and droskies and fish pies and so forth, with the palaces in the background, and in Chorley's Athenaeum of yesterday, you may read a paper of very simple moony stuff of the death of Alexander, and that Sir James Wiley I have seen at St. Petersburg, where he chose to mistake me for an Italian. Monsieur l'Italien, he said another time, looking up from his cards. So I think to tell you. Now I may leave off. I shall see you start on Tuesday. Here, perhaps something definite about your traveling? Uh, do you know Consuelo wearies me? Oh, wearies, and the fourth volume I have all but stopped at. There lie the three following. But who cares about Consuelo after that horrible evening with the Venetian scamp, where he bullies her, and it does answer, after all, she says, as we say. And Albert wearies too. It seems all false, all writing, not the first part, though, and what easy work these novelists have of it. A dramatic poet has to make you love or admire his men and women. They must do and say all that you are to see and hear. Really do it in your face. Say it in your ears. And it is wholly for you and your power to name, characterize, and so praise or blame what is so said and done. If you don't perceive of yourself, there is no standing by for the author and telling you. But with these novelists, a scrape of the pen, outblurting of a phrase, and the miracle is achieved. Consuelo possessed to perfection this and the other gift. What would you more? Or, to leave dear Georges San, 
pray think of Bulwer's beginning a character by informing you that Ione, or somebody in Pompeii, was endowed with perfect genius. Genius! What though the obliging informer might write his fingers off before he gave the pitifulest proof that the poorest spark of that same, that genius, had ever visited him. Ione has it perfectly, perfectly, and that is enough. Zeus with the scales, with the false weights. And now, till Tuesday, good-bye, and be willing to get well as, letting me send porter instead of flowers, and beefsteaks too, soon as may be, and may God bless you, ever dear friend, R.B. End of section 76Section 77 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB, postmark, August 11th, 1845. But if it hurts you to read and write ever so little, why should I be asked to write, for instance, before Tuesday? And I did mean to say before today, that I wish you never would write to me when you are not quite well, as once or twice you have done, if not much oftener, because there is not a necessity, and I do not choose that there should ever be, or seem a necessity, do you understand? And as a matter of personal preference, it is natural for me to like the silence that does not hurt you better than the speech that does, and so remember. And talking of what may hurt you and me, you would smile, as I have often done in the midst of my vexation, if you knew the persecution I have been subjected to by the people who call themselves lucus a non lucendo, the faculty, and set themselves against the exercise of other people's faculties as a sure way to death and destruction. The modesty and simplicity with which one's physicians tell one not to think or feel, just as they would tell one not to walk out in the dew, would be quite amusing if it were not too tryingly stupid sometimes i had a doctor once who thought he had done everything because he had carried the inkstand out of the room now he said you will have such a pulse to-morrow he gravely thought poetry a sort of disease a sort of fungus of the brain and held as a serious opinion that nobody could be properly well who exercised it as an art which was true he maintained even of men he had studied the physiology of poets quotha but that for women it was a mortal malady and incompatible with any common show of health under any circumstances and then came the damnatory clause in his experience that he had never known a system approaching mine in excitability except miss scarrows a young lady who wrote verses for lady blessington's annuals and who was the only other female rhymer he had had the misfortune of attending. And she was to die in two years, though she was dancing quadrilles then, and has lived to do the same by the polka, and I, of course, much sooner, if I did not ponder these things, and amend my ways, and take to reading a course of history. Indeed, I do not exaggerate. And just so, for a long while, I was persecuted and pestered, vexed thoroughly sometimes, my own family, instructed to sing the burden out all day long, until the time when the subject was suddenly changed by my heart being broken by that great stone that fell out of heaven. Afterwards, I was let do anything I could best, which was very little, until last year, and the working last year did much for me in giving me stronger roots down into life, much. But think of that absurd reasoning that went before, the niaiserie of it, for granting all the premises all round, it is not the utterance of a thought that can hurt anybody, while only the utterance is dependent on the will, and so what can the taking away of an inkstand do? Those physicians are such metaphysicians. It's curious to listen to them, and it's wise to leave off listening, though I have met with excessive kindness among them, and do not refer to Dr. Chambers in any of this, of course. I am very glad you went to Chelsea, and it seemed finer afterwards, on purpose to make room for the divine philosophy, which reminds me 
the going to chelsea that my brother henry confessed to me yesterday with shame and confusion of face to having mistaken and taken your umbrella for another belonging to a cousin of ours then in the house he saw you without conjecturing just at the moment who you were do you conjecture sometimes that i live all alone here like mariana in the moated grange it is not quite so but where there are many as with us every one is apt to follow his own devices and my father is out all day and my brothers and sisters are in and out and with too large a public of noisy friends for me to bear and i see them only at certain hours except of course my sisters and then as you have a reputation and are opined to talk generally in blank verse it is not likely that there should be much irreverent rushing into this room when you are known to be in it the flowers are so beautiful indeed it was wrong though to send me the last it was not just to the lawful possessors and enjoyers of them that it was kind to me i do not forget you are too teachable a pupil in the art of obliterating and omne ignotum pro terrifico and therefore i won't frighten you by walking to meet you for fear of being frightened myself so good-bye until tuesday i ought not to make you read all this i know whether you like to read it or not and i ought not to have written it having no better reason than because i like to write on and on you have better reasons for thinking me very weak and i too good ones for not being able to reproach you for that natural and necessary opinion may god bless you my dearest friend e b b end of section seventy seven Section 78 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Tuesday evening. Postmark. August 13, 1845. What can I say, or hope to say, to you when I see what you do for me? This for myself nothing for you this that i think the great great good i get by your kindness strikes me less than that kindness all is right too come i will have my fault finding at last so you can decipher my utterest hieroglyphic now droop the eyes while i triumph the plains cower cower beneath the mountains their masters and the priests stomp over the clay ridges a palpable plagiarism from two lines of a legend that delighted my infancy and now instruct my mature years in pretty nearly all they boast of the semi-mythologic era referred to in london town when rain king flood his lords went stomping through the mud but all historic records were half as picturesque but you know yes you know you are too indulgent by far and treat these roughnesses as if they were advanced to many a stage meantime the pure gain is mine and better the kind generous spirit is mine mine to profit by and best 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 the dearest friend is mine so be happy r b end of section seventy eight Section 79 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Postmark August 13th, 1845. Yes, I admit that it was stupid to read that word so wrong. I thought there was a mistake somewhere, but that it was yours, who had written one word, meaning to write another cower puts it all right of course but is there an english word of a significance different from stamp in stomp does not the old word king lud's men stomped withal claim identity with our stamping the a and o used to change about you know in the old english writers see chaucer for it still the stomp with the peculiar significance is better of course than the stamp even with a rhyme ready for it 
and i dare say you are justified in daring to put this old wine into the new bottle and we will drink to the health of the poem in it it is italy in england isn't it but i understand and understood perfectly through it all that it is unfinished and in a rough state round the edges i could not help seeing that even if i were still blinder than when i read lower for cower but do not i ask of you speak of my kindness my kindness mine it is wasteful and ridiculous excess and misapplication to use such words of me and therefore talking of compacts and the fas and nefas of them i entreat you to know for the future that whatever i write of your poetry if it isn't to be called impertinence isn't to be called kindness any more a fortiori as people say when they are sure of an argument now will you try to understand and talking still of compacts how and where did i break any compact i do not see it was very curious the phenomenon about your only a player girl what an ungodlike indifference to your creatures though your worlds breathed away from you like soap bubbles and dropping and breaking into russet portfolios unobserved only a god for the epicurean at best can you be that miss cushman went to three mile cross the other day and visited miss mitford and pleased her a good deal i fancied from what she said and with reason from what you say and only a fiddler as i forgot to tell you yesterday is announced you may see in any newspaper as about to issue from the english press by mary howitt's editorship so we need not go to america for it but if you complain of george sand for want of art how could you bear anderson who can see a thing under his eyes and place it under yours and take a thought separately into his soul and express it insularly but has no sort of instinct towards wholeness and unity and writes a book by putting so many pages together just so for the rest there can be no disagreeing with you about the comparative difficulty of novel writing and drama writing i disagree a little lower down in your letter because i could not deny in my own convictions a certain proportion of genius to the author of ernest maltraverse and alice did you ever read those books even if he had more impotently tried supposing it to be possible for the dramatic laurel in fact his poetry dramatic or otherwise is not but for the prose romances and for ernest maltravers above all i must lift up my voice and cry and i read the athenaeum about your sir james wiley who took you for an italian poi vi dirò signor che ne fu causa ca vi ho fatto al scriver di vita pausa ever your e b b End of section 79Section 80 of The Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Friday morning. Postmark. August 15, 1845. Do you know, dear friend, it is no good policy to stop up all the vents of my feelings nor leave one for safety's sake, as you will do. Let me caution you never so repeatedly. I know quite well enough that your kindness is not so apparent, even in this instance of correcting my verses, as in many other points. But on such points you lift a finger to me, and I am dumb. Am I not to be allowed a word here neither? I remember, in the first season of German opera here, when Fidelio's effects were going, going up to the gallery, in order to get the best of the last chorus, get its oneness, which you do, and, while perched there an inch under the ceiling, I was amused with the enormous enthusiasm of an elderly German. We thought, I and a cousin of mine, whose whole body broke out in billow, heaved and swayed in the perfection of his delight. Hands, head, feet, all tossing and striving to utter what possessed him. Well, next week we went again to the opera, and again mounted at the proper time, but the crowd was greater, and our mild 
great-faced, white-haired, red-cheeked German was not to be seen. Not at first, for as the glory was at its full, my cousin twisted me around and made me see an arm, only an arm, all the body of its owner being amalgamated with a dense crowd on each side, before and not behind, because they, the crowd, occupied the last benches over which we looked, and this arm waved and exulted as if, for the dignity of the whole body, relieved it of its dangerous accumulation of repressed excitability. When the crowd broke up, all the rest of the man disengaged itself by slow endeavors, and there stood our friend confessed, as we were sure. Now, you would have bade him keep his arm quiet? Lady Geraldine, you would. I have read those novels, but I must keep that word of words, genius, for something different. Talent will do here surely. There lies Consuelo, done with. I shall tell you frankly that it strikes me as precisely what in conventional language, with the customary silliness, is styled a woman's book, in its merits and defects, and supremely timid in all the points where one wants, and has a right to expect, some fruit of all the pretense and George Sandism. These are occasions when one does say, in the phrase of her school, Co les femmes parli, or, what is better, let her act. And how does Consuelo comfort herself on such an emergency? Why, she bravely lets the uninspired people throw down one by one their dearest prejudices at her feet, and then, like a very actress, picks them up like so many flowers, returning them to the breast of the owners with a smile and a courtesy, and trips off the stage with a glance at the pit. Count Christian, Baron Frederick, Baroness, what is her name? All open their arms, and Consuelo will not consent to entail disgrace, etc., etc. No, you say, she leaves them in order to solve the problem of her true feeling. Whether she can really love Albert, remember that this is done, and that is, so much of it as ever is done, and as determines her to accept his hand at the very last. This is solved sometime about the next morning, or earlier, I forget, and in the meantime, Albert gets that benefit of the doubt of which chapter the last informs you. As for the hesitation and self-examination on the matter of that Anzoletto, the writer is turning over the leaves of a wrong dictionary, seeking help from psychology, and pretending to forget there is such a thing as physiology. Then that horrible purpura, if George Sand gives him to a consuelo for an absolute master, in consideration of his services specified, and is of opinion that they warrant his conduct, or at least oblige submission to it, then I find her objections to the fatherly rule of Frederick perfectly impertinent, he having a few claims upon the gratitude of Prussia, also in his way, I believe. If the strong ones will make the weak ones lead them, then for heaven's sake, let this dear old, all-abused world keep on its course, without these outeries and tearings of hair, and don't be forever goading the carls and other trodden-down creatures till they get their carbines in order, very rationally, to abate the nuisance. When you make a man a long speech against some enormity, he is about to commit, and adjure, and beseech, and so forth, till he throws down the aforesaid carbine, falls on his knees, and lets the Frederick go quietly on his way, to keep on killing his thousands, after the fashion that moved your previous indignation. Now is that right? Consequential? That is, inferential. Logically deduced, going straight to the end. Manly? The accessories are not the principal, the adjuncts, the essence, or the ornamental incidents, the book's self. So it matters it if the portraits are admirable, the descriptions eloquent. Eloquent, there it is. That is her characteristic. What she has to speak, she speaks out, speaks volubly forth, too well, 
inasmuch as you say, advancing a step or two, and now speak as completely here, and she says nothing. But all that another could do, as others have done, but les femmes qui parlaient, ah, that is this all? So I am not Georges Sands. She teaches me nothing. I look to her for nothing. I am ever yours, dearest friend. How I write to you, page on page. But Tuesday, who could wait till then? Shall I not hear from you? God bless you ever. R.B. End of section 80「Section 81 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Saturday. Postmark August 16th, 1845. But what likeness is there between opposites, and what has Monsieur l'Italien to do with the said elderly German? See how little. For to bring your case into point, somebody should have been playing on a juice harp for the whole of the orchestra, and the elderly German should have quoted something about Harp of Judah to the Venetian behind him, and there you would have proved your analogy, because you see, my dear friend, it was not the expression, but the thing expressed I cried out against, the exaggeration in your mind. I am sorry when I write what you do not like, but I have instincts and impulses too strong for me when you say things which put me into such a miserably false position in respect to you, as for instance, when in this very last letter, oh, I must tell you, you talk of my correcting your verses. My correcting your verses? Now, is that a thing for you to say? And do you really imagine that if I kept that happily imagined phrase in my thoughts, I should be able to tell you one word of my impressions from your poetry ever, ever again? Do you not see at once what a disqualifying and paralyzing phrase it must be of simple necessity? So it is I who have reason to complain, it appears to me, and by no means you, and in your second consideration you become aware of it, I do not at all doubt. As to Consuelo, I agree with nearly all that you say of it, though George Sant, we are to remember, is greater than Consuelo, and not to be depreciated according to the defects of that book, nor classified as femme qui parle, she who is man and woman together, judging her by the standard of even that book in the nobler portions of it. For the inconsequency of much in the book I admit it, of course, and you will admit that it is the rarest of phenomena with men, men of logic, follow their own opinions into their obvious results. Nobody, you know, ever thinks of doing such a thing. To pursue one's own inferences is to rush in where angels, perhaps, do not fear to tread, but where there will not be much other company. So the want of practical logic shall be a human fault rather than a womanly one, if you please. And you must please also to remember that Consuelo is only half the orange, and that when you complain of its not being a whole one, you overlook that hand which is holding to you the Comtesse de Rudolstadt in three volumes. Not that I, who have read the whole, profess a full satisfaction about Albert and the rest, and Consuelo is made to be happy by a mere claptrap at last, and Madame Dudevant has her specialties, in which other women, I fancy, have neither part nor lot, even here. Altogether the book is a sort of rambling odyssey, a female odyssey, if you like, but full of beauty and nobleness, let the faults be where they may. And then I like those long, long books one can live away into, leaving the world and above all oneself, quite at the end of the avenue of palms, quite out of sight and out of hearing. Oh, I have felt something like that so often, so often, and you never felt it, and never will, I hope. But if Bulver had written nothing but the earnest Maltraverse books, you would think perhaps more highly of him. Do you not think it possible now? It is his most impotent struggling into poetry which sets about proving a negative of genius on him, that which the Athenaeum praises as respectable attainment in various walks of literature. Like the Athenaeum, isn't it? And worthy praise to be administered by professed judges of art. What is to be expected of the public when the teachers of the public teach so? When you come on Tuesday, do not forget the manuscript if any is done. 
only don't let it be done so as to tire and hurt you mind and good-bye until tuesday from e b b End of section 81section eighty two of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by sonia e b b to r b sunday postmark august eighteenth eighteen forty five i am going to propose to you to give up tuesday and to take your choice of two or three other days say friday or saturday or to-morrow monday mr kenyon was here to-day and talked of leaving london on friday and of visiting me again on tuesday he said but that is an uncertainty and it may be tuesday or wednesday or thursday so i thought wrong or right that out of the three remaining days you would not mind choosing one and if you do choose the monday there will be no need to write nor time indeed but if the friday or saturday i shall hear from you perhaps above all things remember my dear friend that i shall not expect you to-morrow except as by a bare possibility in great haste signed and sealed this sunday evening by e b b end of section eighty two section eighty three of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Greg Giordano. R.B. to E.B.B. Monday, 7 p.m. Postmark, August 19, 1845. I, this moment, get your note, having been out since the early morning, and I must write just to catch the post. You are pure kindness and considerateness. No thanks to you since you will have it so i choose friday then but i shall hear from you before thursday i dare hope i have all but passed your house to-day with an italian friend from rome whom i must go about with a little on weariful sight-seeing so i shall earn friday bless you r b end of section eighty three Section 84 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Tuesday, postmark August 20th, 1845. I fancied it was just so, as I did not hear and did not see you on Monday. Not that you were expected particularly, but that you would have written your own negative, it appeared to me, by some post in the day if you had received my note in time it happened well too altogether as you have a friend with you though mr kenyon does not come and will not come i dare say for he spoke like a doubter at the moment and as this tuesday wears on i am not likely to have any visitors on it after all and may as well if the rain quite ceases go and spend my solitude on the park a little flush wags his tail at that proposition when i speak it loud out and i am to write to you before friday and so am writing you see which i should not should not have done if i had not been told because it is not my turn to write did you think it was not a word of malta except from mr kenyon who talked homilies of it last sunday and wanted to speak them to papa but it would not do in any way now especially and in a little time there will be a decision for or against and i am afraid of both which is a happy state of preparation did i not tell you that early in the summer i did some translations for miss thompson's classical album from bion and theocritus and nonus the author of that large not great poem in some forty books of the dionysiaca and the paraphrases from apuleius well i had a letter from her the other day full of compunction and ejaculation and declaring the fact that mr burgess had been correcting all the proofs of the poems leaving out and amending generally according to his own particular idea of the pattern in the mount is it not amusing i have been wicked enough to write in reply that it is happy for her and all readers sua si bona norint 
if during some half hour which otherwise might have been dedicated by mr burgess to putting out the lights of sophocles and his peers he was satisfied with the humbler devastation of e b b upon nonnas you know it is impossible to help being amused this correcting is a mania with that man and then i who wrote what i did from the dionysiaca with no respect for my author and an arbitrary will to put the case of bacchus and ariadne as well as i could for the sake of the art illustrations those subjects miss thompson sent me and did it all with full liberty and persuasion of soul that nobody would think it worth while to compare english with greek and refer me back to nonnas and detect my wanderings from the text but the critic was not to be cheated so and i do not doubt that he has set me all to rights from beginning to end and combed ariadne's hair close to her cheeks for me have you known nonnas you who forget nothing and have known everything i think for it is quite startling i must tell you quite startling and humiliating to observe how you combine such large tracts of experience of outer and inner life of books and men of the world and the arts of it curious knowledge as well as general knowledge and deep thinking as well as wide acquisition and you looking none the older for it all yes and being besides a man of genius and working your faculty and not wasting yourself over a surface or away from an end dougal stewart said that genius made naturally a lopsided mind did he not he ought to have known you and i who do a little for i grow more loath than i was to assume the knowledge of you my dear friend i do not mean to use that word humiliation in the sense of having felt the thing myself in any painful way because i never for a moment did or could you know never could never did except indeed when you have overpraised me which forced another personal feeling in it otherwise it has always been quite pleasant to me to be startled and humiliated and more so perhaps than to be startled and exalted if i might choose only i did not mean to write all this though you told me to write to you but the rain which keeps one in gives one an example of pouring on and you must endure as you can or will also as you have a friend with you from italy from rome and commended me for my kindness and considerateness in changing tuesday to friday wasn't it shall i still be more considerate and put off the visit day to next week mind you let it be as you like it best to be i mean as is most convenient for the nuns to you and your friend because all days are equal as to that matter of convenience to your other friend of this ilk e b b End of section 84section eighty five of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b wednesday morning postmark august twenty eighteen forty five mouvez 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 you know as i know just as much that your kindness and considerateness consisted not in putting off tuesday for another day but in caring for my coming at all for my coming and being told at the door that you were engaged and i might call another time and you are not not my other friend any more than this head of mine is my other head seeing that i have got a violin which has a head too all which beware lest you get fully told in the letter i will write this evening when i have done with my romans who are it so happens here at this minute that is have left the house for a few minutes with my sister but are not with me as you seem to understand it in the house to stay they were kind to me in rome husband and wife and i am bound to be of what use i may during their short stay let me lose no time in begging and praying you to cry hands off to that dreadful burgess have not i got a but i will tell you to-night or on friday which is my day please friday till when pray believe me with respect and esteem your most obliged and disobliged at these blank endings 
what have I done? God bless you ever, dearest friend. End of section 85section eighty six of the letters of robert browning and elizabeth barrett barrett part one this librivox recording is in the public domain read by greg giordano r b to e b b thursday seven o'clock postmark august twenty one eighteen forty five i feel at home this blue early morning now that i sit down to write or speak as i try and fancy to you after a whole day with those other friends dear good souls whom i should be so glad to serve and to whom service must go by way of last will and testament if a few more hours of social joy kindly intercourse etc fall to my portion my friend the countess began proceedings when i first saw her not yesterday by asking if i had got as much money as i expected by any works published of late to which i answered of course exactly as much e gracioso all the same if you were to ask her or the like of her how much the stonework of the coliseum would fetch properly burned down to lime she would shudder from head to foot and call you barbaro with good trojan heart now you suppose watch my rhetorical figure here you suppose i am going to congratulate myself on being so much for the better on pay de connaissance with my other friend e b b number two or two hundred why not whereas i mean to full mind over greece since thunder frightens you for all the laurels and to have reason for your taking my own part and lot to yourself i do will must and will again wonder at you and admire you and so on to the climax it is a fixed immovable thing so fixed that i can well forego talking about it but if to talk you once again begin the king shall enjoy or receive quietly his own again i wear no bright weapon out of that panoply or Panapolite, as I think you call Nonus, nor ever like Lay Hunt's Johnny ever blithe and bonny when singing Nanny Nanny, and see to morrow what a vengeance I will take for mere suspicion in that kind. But to the serious matter, nay, I said yesterday, I believe, keep off that Burgess. He is stark, staring mad. Mad, do you know? the last time i met him he told me he had recovered i forget how many of the lost books of thucydides found them embedded in suedas i think and disengaged them from his greek without loss of a letter by an instinct he burgess had i spell his name wrongly to help the proper hiss at the end then once on a time he found in the christus patine an odd dozen of lines clearly dropped out of the prometheus and proving that Aeschylus was aware of the invention of gunpowder he wanted to help dr leonhard schmitz in his museum and scared him as schmitz told me what business has he burgess with english verse and what on earth or under it has miss thompson to do with him if she must displease one of two why is Mr. B. not to be thanked and sent to feed, as the French say prettily? At all events, do pray see what he is presumed to alter. You can alter at sufficient warrant. Profit by suggestion, I should think. But it is all Miss Thompson's shame and fault, because she is quite in her propriety, saying to such intermeddlers, gently for the sake of their poor weak heads, Very good, I dare say very desirable emendations only the work is not mine you know but my friends and you must no more alter it without her leave than alter this sketch this illustration because you think you could mend eradne's face or figure fecit tisianus scripsit 
EBB. Dear friend, Jan will tell Miss Thompson to stop further proceedings, will you not? There, only, do mind what I say? And now, till tomorrow. It seems an age since I saw you. I want to catch our first post. This phrase I ought to get stereotyped. I need it so constantly. The day is fine. You will profit by it, I trust. Flush, wag your tail, and grow restless and scratch at the door. God bless you, my one friend, without any other. Bless you ever, R.B. End of section 86《Section 87 of the Letters of Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Barrett, Part 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Sonia. EBB to RB. Wednesday, postmark August 25th, 1845. But what have I done that you should ask what have you done? I have not brought any accusation, have I? No, nor thought any, I am sure and it was only the kindness and considerateness argument that was irresistible as a thing to be retorted when your thanks came so naturally and just at the corner of an application and then you know it is gravely true seriously true sadly true that i am always expecting to hear or to see how tired you are at last of me sooner or later you know but i did not mean any seriousness in that letter no nor did i mean to pass to another question to provoke you to the mr haley so are you reply complimentary all i observed concerning yourself was the combination which not an idiom in chivalry could treat grammatically as a thing common to me and you inasmuch as every one who has known me for half a day may know that if there is anything peculiar in me it lies for the most part in an extraordinary deficiency in this and this and this there is no need to describe what only nuns of the strictest sect of the nunneries are rather wiser in some points and have led less restricted lives than i have in others and if it had not been for my carpet work well and do you know that i have for the last few years taken quite to despise book knowledge and its effect on the mind i mean when people live by it as most readers by profession do cloistering their souls under these roofs made with heads when they might be under the sky such people grow dark and narrow and low with all their pains friday i was writing you see before you came and now i go on in haste to speak off my mind some things which are on it first of yourself how can it be that you are unwell again and that you should talk now did you not did i not hear you say so of being weary in your soul you what should make you dearest friend weary in your soul or out of spirits in any way do tell me i was going to write without a pause and almost i might perhaps even as one of the two hundred of your friends almost i might say out that do tell me or is it which i am inclined to think most probable that you are tired of a same life and want change it may happen to any one sometimes and is independent of your will and choice you know and i know and the whole world knows and would it not therefore be wise of you in that case to fold your life new again and go abroad at once what can make you weary in your soul is a problem to me you are the last from whom i should have expected such a word and you did say so i think i think that it was not a mistake of mine and you with a full liberty and the world in your hand for every purpose and pleasure of it or is it that being unwell your spirits are affected by that but then you might be more unwell than you like to admit and i am teasing you with talking of it am i not and being disagreeable is only one third of the way towards being useful it is good to remember in time and then the next thing i write off my mind is that you must not you must not make an unjust opinion out of what i said to-day i have been uncomfortable since lest you should and perhaps it would have been better if i had not said it apart from all context in that way only that you could not long be a friend of mine without knowing and seeing what so lies on the surface but then 
as far as i am concerned no one cares less for a will than i do and this though i never had one in clear opposition to your theory which holds generally nevertheless for a will in the common things of life every now and then there must of course be a crossing and vexation but in one's mere pleasures and fantasies one would rather be crossed and vexed a little than vex a person one loves and it is possible to get used to the harness and run easily in it at last and there is a side world to hide one's thoughts in and carpet work to be immoral on in spite of mrs jameson and the word literature has with me covered a good deal of liberty as you must see real liberty which is never inquired into and it has happened throughout my life by an accident as far as anything is accident that my own sense of right and happiness on any important point of overt action has never run contrarywise to the way of obedience required of me while in things not exactly overt i and all of us are apt to act sometimes up to the limit of our means of acting with shut doors and windows and no waiting for cognizance or permission ah and that last is the worst of it all perhaps to be forced into concealments from the heart naturally nearest to us and forced away from the natural source of counsel and strength and then the disingenuousness the cowardice the vices of slaves and every one you see all my brothers constrained bodily into submission apparent submission at least by that worst and most dishonouring of necessities the necessity of living every one of them all except myself being dependent in money matters on the inflexible will do you see but what you do not see what you cannot see is the deep tender affection behind and below all those patriarchal ideas of governing grown-up children in the way they must go and there never was under the strata a truer affection in a father's heart no nor a worthier heart in itself a heart loyaler and purer and more compelling to gratitude and reverence than his as i see it the evil is in the system and he simply takes it to be his duty to rule and to make happy according to his own views of the propriety of happiness he takes it to be his duty to rule like the kings of christendom by divine right but he loves us through and through it and i for one love him and when five years ago i lost what i love best in the world beyond comparison and rivalship far better than himself as he knew for every one who knew me could not choose but know what was my first and chiefest affection when i lost that i felt that he stood the nearest to me on the closed grave or by the unclosing sea i do not know which nor could ask and i will tell you that not only he has been kind and patient and forbearing to me through the tedious trial of this illness far more trying to stand us by than you have an idea of perhaps but that he was generous and forbearing in that hour of bitter trial and never reproached me as he might have done and as my own soul has not spared never once said to me then or since that if it had not been for me the crown of his house would not have fallen he never did and he might have said it and more and i could have answered nothing nothing except that i had paid my own price and that the price i paid was greater than his loss his for see how it was and how not with my hand but heart i was the cause or occasion of that misery and though not with the intention of my heart but with its weakness yet the occasion anyway they sent me down you know to torquay dr chambers saying that i could not live a winter in london the worst what people call the worst was apprehended for me at that time so i was sent down with my sister to my aunt there and he my brother whom i loved so was sent too to take us there and return and when the time came for him to leave me i to whom he was the dearest of friends and brothers in one the only one of my family who well but i cannot write of these things and it is enough to tell you that he was above us all better than us all and kindest and noblest and dearest to me beyond comparison any comparison as i said and when the time came for him to leave me i weakened by illness could not master my spirits or drive back my tears and my aunt kissed them away instead of reproving me as she should have done and said that she would take care that i should not be grieved 
she and so she sat down and wrote a letter to papa to tell him that he would break my heart if he persisted in calling away my brother as if hearts were broken so i have thought bitterly since that my heart did not break for a good deal more than that and papa's answer was burnt into me as with fire it is that under such circumstances he did not refuse to suspend his purpose but that he considered it to be very wrong in me to exact such a thing so there was no separation then and month after month passed and sometimes i was better and sometimes worse and the medical men continued to say that they would not answer for my life they if i were agitated and so there was no more talk of a separation and once he held my hand how i remember and said that he loved me better than them all and that he would not leave me till i was well he said how i remember that and ten days from that day the boat had left the shore which never returned never and he had left me gone for three days we waited and i hoped while i could oh that awful agony of three days and the sun shone as it shines to-day and there was no more wind than now and the sea under the windows was like this paper for smoothness and my sisters drew the curtains back that i might see for myself how smooth the sea was and how it could hurt nobody and other boats came back one by one remember how you wrote in your gizmond what says the body when they spring some monstrous torture engine's whole strength on it no more says the soul and you never wrote anything which lived with me more than that it is such a dreadful truth but you knew it for truth i hope by your genius and not by such proof as mine i who could not speak or shed a tear but lay for weeks and months half conscious half unconscious with a wandering mind and too near to god under the crushing of his hand to pray at all i expiated all my weak tears before by not being able to shed then one tear and yet they were forbearing and no voice said you have done this do not notice what i have written to you my dearest friend i have never said so much to a living being i never could speak or write of it i asked no question from the moment when my last hope went and since then it has been impossible for me to speak what was in me i have borne to do it to-day and to you but perhaps if you were to write so do not let this be noticed between us again do not and besides there is no need i do not reproach myself with such acrid thoughts as i had once i know that i would have died ten times over for him and that therefore though it was wrong of me to be weak and i have suffered for it and shall learn by it i hope remorse is not precisely the word for me not at least in its full sense still you will comprehend from what i have told you how the spring of life must have seemed to break within me then and how natural it has been for me to loathe the living on and to lose faith even without the loathing to lose faith in myself which i have done on some points utterly it is not from the cause of illness no and you will comprehend too that i have strong reasons for being grateful to the forbearance it would have been cruel you think to reproach me perhaps so yet the kindness and patience of the desisting from reproach are positive things all the same shall i be too late for the post i wonder wilson tells me that you were followed upstairs yesterday i write on saturday this latter part by somebody whom you probably took for my father which is wilson's idea and i hope not yours no it was neither father nor other relative of mine but an old friend in rather an ill temper and so good-bye until tuesday perhaps i shall not hear from you to-night don't let the tragedy or aught else do you harm will you and try not to be weary in your soul any more and forgive me this gloomy letter i half shrink from sending you yet will send may god bless you e b b end of section eighty seven